Section 54 of Stonewall Jackson and the American Civil War. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Tom Johnson. Stonewall Jackson and the American Civil War by George Francis Robert Henderson. Fredericksburg, Part 4. December 14th. But on December 14th, as on the morrow of Sharpsburg, the Confederates were doomed to disappointment. Darkness still prevailed, writes Stuart's chief of the staff. When we mounted our horses and again hastened to Prospect Hill, the summit of which we reached just in time to see the sun rising and unveiling as it dispersed the haze, the long lines of the Federal Army, which once more stood in full line of battle between our own position and the river, I could not withhold my admiration as I looked down upon the well-disciplined ranks of our antagonists, astonished that these troops now offering so bold a front should be the same whom not many hours since I had seen in complete flight and disorder. The skirmishers of the two armies were not much more than a hundred yards apart, concealed from each other's view by the high grass in which they were lying, and above which from time to time rose a small cloud of blue smoke, telling that a shot had been fired. As the boom of artillery began to sound from the different parts of the line, and the attack might be expected every minute, each hastened to his post. But though the skirmishing at times grew hotter, and the fire of the artillery more rapid, long intervals of silence succeeded, until it at length became apparent to the Confederates that the enemy, though well prepared to resist attack, was determined not to fight outside his breastworks. Burnside, indeed, giving way to the remonstrances of his subordinates, had abandoned all idea of further aggressive action, and unless Lee should move forward, had determined to recross the Potomac. December 15. The next morning saw the armies in the same positions, and the Federal wounded, many of whom had been struck down nearly forty-eight hours before, still lying untended between the hostile lines. It was not till now that Burnside admitted his defeat, by sending a flag of truce with a request that he might be allowed to bury his dead. The same night a fierce storm swept the valley of the Rappahannock, and the Army of the Potomac repassed the bridges evading under cover of the elements the observation of the confederate patrols the retreat was effected with a skill which did much credit to the federal staff within fourteen hours one hundred thousand troops with the whole of their guns ambulances and ammunition wagons were conveyed across the rappahannock but there remained on the south bank sufficient evidence to show that the army of the potomac had not escaped unscathed when the morning broke the dead lay thick upon the field. Arms and accoutrements, the debris of defeat, were strewed in profusion on every hand, and the ruined houses of Fredericksburg were filled with wounded. Burnside lost in the battle 12,647 men. Left Attack, Franklin, 1st Corps. Meade's Division, 1,853. Gibbon's Division, 1,267. Doubleday's Division, 214. Third Corps. Burney's Division, 950. Sickles' Division, 100. Sixth Corps. Newton's Division, 63. Total, 4,447. Center. Brooks' Division, 197. Howe's Division, 186. Total, 383. Right attack, Sumner and Hooker. Second Corps, Hancock's Division, 2,032. Howard's Division, 914. French's Division, 1,160. Ninth Corps, Burns' Division, 27. Sturgis' Division, 1,007. Getty's Division, 296. 3rd Corps, Whipple's Division, 129. 5th Corps, Griffin's Division, 926. Sykes' Division, 228. Humphrey's Division, 
1019. Engineers and Reserve Artillery, etc. 79. Total, 7,817. Grand total, including 877 officers, 589 prisoners, 12,647. The Confederates showed 5,309 casualties, out of less than 30,000 actually engaged. Left Wing, Longstreet, 1st Corps, Ransom's Division, 535, McClaw's Division, 858, Anderson's Division, 159, Artillery, 37, Total, 1,589, 1,224 on December 12. Center, 1st Corps, Pickett's Division, 54, Hood's Division, 251, total 305. Right Wing, Jackson, Light Division, 2,120, Early's Division, 932, D.H. Hill's Division, 173, Taliaferro's Division, 190, total including 500 captured, 3,415. No attempt was made by the Confederates to follow the enemy across the Rappahannock. The upper fords were open, but the river was rising fast, and the Army of the Potomac, closely concentrated and within a few miles of Acquia Creek, was too large to be attacked, and too close to its base to permit effective maneuvers, which might induce it to divide against its line of communications. The exultation of the southern soldiers in their easy victory was dashed by disappointment. Burnside's escape had demonstrated the fallacy of one of the so-called rules of war. The great river which lay behind him during the Battle of Fredericksburg had proved his salvation instead of, as it theoretically should, his ruin. Over the six bridges his troops had more lines of retreat than is usually the case when roads only are available, and these lines of retreat were secure protected from the Confederate cavalry by the river, and from the infantry and artillery by the batteries on the Stafford Heights. Had the battle been fought on the North Anna, 36 miles from Fredericksburg, the result might have been very different. A different counterstroke could possibly have been more practicable than on the Rappahannock, for the superior numbers of the enemy and his powerful artillery could not have been disregarded nor would a direct pursuit have been a certain means of making success decisive. The rear of a retreating army, as the Confederates had found to their cost at Malvern Hill, is usually its strongest part. But a pursuit directed against the flanks, striking the line of retreat, cutting off the supply and ammunition trains, and blocking the roads, a pursuit such as Jackson had organized when he drove banks from the valley, if conducted with vigor, seldom fails in its effect. And who would have conducted such an operation with greater skill and energy than Stuart, at the head of his nine thousand horsemen? Who would have supported Stuart more expeditiously than the foot cavalry of the Second Army Corps? Lee's position at Fredericksburg, strong as it might appear, was exceedingly disadvantageous. A position which an army occupies with a view to decisive battle should fulfill four requirements. 1. It should not be too strong, or the enemy will not attack it. 2. It should give cover to the troops both from view and fire from artillery, and have a good field of fire. 3. It should afford facilities for counterstroke. 4. It should afford facilities for pursuit. Of these, Lee's battlefield fulfilled but the first and second. It would have been an admirable selection if the sole object of the Confederates had been to gain time, or to prevent the enemy establishing himself south of the Rappahannock. But to encompass the destruction of the enemy's whole army, it was as ill-adapted as Wellington's position at Torres Vedras, at Busaco, or at Fuentes d'Honor. But while Wellington, in taking up these positions, had no further end in view than holding the French in check, the situation of the Confederacy was such that a decisive victory was eminently desirable. Nothing was to be gained by gaining time, 
The South could furnish Lee with no further reinforcements. Every able-bodied man was in the service of his country, and it was perfectly certain that the Western armies, although they had been generally successful during the past year, would never be permitted by Mr. Davis to leave the valley of the Mississippi. The Army of Northern Virginia was not likely to be stronger or more efficient. Equipped with the spoils of many victories, it was more on a level with the enemy than had hitherto been the case. The ranks were full. The men were inured to hardships and swift marches. Their health was proof against inclement weather, and they knew their work on the field of battle. The artillery had recently been reorganized. During the Peninsular Campaign, the batteries had been attached to the infantry brigades, and the indifferent service they had often rendered had been attributed to the difficulty of collecting the scattered units, and in handling them in combination. Formed into battalions of four or six batteries, a large number of guns was now attached to each of the divisions, and each army corps had a strong reserve. So that the concentration of a heavy force of artillery on any part of a position became a feasible operation. The cavalry, so admirably commanded by Stuart, Hampton, and the younger Lees, was not less hardy or efficient than the infantry, and the morale of the soldiers of every arm, founded on confidence in themselves not less than on confidence in their leaders, was never higher. After the truce had been agreed upon, says Captain Smith, litter-bearers to bring away the dead and wounded were selected from the command of General Bodes. When they had fallen in, General Bodes said to them, Now, boys, those Yankees are going to ask you questions, and you must not tell them anything. Be very careful about this. At this juncture, one of the men spoke up and said, General, can we tell them that we whipped them yesterday? Bodes replied, laughing, Yes, yes, you can tell them that. Immediately another man spoke up, General, can't we tell them that we can whip them tomorrow and the day after? Bodes again laughed and sent those incorrigible jokers off with, Yes, yes, go on, go on, tell them what you please. The Army of the Potomac, on the other hand, was not likely to become weaker or less formidable if time were allowed it to recuperate. It had behind it enormous reserves. Sixty thousand men had been killed, wounded, or captured since the Battle of Kernstown, and yet their ranks were as full as when McClellan first marched on Richmond. Many generals had disappeared, but those who remained were learning their trade, and the soldiers, although more familiar with defeat than victory, showed little diminution of martial ardor. Nor had the strain of the war sapped the resources of the North. Her trade, instead of dwindling, had actually increased, and the gaps made in the population by the Confederate bullets were more than made good by a constant influx of immigrants from Europe. It was not by partial triumphs, not by the slaughter of a few brigades, by defense without counterstroke, by victories without pursuit, that a power of such strength and vitality could be compelled to confess her impotence. Whether some overwhelming disaster, a Jena or a Waterloo, followed by instant invasion, would have subdued her stubborn spirit is problematical. Rome survived Cannae, Scotland Flodden, and France Sedan. But in some such crowning mercy lay the only hope of the Confederacy, and had the Army of the Potomac, ill-commanded as it was, been drawn forward to the North Anna, it might have been utterly destroyed. Half-hearted strategy, which aims only at repulsing the enemy's attack, is not the path to king-making victory. It is not by such feeble means that states secure or protect their independence. To occupy a position where Stuart's cavalry was powerless, where the qualities which made Lee's infantry so formidable, the impetuosity of their attack, the swiftness of their marches, had no field for display, and where the enemy had free scope for the employment of his artillery, his strongest arm, was but to postpone the evil day. It had been well for the Confederacy if Stonewall Jackson, whose resolute strategy had but one aim, and that aim the annihilation of the enemy, had been the supreme director of her councils. To paraphrase Mahan, the strategic mistake in occupying a position for which pursuit was impracticable neutralized the tactical advantage gained, 
and thus confirming the military maxim that a strategic mistake is more serious and far-reaching in its effects than an error in tactics. Lee, however, was fettered by the orders of the cabinet, and Mr. Davis and his advisers, more concerned with the importance of retaining an area of country which still furnished supplies than of annihilating the Army of the Potomac, and relying on European intervention rather than the valor of the southern soldier, were responsible for the occupation of the Fredericksburg position. In extenuation of their mistake, it may, however, be admitted that the advantages of concentration on the North Anna were not such as would impress themselves on the civilian mind, while the surrender of territory would undoubtedly have embarrassed both the government and the supply department. Moreover, at the end of November, it might have been urged that if Burnside were permitted to possess himself of Fredericksburg, it was by no means certain that he would advance on Richmond. Establishing himself in winter quarters, he might wait until the weather improved, controlling in the meantime the resources and population of that portion of Virginia which lay within his reach. Nevertheless, as events went far to prove, Mr. Davis would have done wisely had he accepted the advice of the soldiers on the spot. His strategical glance was less comprehensive than that of Lee and Jackson. In the first place, they knew that if Burnside proposed going into winter quarters, he would not deliberately place the Rappahannock between himself and his base, nor halt with the great forest of Spotsylvania on his flank. In the second place, there could be no question but that the northern government and the northern people would impel him forward. The tone of the press was unmistakable, and the very reason that Burnside had been appointed to command was because McClellan was so slow to move. In the third place, both Lee and Jackson saw the need of decisive victory. With them, questions of strategic dispositions, offering chances of such victory, were of more importance than questions of supply or internal politics. They knew with what rapidity the Federal soldiers recovered their morale, and they realized but too keenly the stern determination which inspired the North. They had seen the hosts of invasion retire in swift succession, stricken and exhausted, before their victorious bayonets. Thousands of prisoners had been marched to Richmond. Thousands of wounded, abandoned on the battlefield, had been paroled. Guns, wagons, and small arms, enough to equip a great army, had been captured. And general after general had been reduced to the ignominy that awaits a defeated leader. Fremont and Shields had disappeared. Banks was no longer in the field, Porter was awaiting trial, McDowell was gone, Pope had gone, and McClellan. And yet the Army of the Potomac still held its ground, the great fleets still kept their stations, the capture of Richmond was still the objective of the Union government, and not for a single moment had Lincoln wavered from his purpose. It will not be asserted that either Lee or Jackson fathomed the source of this unconquerable tenacity. They had played with effect on the fears of Lincoln, they had recognized in him the motive power of the Federal hosts, but they had not yet learned, for the Northern people themselves had not yet learned it, that they were opposed by an adversary whose resolution was as unyielding as their own, who loved the Union even as they loved Virginia, and who ruled the nation with the same tact and skill that they ruled their soldiers. In these pages Mr. Lincoln has not been spared. He made mistakes, and he himself would have been the last to claim infallibility. He had entered the White House with a rich endowment of common sense, a high sense of duty, and an extraordinary knowledge of the American character. But his ignorance of statesmanship directing arms was great, and his military errors were numerous. Putting these aside, his tenure of office during the dark days of 61 and 62 had been marked by the very highest political sagacity. His courage and his patriotism had sustained the nation in its distress, and in spite of every obstacle he was gradually bringing into being a unity of sympathy and of purpose, which in the early days of the war had seemed an impossible ideal. Not the least politic of his measures was the Edict of Emancipation, published after the Battle of Sharpsburg. It was not a measure without flaw. It contained paragraphs which might fairly be interpreted 
and were so interpreted by the Confederates, as inciting the Negroes to rise against their masters, thus exposing to all the horrors of a servile insurrection with its accompaniments of murder and outrage, the farms and plantations, where the women and children of the South lived lonely and unprotected. But if the edict served only to embitter the Southerners, to bind the whole country together in a still closer league of resistance, and to make peace except by conquest impossible, it was worth the price. The party in the North, which fought for the re-establishment of the Union, had carried on the war with but small success. The tale of reverses had told at last upon recruiting. Men were unwilling to come forward, and those who were bribed by large bounties to join the armies were of a different character to the original volunteer. Enthusiasm in the cause was fast diminishing when Lincoln, purely on his own initiative, proclaimed emancipation, and investing the war with the dignity of a crusade, inspired the soldier with a new incentive, and appealed to a feeling which had not yet been stirred. Many Northerners had not thought it worth while to fight for the re-establishment of the Union on the basis of the Constitution. If slavery was to be permitted to continue, they preferred separation. And these men were farmers and agriculturalists, the class which furnished the best soldiers, men of American birth, for the most part abolitionists, and ready to fight for the principle they had so much at heart. It is true that the effect of the edict was not at once apparent. It was not received everywhere with acclamation. The army had small sympathy with the colored race, and the political opponents of the president accused him vehemently of unconstitutional action. Their denunciations, however, missed the mark. The letter of the Constitution, as Mr. Lincoln clearly saw, had ceased to be regarded, at least by the great bulk of the people, with superstitious reverence. They had learned to think more of great principles than of political expedience, and if the defense of their hereditary rights had welded the South into a nation, the assertion of a still nobler principle, the liberty of man, placed the North on a higher plane, enlisted the sympathy of Europe, and completed the isolation of the Confederacy. But although Lee and Jackson had not yet penetrated the political genius of their great antagonist, they rated at its true value the vigor displayed by his administration, and they saw that something more was wanting to wrest their freedom from the North than a mere passive resistance to the invaders' progress. Soon after the Battle of Fredericksburg, Lee went to Richmond and laid proposals for an aggressive campaign before the president. He was assured, however, says General Longstreet, that the war was virtually over, and that we need not harass our troops by marches and other hardships. Gold had advanced in New York to two hundred premium, and we were told by those in the Confederate capital that in thirty or forty days we would be recognized by the European powers, and peace proclaimed. General Lee did not share this belief. December 18. So Jackson, who had hoped to return to Winchester, was doomed to the inaction of winter quarters on the Rappahannock. For with Burnside's repulse, operations practically ceased. The Confederate cavalry, however, did not at once abandon hostilities. On December 18th, Hampton marched his brigade as far as the village of Occoquan, bringing off 150 prisoners and capturing a convoy. December 26. And on December 26, Stuart closed his record for 1862 by leading 1,800 troopers far to the Federal rear. After doing much damage in the district of Occoquan and Dumfries, 20 miles from Burnside's headquarters, he marched northward in the direction of Washington and penetrated as far as Burke's Station, 15 miles from Alexandria. Sending a telegraphic message to General Meigs, Quartermaster General at Washington, to the effect that the mules furnished to Burnside's army were of such bad quality that he was embarrassed in taking the wagons he had captured into the Confederate lines and requesting that a better class of animal might be supplied in future. He returned by long marches through Warrenton to Culpeper Courthouse, escaping pursuit and bringing with him a large amount of plunder and many prisoners. 
From the afternoon of December 26 to nightfall on December 31, he rode 150 miles, losing 28 officers and men in skirmishes with detachments of the Federal cavalry. He had contrived to throw a great part of the troops sent to meet him into utter confusion by intercepting their telegrams and answering them himself in a manner that scattered his pursuers and broke down their horses. Near the end of January, Burnside made a futile attempt to march his army round Lee's flank by way of Ellie's and Germana fords. The weather, however, was inclement. The roads were in a fearful condition, and the troops experienced such difficulty in movement that the operation, which goes by the name of the Mud Campaign, was soon abandoned. 1863, January 26. On January 26, Burnside, in consequence of the strong representations made by his lieutenants to the president, was superseded. General Hooker, the dashing fighter of the Antietam, replaced him in command of the Army of the Potomac, and the Federal troops went into winter quarters at Falmouth, where, on the opposite shore of the Rappahannock, within view of the sentries, stood a row of finger posts, on which the Confederate soldiers had painted the taunting legend, This Way to Richmond. End of section 54. Section 55 of Stonewall Jackson and the American Civil War. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Stonewall Jackson and the American Civil War by George Francis Robert Henderson. The Army of Northern Virginia, Part 1. In War, Men are nothing. It is the man who is everything. The general is the head, the whole of an army. It was not the Roman army that conquered Gaul, but Caesar. It was not the Carthaginian army that made Rome tremble in her gates, but Hannibal. It was not the Macedonian army that reached the Indus, but Alexander. It was not the French army that carried the war to the Weser and the Inn, but Turenne. It was not the Prussian army which, for seven years, defended Prussia against the three greatest powers of Europe, but Frederick the Great. So spoke Napoleon, reiterating a truth confirmed by the experience of successive ages, that a wise direction is of more avail than overwhelming numbers, sound strategy than the most perfect armament, a powerful will invigorating all who come within its sphere than the spasmodic efforts of ill-regulated valor. Even a professional army of long-standing and old traditions is what its commander makes it. Its character sooner or later becomes the reflex of his own. From him, the officers take their tone. His energy or his inactivity, his firmness or vacillation, are rapidly communicated even to the lower ranks, and so far-reaching is the influence of the leader that those who record his campaigns concern themselves but little as a rule with the men who followed him. The history of famous armies is the history of great generals, for no army has ever achieved great things unless it has been well commanded. If the general be second-rate, the army will also be second-rate. Mutual confidence is the basis of success in war and unless the troops have implicit trust in the resolution and resources of their chief, hesitation and half-heartedness are sure to mark their actions. They may fight with their accustomed courage, but the eagerness for the conflict, the alacrity to support, the determination to conquer, will not be there. The indefinable quality which is expressed by the word morale will, to some degree, be affected. The history of the Army of the Potomac is a case in point. Between the soldiers of the North and South, there was little difference. Neither could claim a superiority of martial qualities. The Confederates, indeed, at the beginning of the war, possessed a larger measure of technical skill. They were the better shots and the finer riders, but they were neither braver nor more enduring. And while they probably derived some advantage from the fact that they were defending their homes, the Federals, 
defending the integrity of their native land, were fighting in the noblest of all causes. But Northerner and Southerner were of the same race, a race proud, resolute, independent. Both were inspired by the same sentiments of self-respect, noblesse oblige, the noblesse of a free people was the motto of the one as of the other. It has been asserted that the Federal armies were very largely composed of foreigners, whose motives for enlisting were purely mercenary. At no period of the war, however, did the proportion of Native Americans sink below 70%, and at the beginning of 1863, it was much greater. As a matter of fact, the Union Army was composed of thoroughly staunch soldiers, nor was the alien element at this time a source of weakness. Ireland and Germany supplied the greater number of those who have been called Lincoln's hirelings, and judging from the official records, the Irish regiments at least were not a whit less trustworthy than those purely American. Moreover, even if the admixture of foreigners had been greater, the Army of the Potomac, for the reason that it was always superior in numbers, contained in its ranks many more men bred in the United States than the Army of Northern Virginia. For the consistent ill success of the Federals, the superior marksmanship and finer horsemanship of the Confederates cannot, therefore, be accepted as sufficient explanation. In defense, the balance of endurance inclined neither to one side nor the other. Both Southerner and Northerner displayed that stubborn resolve to maintain their ground which is the peculiar attribute of the Anglo-Saxon. To claim for any one race a preeminence of valor is repugnant alike to good taste and to sound sense. Courage and endurance are widely distributed over the world's surface, and political institutions, the national conception of duty, the efficiency of the corps of officers, and love of country are the foundation of vigor and staunchness in the field. Yet it is a fact which can hardly be ignored that from Cressy to Inkerman there have been exceedingly few instances where an English army, large or small, has been driven from a position. In the great struggle with France, neither Napoleon nor his marshals Although the armies of every other European nation had fled before them, could boast of having broken the English infantry, and no soldiers have ever received a prouder tribute than the admission of a generous enemy. They never know when they are beaten. In America, the characteristics of the parent race were as prominent in the Civil War as they had been in the Revolution. In 1861-65, to 65, the side that stood on the defensive, unless hopelessly outnumbered, was almost invariably successful, just as it had been in 1776 to 82. My men, said Jackson, sometimes failed to drive the enemy from his position, but to hold one, never. The Federal generals might have made the same assertion with almost equal truth. Porter had indeed been defeated at Gaines Mill. But he could only set 35,000 in line against 55,000. Banks had been overwhelmed at Winchester, but 6,500 men could hardly have hoped to resist more than twice their strength. And Shields' advanced guard at Port Republic was much inferior to the force which Jackson brought against it. Yet these were the only offensive victories of the 62 campaign. But if in defense the armies were well matched, it must be conceded that the northern attack was not pressed with the same concentrated vigor as the southern. McClellan at Sharpsburg had more than twice as many men as Lee. Pope on the first day of the second Manassas, twice as many as Jackson. Yet on both occasions, the smaller force was victorious. But in the first place, the federal tactics and attack were always feeble. Lincoln, in appointing Hooker to command the Army of the Potomac, warned him to put in all his men. His sharp eye had detected the great fault which had characterized the operations of his generals. Their assaults had been piecemeal, like those of the Confederates at Malvern Hill, and they had been defeated in detail by the inferior numbers. 
the northern soldiers were strangers to those general and combined attacks, pressed with unyielding resolution, which had won Winchester, Gaines Mill, and the Second Manassas, and which had nearly won Kernstown. The northern generals invariably kept large masses in reserve, and these masses were never used. They had not yet learned, as had Lee, Jackson, and Longstreet, that superior numbers are of no avail unless they are brought into action, impelling the attack forward by sheer weight at the decisive point. In the second place, none of the Federal leaders possessed the entire confidence, either of their generals or their troops. With all its affection for McClellan, it may strongly be questioned whether his army gave him credit for dash or resolution. Pope was defeated at his first action at Cedar Run. Banks at Winchester, Fremont west of Staunton, had both been outmaneuvered. Burnside had against him his feeble conduct at Sharpsburg. Hence the Federal soldiers fought most of their offensive battles under a terrible disadvantage. They were led by men who had known defeat and who owed their defeat in great measure to the same fault, neglect to employ their whole force in combination. Brave and unyielding as they were, the troops went into battle mistrustful of their leader's skill and fearful from the very outset that their efforts would be unsupported and when men begin to look over their shoulders for reinforcements, demoralization is not far off. It would be untrue to say that a defeated general can never regain the confidence of his soldiers, but unless he has previous successes to set off against his failure, to permit him to retain his position is dangerous in the extreme. Such was the opinion of Jackson, always solicitous of the morale of his command. To his mind, nothing ever fully excused failure and it was really that he gave an officer the opportunity of failing twice. The service, he said, cannot afford to keep a man who does not succeed, nor was he ever restrained from a change by the fear of making matters worse. His motto was, get rid of the unsuccessful man at once, and trust to providence for finding a better. Nor was the presence of discredited generals the only evil, which went to neutralize the valor of the Federal soldiers. The system of command was as rotten in the Army of the Potomac as in the armies of Northern Virginia, and of the Valley it was sound. And the system of command plays a most important part in war. The natural initiative of the American, the general fearlessness of responsibility, were as conspicuous among the soldiers as in the nation at large. To those familiar with the official records, where the doings of regiments and even companies are preserved, it is perfectly apparent that, so soon as the officers gained experience, the smaller units were as boldly and efficiently handled as in the army of Germany under Monkey. But while Lee and Jackson, by every means in their power, fostered the capacity for independent action, following therein the example of Napoleon, of Washington, of Nelson, and of Wellington, and aware that their strength would thus be doubled. McClellan and Pope did their best to stifle it, and in the higher ranks they succeeded. In the one case, the generals were taught to wait for orders, in the other to anticipate them. In the one case, whether troops were supported or not, depended on the word of the commanding general. In the other, every officer was taught that to sustain his colleagues was his first duty. It thus resulted that while the Confederate leaders were served by scores of zealous assistants, actively engaged in furthering the aim of their superiors, McClellan, Pope, and Fremont, jealous of power, reduced their subordinates, with few exceptions, to the position of machines, content to obey the letter of their orders, oblivious of opportunity, and incapable of cooperation. Lee and Jackson appear to have realized the requirements of battle far more fully than their opponents. They knew that the scope of the commander is limited, that once his troops are committed to close action, it is impossible for him to exert further control, but his orders can no longer reach them, that he cannot keep the whole field under observation, much less observe every fleeting opportunity. 
Yet it is by utilizing opportunities that the enemy's strength is sapped. For these reasons, the Confederate generals were exceedingly careful not to chill the spirit of enterprise. Errors of judgment were never considered in the light of crimes, while the officer who, in default of orders, remained inactive, or who, when his orders were manifestly inapplicable to a suddenly changed situation, and there was no time to have them altered, did not act for himself, was not long retained in responsible command. In the Army of the Potomac, on the other hand, centralization was the rule. McClellan expected blind obedience from his corps commanders, and nothing more, and Pope brought Porter to trial for using his own judgment, on occasions when Pope himself was absent, during the campaign of the Second Manassas. Thus the Federal soldiers, through no fault of their own, labored for the first two years of the war under a disadvantage from which the wisdom of Lee and Jackson had relieved the Confederates. The Army of the Potomac was an inert mass, the Army of Northern Virginia a living organism, endowed with irresistible vigor. It is to be noted, too, as tending to prove the equal courage of North and South, that on the Western theater of war, the Federals were the more successful, and yet the Western armies of the Confederacy were neither less brave, less hardy, nor less disciplined than those in Virginia. They were led, however, by inferior men, while, on the other hand, many of the northern generals opposed to them possessed unquestionable ability and understood the value of a good system of command. We may say, then, without detracting an iota from the high reputation of the Confederate soldiers, that it was not the Army of Northern Virginia that saved Richmond in 1862, but Lee, not the Army of the Valley which won the Valley Campaign, but Jackson. It is related that a good priest, once a chaplain in Taylor's Louisiana Brigade, concluded his prayer at the unveiling of the Jackson Monument in New Orleans with these remarkable words. When in thine inscrutable decree it was ordained that the Confederacy should fail, it became necessary for thee to remove thy servant Stonewall Jackson. It is unnecessary, perhaps, to lay much forcible emphasis on the personal factor, but at the same time, it is exceedingly essential that it should never be overlooked. The government which, either in peace or war, commits the charge of its armed forces to any other than the ablest and the most experienced soldier the country can produce is but laying the foundation of national disaster. Had the importance of a careful selection for the higher commands been understood in the North, as it was understood in the South, Lee and Jackson would have been opposed by foes more formidable than Pope and Burnside, or Banks and Fremont. The Federal Administration, confident in the courage and intelligence of their great armies, considered that any ordinary general, trained to command and supported by an efficient staff, should be able to win victories. Mr. Davis, on the other hand, himself a soldier, who, as United States Secretary of War, had enjoyed peculiar opportunities of estimating the character of the officers of the old army, made no such mistake. He was not always, indeed, either wise or consistent, but, with few exceptions, his appointments were the best that could be made, and he was ready to accept the advice as regarded selections for command of his most experienced generals. But however far-reaching may be the influence of a great leader in estimating his capacity, the temper of the weapon that he wielded can hardly be overlooked. In the first place, that temper, to a greater or less degree, must have been of his own forging. It is a part of his fame. No man, says Napier, can be justly called a great captain who does not know how to organize and form the character of an army, as well as to lead it when formed. In the second place, to do much with feeble means is greater than to do more with larger resources. Difficulties are inherent in all military operations, and not the least may be the constitution of the army. Nor would the story of Stonewall Jackson be more than half told, without large reference to those tired soldiers, subalterns and private soldiers as they were, 
whom he looked upon as his comrades, whose patriotism and endurance he extolled so highly, and whose devotion to himself, next to the approval of his own conscience, was the reward that most he valued. He is blind indeed, who fails to recognize the unselfish patriotism displayed by the citizen soldiers of America. The stern resolution with which the war was waged, the tenacity of the northerner, ill-commanded and constantly defeated, fighting in a most difficult country and foiled on every line of invasion, the tenacity of the southerner, confronting enormous odds, ill-fed, ill-armed, and ill-provided, knowing that if wounded, his sufferings would be great, for drugs had been declared contraband of war. The hospitals contained no anesthetics to relieve the pain of amputation, and the surgical instruments, which were only replaced when others were captured, were worn out with constant usage. Knowing, too, that his womenfolk and children were in want, and yet never yielding to despair nor abandoning hope of ultimate victory. Neither Federal nor Confederate deemed his life the most precious of his earthly possessions. Neither New Englander nor Virginian ever for one moment dreamt of surrendering. No matter what the struggle might cost, a single acre of the territory, a single item of the civil rights, which had been handed down to him, I do not profess, said Jackson, any romantic sentiments as to the vanity of life. Certainly no man has more than should make life dear to him than I have in the affection of my home, but I do not desire to survive the independence of my country. And Jackson's attitude was that of his fellow countrymen. The words of Naboth, Jehovah forbid that I should give to thee the inheritance of my forefathers were graven on the heart of both North and South, and the unknown and forgotten heroes who fought in the ranks of either army, and who fought for a principle, not on compulsion or for glory, are worthy of the highest honors that history can bestow. Nor can any soldier without his tribute of praise to the capacity for making war which distinguished the American citizen. The intelligence of the rank and file played an important role in every phase of a campaign, as skirmishes and modern battles, to a very great extent, are fought out by lines of skirmishers. Their work was admirable, and when the officers were struck down or when command, by reason of the din and excitement, became impossible, the self-dependence of the individual asserted itself with the best effect the same quality which the German training had sought to foster, and which, according to Moltke, had much to do with the victories of 1870, was born in both Northerner and Southerner. On outpost and on patrol, in seeking information and in counteracting the ruses of the enemy, the keen intelligence of the educated volunteer was of the utmost value. History has hitherto overlooked the achievements of the scouts, whose names so seldom occur in the official records, but whose daring was unsurpassed and whose services were of vast importance. In the Army of Northern Virginia, every commanding general had his own party of scouts, whose business it was to penetrate the enemy's lines, to see everything and to hear everything, to visit the base of operations, to inspect the line of communications, and to note the condition and the temper of the hostile troops. Attracted by a pure love of adventure, these private soldiers did exactly the same work as did the English intelligence officers in the peninsula, and did it with the same thoroughness and acuteness. Wellington, deploring the capture of Captain Colquhoun Grant, declared that the gallant Highlander was worth as much to the army as a brigade of cavalry. Jackson had scouts who were more useful to him than many of his brigadiers. Again, in constructing hasty entrenchments, the soldiers needed neither assistance nor impulsion. The rough cover thrown up by the men, when circumstances demanded it, on their own volition, was always adapted to the ground, and generally fulfilled the main principles of fortification. For bridge-building, for road-making, for the destruction, the repair, and even the making of railroads. Skilled labor was always forthcoming from the ranks, 
and the soldiers stamped the impress of the individuality on the tactics of the infantry. Modern formations, to a very large extent, had their origin on American battlefields. The men realized very quickly the advantages of shelter, the advance by rushes from one cover to another, and the gradually working up by this method of the firing line to effective range. The method, which all experience shows to be the true one, became the general rule. That the troops had faults, however, due in great part to the fact that their intelligence was not thoroughly trained, and to the inexperience of the officers, it is impossible to deny. I agree with you, wrote Lee in 1868, in believing that our army would be invincible if it could be properly organized and officered. There were never such men in an army before. They will go anywhere and do anything if properly led. But there is the difficulty. Proper commanders. Where can they be obtained? But they are improving, constantly improving. Rome was not built in a day, nor can we expect miracles in our favor. Yet, taking them all in all, the American rank and file of 1863, with their native characteristics supplemented by a great knowledge of war, were in advance of any soldiers of their time. In the actual composition of the Confederate forces, no marked change had taken place since the beginning of the war. But the character of the army, in many essential respects, had become sensibly modified. The men encamped on the Rappahannock were no longer the raw recruits who had blundered into victory at the first Manassas, nor were they the unmanageable divisions of the peninsula. They were still, for the most part, volunteers, but conscripts in the Army of Northern Virginia were not numerous, but they were volunteers of a very different type from those who had fought at Kernstown or at Gaines Mill. Despite their protracted absence from their homes, the wealthy and well-born privates still shouldered the musket. Though many had been promoted to commissions, the majority were content to set an example of self-sacrifice and sterling patriotism, and the regiments were thus still leavened with a large admixture of educated and intelligent men. It is a significant fact that during those months of 1863, which were spent in winter quarters, Latin, Greek, mathematical, and even Hebrew classes were instituted by the soldiers. But all trace of social distinction had long since vanished. Between the rich planter and the small farmer or mechanic, there was no difference either in aspect or habiliments. Tanned by the hot Virginia sun, then visaged in the right eyed, gaunt of frame and spare of flesh, they were neither more nor less than the rank and file of the Confederate army the product of discipline and hard service, molded after the same pattern, with the same hopes and fears, the same needs, the same sympathies. They looked at life from a common standpoint, and that standpoint was not always elevated. Human nature claimed its rights. When his hunger was satisfied, and to his own expression he was full of hog and hominy, the Confederate soldier found time to discuss the operations in which he was engaged. Pipe in mouth, he could pass and review the strategies and tactics of both armies, the capacity of his generals, and the bearing of his enemies, and on each one of these questions, for he was the shrewdest of observers, his comments were always to the point. He had studied his profession in a practical school. The more delicate moves of the great game were topics of absorbing interest. He cast a comprehensive glance over the whole theater, he would puzzle out the reasons for forced marches and sudden changes of direction. His curiosity was great, but intelligent, and the groups around the campfires often forecast with surprising accuracy the maneuvers that the generals were planning. But far more often, the subjects of conversation were of a more immediate and personal character. The capacity of the company cook, the quality of the last consignment of boots, the merits of different bivouacs, the prospect of the supply train coming up to time, the temper of the captain and subaltern. Such were the topics which the Confederate privates spent their leisure in discussing. They had long since discovered that war is never romantic and seldom exciting, 
but a monotonous round of tiresome duties, enlivened at rare intervals by dangerous episodes. They had become familiar with its constant accompaniment of privations, bad weather, wet bivouacs, and wretched roads, wood that would not kindle, and rations that did not satisfy. They had learned that a soldier's worst enemy may be his native soil, in the form of dust or mud, that it is possible to march for months without firing a shot or seeing a foe, that a battle is an interlude which breaks in at rare intervals, on the long round of digging, marching, bridge-building, and road-making, and that the time of the fiercest fire-eater is generally occupied in escorting mule trains, in mounting guard, in dragging wagons through the mud, at unloading or unloading stores, volunteering for perilous or onerous duties for which hundreds had eagerly offered themselves in the early days, ere the glamour of the soldier's life had vanished, had ceased to be popular. The men were now content to wait for orders, and as discipline crystallized into habit, they became resigned to the fact that they were no longer volunteers, masters of their own actions, but the paid servants of the state, compelled to obey and powerless to protest. End of section 55. Section 56 of Stonewall Jackson and the American Civil War. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Stonewall Jackson in the American Civil War by George Francis Robert Henderson. The Army of Northern Virginia, Part 2. To all outward appearance, then, in the spring of 1863, the Army of Northern Virginia bore an exceedingly close resemblance to an army of professional soldiers. It is true that military etiquette was not insisted on, that more license, both in quarters and on the march, was permitted than would be in the case in a regular army, that officers were not treated with the same respect, and that tact, rather than the strict enforcement of the regulations, was the keynote of command. Nevertheless, taken as a whole, the Confederate soldiers were exceedingly well conducted. The good elements in the ranks were too strong for those who were inclined to resist authority, and the amount of misbehavior was wonderfully small. There was little neglect of duty. Whatever the intelligence of the men told them was necessary for success, for safety or for efficiency, was done without reluctance. The outposts were seldom caught napping, digging and tree felling, for the men had learned the value of making fortifications and good roads, were taken as a matter of course. Nor was the southern soldier a grumbler. He accepted half rations and muddy camping grounds without remonstrance. If his boots wore out, he made shift to march without them, and when his uniform fell to pieces, he waited for the next victory to supply himself with a new outfit. He was enough of a philosopher to know that it is better to meet misery with a smile than with a scowl. Mark Tapley had many prototypes in the Confederate ranks, and the men were never more facetious than when things were at their worst. The very intensity of their sufferings became a source of merriment. Instead of growling and deserting, they laughed at their own bare feet, ragged clothes, and pinched faces, and weak, hungry, cold, wet, and dirty, with no hope of reward or rest. They marched cheerfully to meet the warmly clad and well-fed hosts of the enemy. Indomitable indeed were the hearts that beat beneath the gray jackets, and a spirit rising superior to all misfortune, that ever with a frolic welcome took the thunder and the sunshine was a marked characteristic of the Confederate soldier, nor was it only in camp or on the march that the temper of the troops betrayed itself in a reckless gaiety. The stress of battle might thin their ranks, but it was powerless to check their laughter. The dry humor of the American found a fine field of the incidents of a fierce engagement. Nothing escaped without remark. The excitement of a general the accelerated movements of the non-combatants, the vagaries of the army mule, 
the bad practice of the artillery, all afforded entertainment, and when the fight became hotter and the Federals pressed resolutely to the attack, the flow of badinage took a grim and peculiar turn. It has already been related that the Confederate armies depended, to a large degree, for their clothing and equipments on what they captured. So abundant was this source of supply that the soldier had come to look upon his enemy as a movable magazine of creature comforts, and if he marched cheerfully to battle, it was not so much because he loved fighting, but that he hoped to renew his wardrobe. A victory was much, but the spoils of victory were more. No sooner then did the Federals arrive within close range than the wild yells of the Southern infantry became mingled with fierce laughter and derisive shouts. Take off them boots, Yank. Come out of them clothes. We're going to have them. Come on, blue bellies. We want them blankets. Bring them rations along. You've got to leave them. Such were the cries, like the howls of half-famished wolves, that were heard along Jackson's lines at Fredericksburg, and they were not raised in mockery. The battlefield was a soldier's harvest, and as the sheaves of writhing forms under the muzzles of their deadly rifles increased in length and depth, the men listened with straining ears for the word to charge. The counterstroke was their opportunity. The rush with the bayonet was never so speedy, but their deft fingers found time to rifle the haversacks of the fallen, and such was the eagerness for booty that it was with the greatest difficulty that the troops were dragged off from pursuit. It is said that at Fredericksburg, some North Carolina regiments, which had repulsed and followed up a federal brigade, were hardly to be restrained from dashing into the midst of the enemy's reserves, and when at length they were turned back, their complaints were bitter. The order to halt and retire seemed to them nothing less than rank injustice. Half crying with disappointment, they accused their generals of favoritism. They don't want the North Carolinas to get anything they want. They wouldn't have stopped Hood's Texicans. They'd have let them go on. But if they relieved their own pressing wants at the expense of their enemies, if they stripped the dead and exchanged boots and clothing with their prisoners, seldom getting the worst of the bargain, no armies, to their lasting honor be it spoken, for no armies were so destitute, were ever less formidable to peaceful citizens within the border or beyond it than those of the Confederacy. It was exceedingly seldom that wanton damage was laid to the soldier's charge. The rights of non-combatants were religiously respected, and the farmers of Pennsylvania were treated with the same courtesy and consideration as the planters of Virginia. A village was none the worse for the vicinity of a Confederate bivouac, and neither man nor woman had reason to dread the half-starved tat of the aliens, who followed Lee and Jackson, as the gray columns in the march through Maryland swung through the streets of those towns where the Unionist sentiment was strong. The women, standing in the porches, waved the stars and stripes defiantly in their faces. But the only retort of the dust-brown ranks was a volley of jests, not usually unmixed with impudence. The personal attributes of their fair enemies did not escape observation. The damsel, whose locks were of conspicuous hue, was addressed as Bricktop until she screamed with rage and threatened to fire into the ranks, while the maiden of sour visage and uncertain years was saluted as Old Miss Vinegar by a whole division of infantry. But this was the limit of the soldier's resentment. At the same time, when in the midst of plenty he was not impeccable. For highway robbery and housebreaking he had no inclination, but he was by no means above putty larceny. Pigs and poultry, fruit, corn, vegetables, and fence rails, he looked upon as his lawful prerequisites. He was the most cunning of foragers, and neither stringent orders nor armed guards availed to protect a field of maize or a patch of potatoes. The traditional Negro was not more skillful in looting a fowl house. He had an unerring scent for whiskey or applejack, and the address he displayed encompassing the destruction of the unsuspecting porker was only equaled when he was caught flagrante delecto 
by the ingenuity of his excuses. According to the Confederate private, the most inoffensive animals in the districts to which the armories marched developed a strange pugnacity, and if bullet and bayonet were used against them, it was solely in self-defense. But such venial faults, common to every army and almost justified by the deficiencies of the Southern Commissariat, were more than atoned for when the enemy was met. Of the prowess of Lee's veterans sufficient has been said. Their deeds speak for themselves, but it was not the battlefield alone that bore witness to their fortitude. German soldiers have told us that in the war of 1870, when their armies, marching on Paris, found, to their astonishment, the great city strongly garrisoned, and hosts gathering in every quarter for its relief, a singular apathy took possession of the troops. The explanation offered by a great military writer is that, after a certain period, even the victor becomes tired of war, and the more civilized, he adds, a people is, the more quickly will this weakness become apparent. Whether this explanation be adequate is not easy to decide. The fact remains, however, that the Confederate volunteer was able to overcome that longing for home, which chilled the enthusiasm of the German conscript, and this is the more remarkable, inasmuch as his career was not one of uncheckered victory. In the spring of 1863, the Army of the Potomac, more numerous than ever, was still before him, firmly established on Virginian soil. Hope of foreign intervention, despite the assurances of the politicians, was gradually fading, and it was but too evident that the war was far from over. Yet at no time, during their two years of service, had the soldiers shown the slightest sign of that discouragement, which seized the Germans after two months. And who shall dare to say, that the Southerner was less highly civilized than the Prussian or the Bavarian. Political liberty, freedom of speech and action, are the real elements of civilization, and not merely education. But let the difference in the constitution of the two armies be borne in mind. The Confederates, with few exceptions, were volunteers who had become soldiers of their own choice, who had assumed arms deliberately and without compulsion, and who by their own votes were responsible that war had been declared. The Germans were conscripts, a dumb, powerless, irresponsible multitude, animated, no doubt, by hereditary hatred of the enemy, but without that sense of moral obligation which exists in the volunteer. We may be permitted, then, to believe that this sense of moral obligation was one reason why the spirit of the Southerners rose superior to human weakness, and that the old adage, which declares that one volunteer is better than three pressed men, is not yet out of date, nor is it an unfair inference that the armies of the Confederacy, allied by the crimson threat of kinship to those of Wellington, of Raglan, and of Clyde, owed much of their enduring fortitude to the rock whence they were hewn. And yet, with all their admirable qualities, the southern soldiers had not yet got rid of their original defects. Temperate, obedient, and well-conducted, small as was the percentage of bad characters and habitual misdoers, their discipline was still capable of improvement. The assertion, at first sight, seems a contradiction in terms. How could troops, it may be asked, who so seldom infringe the regulations be other than well-disciplined? for the simple reason that discipline in quarters is an absolute different quality from discipline in battle. No large body of intelligent men assembled in a just cause and of good character is likely to break out into excesses or, if obedience is manifestly necessary, to rebel against authority. Subordination to the law is the distinguishing mark of all civilized society, but such subordination however praiseworthy, is not the discipline of the soldier, though it is often confounded with it. A regiment of volunteers, billeted in some country town, would probably show a smaller list of misdemeanors than a regiment of regulars. Yet the latter might be exceedingly well disciplined, and the former have no real discipline whatever. Self-respect, for that is the discipline of the volunteer, is not battle discipline. 
the discipline of the cloth of habit, of tradition, of constant association, and of mutual confidence. Self-respect, excellent in itself, and by no means unknown among regular soldiers, does not carry with it a mechanical obedience to command, nor does it merge the individual in the mass and give the tremendous power of unity to the efforts of large numbers. It will not be pretended that the discipline of regular troops always rises superior to privation and defeat. It is a notorious fact that the number of deserters from Wellington's army in Spain and Portugal, men who willfully absented themselves from the colors and wandered over the country, was by no means inconsiderable, while the behavior of the French regulars in 1870, and even of the Germans, when they rushed back in panic through the village of Gravelotte, deaf to the threats and entreaties of their aged sovereign, was hardly in accordance with military tradition. Nevertheless, it is not difficult to show that the Southerners fell somewhat short of the highest standard. They were certainly not incapable of keeping their ranks under a hot fire, or of holding their ground to the last extremity. Pickett's charge at Gettysburg is one of the most splendid examples of disciplined valor in the annals of war, and the endurance of Lee's army at Sharpsburg has seldom been surpassed. Nor was the disorder into which the attacking lines were sooner or later thrown a proof of inferior training. Even in the days of flintlock muskets, the admixture of not only companies and battalions, but even of brigades and divisions, was a constant feature of fierce assaults over broken ground. If, under such conditions, the troops still press forward, and if, when success has been achieved, order is rapidly restored, then discipline is good, and in neither respect did the Confederates fail. But to be proof against disorder is not everything in battle. It is not sufficient that the men should be capable of fighting fiercely, to reap the full benefit of their weapons and their training. They must be obedient to command. The rifle is a far less formidable weapon when every man uses it at his own discretion than when the fire of a large body of troops is directed by a single will. Precision of movement, too, is necessary for the quick concentration of superior forces at the decisive point, for rapid support, and for effective combination. But neither was the fire of the Confederate infantry under the complete control of their officers, nor were their movements always characterized by order and regularity. It was seldom that the men could be induced to refrain from answering shot with shot. There was an extraordinary waste of ammunition, there was much unnecessary noise, and the regiments were very apt to get out of hand. It is needless to bring forward specific proof. The admissions of superior officers are quite sufficient. General D. H. Hill, in an interesting description of the Southern soldier, speaks very frankly of his shortcomings. Self-reliant always, obedient when he chose to be, impatient of drill and discipline, he was unsurpassed as a scout or on a skirmish line. Of the shoulder-to-shoulder -shoulder courage, bred of drill and discipline, he knew nothing and cared less. Hence, on the battlefield, he was more of a freelance than a machine. Whoever saw a Confederate line advancing that was not crooked as a ram's horn, each ragged rebel yelling on his own hook and aligning on himself, but there is as much need of the machine-made soldier as of the self-reliant soldier, and the concentrated blow is always the most effective blow. The erratic effort of the Confederate, heroic though it was, yet failed to achieve the maximum result just because it was erratic. Moreover, two serious evils attended that excessive egotism an individuality which came to the Confederate through his training, association, and habits. He knew when a movement was false and a position untenable, and he was too little of a machine to give in such cases the wholehearted service which might have redeemed the blunder. The other evil was an ever-growing one. His disregard of discipline and independence of character made him often a straggler, and by straggling the fruit of many a victory was lost. General Lee was not less outspoken. 
a circular issued to his troops during the last month of the war, is virtually a criticism on their conduct. Many opportunities, he wrote, have been lost and hundreds of valuable lives uselessly sacrificed for want of a strict observance of discipline. Its object is to enable an army to bring promptly into action the largest possible number of men in good order and under the control of their officers. Its effects are visible in all military history, which records the triumph of discipline and courage far more frequently than that of numbers and resources. The importance and utility of thorough discipline should be impressed on officers and men on all occasions by illustrations taken from the experience of the instructor or from other sources of information. They should be made to understand that discipline contributes no less to their safety than to their efficiency. Disastrous surprises and those sudden panics which lead to defeat and the greatest loss of life are of rare occurrence among disciplined troops. It is well known that the greatest number of casualties occur when men become scattered, and especially when they retreat in confusion, as the fire of the enemy is then more deliberate and fatal. The experience of every officer shows that those troops suffer least who attack most vigorously, and that a few men, retaining their organization and acting in concert, accomplish far more with smaller loss than a larger number scattered and disorganized. The appearance of a steady, unbroken line is more formidable to the enemy and renders his aim less accurate and his fire less effective. Orders can be readily transmitted, advantage can be properly taken at every opportunity, and all efforts being directed to a common end, the combat will be briefer and success more certain. Let officers and men be made to feel that they will most effectually secure their safety by remaining steadily at their posts, preserving order, and fighting with coolness and vigor. Impress upon the officers that discipline cannot be attained without constant watchfulness on their part. They must attend to the smallest particulars of detail. Men must be habituated to obey, or they cannot be controlled in battle and the neglect of the least important order impairs the proper influence of the officer. That such a circular was considered necessary after the troops had been nearly four years under arms establishes beyond all question that the discipline of the Confederate Army was not that of the regular troops with whom General Lee had served under the Stars and Stripes, but it's not to be understood that he attributed the deficiencies of his soldiers to any spirit of resistance on their part to the demands of subordination. Elsewhere, he says, the greatest difficulty I find is in causing orders and regulations to be obeyed. This arises not from a spirit of disobedience, but from ignorance. And here, with his usual perspicacity, he goes straight to the root of the evil, when the men in the ranks understand all that discipline involves, safety, health, efficiency, victory, it is easily maintained, and it is because experience and tradition have taught them this, that veteran armies are so amenable to control. Soldiers, says Sir Charles Napier, must obey in all things. They may and do laugh at foolish orders, but they nevertheless obey not because they are blindly obedient, but because they know that to disobey is to break the backbone of their profession. Such knowledge, however, is long in coming, even to the regular, and it may be questioned whether it ever really came home to the Confederates. In fact, the Southern soldier, ignorant at the outset of what may be accomplished by discipline, never quite got rid of the belief that the enthusiasm of the individual, his goodwill and his native courage, was a more than sufficient substitute. The spirit which animates our soldiers, wrote Lee, and the natural courage with which they are so liberally endowed, have led to a reliance upon those good qualities, to the neglect of measures which would increase their efficiency and contribute to their safety. Yet the soldier was hardly to blame. Neither he nor his regimental officers had any previous knowledge of war when they were suddenly launched against the enemy. And there was no time to instill into them 
the habits of discipline. There was no regular army to set them an example, no historic force whose traditions they would unconsciously have adopted. The exigencies of the service were bad the retention of the men in camps of instruction, and trained instructors could not be spared for more important duties. Such ignorance, however, as that which prevailed in the southern ranks is not always excusable. It would be well if those who pose as the friends of the private soldier, as his protectors from injustice, realize the mischief they may do by injudicious sympathy. The process of being broken to discipline is undoubtedly gaffing to the instincts of free men, and it is beyond question that among a multitude of superiors, some will be found who are neither just nor considerate. Instances of hardship must inevitably occur. But men and officers, but discipline presses as hardly on the officers as on the men, must obey, no matter at what cost to their feelings. For obedience to orders, instant and unhesitating, is not only the lifeblood of armies, but the security of the states, and the doctrine that under any conditions whatever, deliberate disobedience can be justified is treason to the commonwealth. It is to be remembered that the end of the soldier's existence is not merely to conduct himself as a respectable citizen and earn his wages, but to face peril and privations, not of his own free will, but at the bidding of others, and in circumstances where his natural instincts assert themselves most strongly, to make a complete surrender of mind and body. If he has been in the habit of weighing the justice or the wisdom of orders before obeying them, if he has been taught that disobedience may be a pardonable crime, he will probably question the justice of the order that apparently sends him to certain death. If he once begins to think, if he once contemplates the possibility of disobedience, if he permits a single idea to enter his head, beyond the necessity of instant compliance, it is unlikely that he will rise superior to the promptings of his weaker nature. Men must be habituated to obey, or they cannot be controlled in battle and the slightest interference with the habit of subordination is fraught, therefore, with the very greatest danger to the efficiency of an army. It has been asserted, and it would appear that the idea is widespread, that patriotism and intelligence are of vastly more importance than the habit of obedience, and it was certainly a very general opinion in America before the war. This idea should have been effectually dissipated at all events in the North, by the Battle of Bull Run. Nevertheless, throughout the conflict, a predilection existed in favor of what was called the thinking bayonet, and the very term machine-made soldier, employed by General D.J. Hill, proves that the strict discipline of regular armies was not held in high esteem. It is certainly true that the thinking bayonet is by no means to be decried, a man can no more be a good soldier without intelligence and aptitude for his profession than he can be a successful poacher or a skillful jockey. But it is possible, in considering the value of an armed force, to rate too highly the natural qualities of the individual in the ranks. In certain circumstances, especially in irregular warfare, where each man fights for his own hand, they doubtless play a conspicuous part. A thousand skilled riflemen, familiar with the moving accidents by flood and field, even if they have no regular training and are incapable of precise maneuvers, may prove more than a match for the same number of professional soldiers. But when large numbers are in question, when the concentration of superior force at a single point and the close cooperation of the three arms, infantry, artillery, and cavalry, decide the issue, then the force that can maneuver, that moves like a machine at the mandate of a single will, has a marked advantage, and the power of maneuvering and of combination is conferred by discipline alone. Two Marmelukes, said Napoleon, can defeat three French horsemen, because they are better armed, better mounted, and more skillful. A hundred French horse have nothing to fear from a hundred Marmelukes. 300 would defeat a similar number, 
and a thousand French would defeat 1,500 Marmelukes. So great is the influence of tactics, order, and the power of maneuvering. It may be said, moreover, that whatever may have been the case in past times, the training of the regular soldier today neither aims at producing mere machines, nor has it that effect. As much attention is given to the development of self-reliance in the rank and file as to making them subordinate, it has long been recognized that there are many occasions in war when even the private must use his wits on outpost or patrol as a scout and orderly, or when his immediate superiors have fallen. Momentous issues may hang on his judgment and initiative, and in a good army, these qualities are sedulously fostered by constant instruction in field duties. Nor is the fear justified that the strict enforcement of exact obedience, whenever a superior is present, impairs under this system of training the capacity for independent action when such action becomes necessary. In the old days, to drill and discipline the soldier into a machine was undoubtedly the end of all his training. Today, his officers had the more difficult task of stimulating his intelligence, while at the same time they instilled the habits of subordination, and that such task may be successfully accomplished, we have practical proof. The regiments of the Light Brigade, trained by Sir John Moore nearly a century ago on the system of today, proved their superiority in the field over all others. As skirmishers on the outpost and in independent fighting, they were exceedingly efficient, and yet, when they marched shoulder to shoulder, no troops in Wellington's army showed a more solid front, maneuvered with great precision, or were more completely under the control of their officers. Mechanical obedience, then, is perfectly compatible with the freest exercise of the intelligence, provided that the men are so trained that they know instinctively when to give the one and to use the other, and the Confederates had their officers and non-commissioned officers been trained soldiers, might easily have acquired this highest form of discipline, as it was and as it always will be with improvised troops. The discipline of battle was to a great degree purely personal. The men followed those officers whom they knew and in whom they had confidence, but they did not always obey simply because the officer had the right to command, and they were not so easily handled when the wisdom of an order or the necessity of a movement was not apparent. The only way it was said by an Englishman in the Confederacy in which an officer could acquire influence over the southern soldiers was by his personal conduct under fire. Every ounce of authority was his expression, had to be purchased by a drop of my blood. Such being the case, it is manifest that Jackson's method of discipline were well adapted to the peculiar constitution of the army in which he served. With the officers, he was exceedingly strict. He looked to them to set an example of unhesitating obedience and the precise performance of duty. He demanded, too, and in this respect his own conduct was a model, that the rank and file should be treated with tact and consideration. He remembered that his citizen soldiers were utterly unfamiliar with the forms and customs of military life, that what to the regular would be a mere matter of course might seem a gross outrage to the man who had never acknowledged a superior. In his selection of officers, therefore, for posts upon his staff and in his recommendations for promotion, he considered personal characteristics rather than professional ability. He preferred men who would win the confidence of others, men not only strong, but possessing warm sympathies and broad minds. To mere martinets, ruling by regulation, and treating the soldier as a machine. But at the same time, he was by no means disposed to condone misconduct in the volunteers. Never was there a more striking contrast than between Jackson the general and Jackson off duty. During his sojourn at Moss Neck, Mr. Corbin's little daughter, a child of six years old, became a special favorite. Her pretty face and winsome ways were so charming that he requested her mother that she might visit him every afternoon when the day's labors were over. 
He had always some little treat in store for her, an orange or an apple. But one afternoon, he found that his supply of good things was exhausted. Glancing round the room, his eye fell on a new uniform cap, ornamented with a gold band. Taking his knife, he ripped off the braid and fastened it among the curls of his little playfellow. A little later, the child was taken ill, and after his removal from Lost Neck, he heard that she had died. The general, writes his aide-de-camp, wept freely when I brought him the sad news. Yet in the administration of discipline, Jackson was far sterner than General Lee, or indeed than any other of the generals in Virginia. Once on the march, fearing lest his men might stray from the ranks and commit acts of pillage, he had issued an order that the soldiers should not enter private dwellings. Disregarding the order, a soldier entered a house and even used insulting language to the women of the family. This was reported to Jackson, who had the man arrested, tried by drumhead court-martial, and shot in twenty minutes. He never failed to confirm the sentences of death passed by courts martial on deserters. It was in vain that his oldest friends, or even the chaplains, appealed for a mitigation of the extreme penalty. While he was in command at Winchester in December 1861, a soldier who was charged with striking his captain, was tried by court-martial and sentenced to be shot. Knowing that the breach of discipline had been attended with many extenuating circumstances, some of us endeavored to secure his pardon. Possessing ourselves of all the facts, we waited upon the general, who evinced the deepest interest in the object of our visit, and listened with evident sympathy to our plea. There was moisture in his eyes when we repeated the poor fellow's pitiful appeal that he be allowed to die for his country as a soldier on the field of battle and not as a dog by the muskets of his own comrades. Such solicitude for the success of our efforts did he manifest that he even suggested some things to be done which we had not thought of. At the same time, he warned us not to be too hopeful. He said, It is unquestionably a case of great hardship, but a pardon at this juncture might work greater hardship. Resistance to lawful authority is a grave offense in a soldier. To pardon this man would be to encourage insubordination throughout the army, and so ruin our cause. Still, he added, I will review the whole case, and no man will be happier than myself if I can reach the same conclusion as you have done. The soldier was shot. End of section 56section 57 of stonewall jackson and the american civil war this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org stonewall jackson and the american civil war by george francis robert henderson the army of northern virginia part 3 on another occasion Four men were to be executed for desertion to the enemy. The firing party had been ordered to parade at four o'clock in the afternoon, and shortly before the hour a chaplain, not noted for his tact, made his way to the general's tent, and petitioned earnestly that the prisoners might even now be released. Jackson, whom he found pacing backwards and forwards, in evident agitation, watch in hand, listened courteously to his arguments, but made no reply, until at length the worthy minister, in his most impressive manner, said, General, consider your responsibilities before the Lord. You are sending these men's souls to hell. With a look of intense disgust at such emptied cant, Jackson made one stride forward, took the astonished divine by his shoulders, and, saying in his severest tones, That, sir, is my business. You do yours, thrust him forcibly from the tent. His severity as regards the more serious offenses did not, however, alienate in the smallest degree the confidence and affection of his soldiers. They had full faith in his justice. They were well aware that to order the execution of some unfortunate wretch gave him intense pain. But they recognized as clearly as he did himself 
that it was sometimes expedient that individuals should suffer. They knew that not all men, nor even the greater part, are heroes, and that if the worthless element had once reason to believe that they might escape the legitimate consequences of their crimes, desertion and insubordination would destroy the army. By some of the senior officers, however, his rigorous ideas of discipline were less favorably considered. They were by no means disposed to quarrel with the fact that the sentences of courts martial in the Second Army Corps were almost invariably confirmed, but they objected strongly to the same measure which they meted out to the men being consistently applied to themselves. They could not be brought to see that neglect of duty, however trivial, on the part of a colonel or brigadier, was just as serious a fault as desertion or insubordination on the part of the men, and the conflict of opinion in certain cases had unfortunate results. To those whose conduct he approved, he was more than considerate. General Lane, who was under him as a cadet at Lexington, writes as follows. When in camp at Bunker Hill, after the Battle of Sharpsburg, where the gallant branch was killed, I, as colonel commanding the brigade, was directed by General A.P. Hill to hold my command in readiness, with three days' rations for detached service, and to report to General Jackson for further orders. That was all the information that Hill could give me. I had been in Jackson's corps since the battles round Richmond, and had been very derelict in not paying my respects to my old professor. As I rode to his headquarters, I wondered if he would recognize me. I certainly expected to receive his orders in a few terse sentences, and to be promptly dismissed with a military salute. He knew me as soon as I entered his tent, though we had not met for years. He rose quickly, with a smile on his face, took my hand in both of his in the warmest manner, expressed his pleasure at seeing me, chided me for not having been to see him, and bade me be seated. His kind words, the tones of his voice, his familiarly calling me Lane, whereas it had always been Mr. Lane at the Institute, put me completely at my ease. Then, for the first time, I began to love that reserved man, whom I had always honored and respected as my professor, and whom I greatly admired as my general. After a very pleasant and somewhat protracted conversation, he ordered me to move at once, and as rapidly as possible, to North Mountain Depot, tear up the Baltimore and Ohio Railroad, and put myself in communication with General Hampton, commanding Cavalry Brigade, who would cover my operations. While we were there, General Jackson sent a member of his staff to see how we were progressing. That night, I received orders to move at once and quickly to Martinsburg, as there had been heavy skirmishing near Carindrysville. Next morning, when I reported to General Jackson, he received me in the same cordial, warm-hearted manner, complimented me on the thoroughness of my work, told me that he had recommended me for promotion to take permanent charge of Branch's brigade, and that as I was the only person recommended through military channels, I would be appointed in spite of the two aspirants who were trying to bring political influence to bear enrichment in their behalf. When I rose to go, he took my hand in both of his, looked me steadily in the face and in the words and tones of friendly warmth, which can never be forgotten, again expressed his confidence in my promotion and bade me goodbye with the God bless you, Lane. On the other hand, Jackson's treatment of those who failed to obey his orders was very different. No matter how high the rank of the offender, Jackson never sought to screen the crime. No thought that the public rebuke of his principal subordinates might impair their authority or destroy their cordial relations with himself ever stayed his hand, and it may well be questioned whether his disregard of consequences was not too absolutely uncompromising. Men who live in constant dread of their chief's anger are not likely to render loyal and efficient service, and the least friction in the higher ranks is felt throughout the whole command. When the troops begin taking sides and unanimity disappears, the power of energetic combination at once deteriorates. That Jackson was perfectly just is not denied. 
the misconduct of his subordinates was sometimes flagrant, but it may well be questioned whether to keep officers under arrest for weeks or even months, marching without their swords in rear of the column, was wholly wise. There is but one public punishment for a senior officer who is guilty of serious misbehavior, and that is instant dismissal. If he is suffered to remain in the army, his presence will always be a source of weakness. But the question will arise, is it possible to replace him? If he is trusted by his men, they will resent his removal and give but half-hearted support to his successor. So in dealing with those in high places, tact and consideration are essential. Even Dr. Dabney admits that in this respect, Jackson's conduct is open to criticism. As already related, he looked on the blunders of his officers, if those blunders were honest and due simply to misconception of the situation with a tolerant eye. He knew too much of war and its difficulties to expect that their judgment would be unerring. He never made the mistake of reprehending the man who had done his best to succeed and contented himself with pointing out, quietly and courteously, how failure might have been avoided. But if he believes, says his chief of the staff, that his subordinates were self-indulgent or contumacious, he became a stern and exacting master. And during his career, a causeless friction was produced in the working of his government over several gallant and meritorious officers who served under him. This was almost the sole fault of his military character, that by this jealousy of intentional inefficiency, he diminished the sympathy between himself and the general officers, next his person, by whom his orders were to be executed. Had he been able to exercise the same energetic authority through the medium of a zealous personal affection, he would have been a more perfect leader of armies. This system of command was in all probability the outcome of deliberate calculation. No officer placed in permanent charge of a considerable force, least of all, a man who had never acted except upon reflection, and who had a wise regard for human nature, could fail to lay down for himself certain principles of conduct towards both officers and men. It may be, then, that Jackson considered the course he pursued the best adapted to maintain discipline amongst a number of ambitious young generals, some of whom had been senior to himself in the old service, and all of whom had been raised suddenly, with probably some disturbance to their self-possession, to high rank. It is to be remembered, too, that during the campaigns of 1862, his preeminent ability was only by degrees made clear. It was not everyone who, like General Lee, discerned the great qualities of the silent and unassuming instructor of cadets, and other leaders a more dashing exterior, with a well-deserved reputation for brilliant courage, may well have doubted whether his capacity was superior to their own. Such soaring spirits possibly needed a tight hand, and in any case, Jackson had much cause for irritation. With Wolfe and Sherman, he shared the distinguished honor of being considered crazy by hundreds of self-sufficient mediocrities. It was impossible that he should have been ignorant, although not one word of complaint ever passed his lips, how grossly he was misrepresented, how he was caricatured in the press, and credited with the most extravagant and foolhardy ideas of war. Nor did his subordinates, in very many instances, give him that loyal and ungrudging support which he conceived was the due of the commanding general. More than one of his enterprises fell short of the full measure of success, owing to the shortcomings of others, and these shortcomings, such as Loring's insubordination at Romney, Stuart's refusal to pursue Banks after Winchester, Garnett's retreat at Kernstown, A.P. Hill's tardiness at Cedar Run, might all be traced to the same cause, disdain of his capacity and a misconception of their own position. In such circumstances, it is hardly to be wondered at if his wrath blazed to a white heat. He was not of a forgiving nature. Once roused, resentment took possession of his whole being, and it may be questioned whether it was ever really appeased. 
At the same time, the fact that Jackson lacked the fascination which, allied to lofty intellect, wins the hearts of men most readily and is preeminently the characteristic of the very greatest warriors can hardly be denied. His influence with men was a plant of slow growth. Yet the glamour of his great deeds, the gradual recognition of his unfailing sympathy, his modesty and his truth, produced in the end the same result as the personal charm of Napoleon, of Nelson, and of Lee. His hold on the devotion of his troops was very sure. God knows, said his adjutant general, weeping the tears of a brave man, I would have died for him. And few commanders have been followed with more implicit confidence or have inspired a deeper and more abiding affection. Long years after the war, a bronze statue, in his habit as he lived, was erected on his grave at Lexington. Thither, when the figure was unveiled, came the survivors of the Second Army Corps, the men of Manassas and of Sharpsburg, of Fredericksburg and Chancellorsville, and of many another hard-fought field. And the younger generation looked on the relics of an army whose peer the world has seldom seen. When the guns had fired a salute, the wild rebel yell, the music which the great Virginian had loved so well, rang loud above his grave. And as the last reverberations died away across the hill, the gray-haired ranks stood still and silent. See how they loved him, said one, and it was spoken with deepest reverence. Two well-known officers who had served under Jackson were sitting near each other on their horses. Each remarked the silence of the other, and each saw that the other was in tears. I'm not ashamed of it, Snowden, nor I, old boy, replied the other, as he tried to smile. When, after the unveiling, the columns marched past the monument, the old fellows looked up and then bowed their uncovered heads and passed on. But one tall, gaunt soldier of the Stonewall Brigade, as he passed out of the cemetery, looked back for a moment at the lifelike figure of his general, and waving his old gray hat towards it, cried out, Goodbye, old man, goodbye. We've done all we could for you. Goodbye. It is not always to discern why one general is worshipped, even by men who have never met him, while another, of equal or even superior capacity, fails to awaken the least spark of affection, except in his chosen friends. Grant was undoubtedly a greater soldier than McClellan, and the genius of Wellington was not less than that of Nelson. And yet, while Nelson and McClellan won all hearts, not one single private had either for Wellington or Grant any warmer sentiment than respect. It would be as unfair, however, to attribute selfishness or want of sympathy to either Wellington or Grant, as to insinuate that Nelson and McClellan were deliberate bidders for popularity. It may be that, in the two former, the very strength of their patriotism was at fault. To them, the state was everything, the individual nothing. To fight for their country was merely a question of duty, into which the idea of glory or recompense hardly entered and indifferent themselves either to praise or blame. They considered that the victory of the national arms was a sufficient reward for the soldiers' toils. Both were generous and open-handed, exerting themselves incessantly to provide for the comfort and well-being of their troops. Neither was insensible to suffering, and both were just as capable of self-sacrifice as either Nelson or McClellan but the standpoint from which they looked at war was too exalted. Nelson and McClellan, on the other hand, recognized that they commanded men, not Stoics. Sharing with Napoleon the rare quality of captivating others, a quality which comes by nature, or comes not at all. They made allowance for human nature, and identified themselves with those beneath them in the closest camaraderie. And herein, to a great extent, lay the secret of the enthusiastic devotion which they inspired. If the pitiless dissectors of character are right, we ought to see in Napoleon the most selfish of tyrants, the coldest and most crafty of charlatans. It is difficult, however, to believe that the hearts of a generation of hardy warriors were conquered merely 
by ringing phrases and skillful flattery. It should be remembered that, from a mercenary force, degraded and despised, he transformed the Grand Army into the terror of Europe and the pride of France. During the years of his glory, when the legions controlled the destinies of their country, none was more honored than the soldier. His interests were always the first to be considered. The highest ranks in the peerage, the highest offices of state, were held by men who had carried the knapsack, and when thrones were going begging, their claims were preferred upon all others. The emperor, with all his greatness, was always the little corporal to his grenadiers. His career was their own. As they shared his glory, so they shared his reward. Every upward step he made toward supreme power, he took them with him, and their relations were always of the most cordial and familiar character. He was never happier than when, on the eve of some great battle, he made his bivouac within a square of the guard, never more at ease than when exchanging rough compliments with the veterans of Rivoli or Gina. He was the representative of the army rather than of the nation. The men knew that no civilian would be preferred before them, that their gallant deeds were certain of his recognition, that their claims to the cross, to pension, and to promotion would be as carefully considered as the claims of their generals. They loved Napoleon, and they trusted him, and whatever may have been his faults, he was the little corporal, the friend and comrade of his soldiers, to the end. It was by the same hooks of steel as Stonewall Jackson grappled the hearts of the Second Army Corps to his own. His men loved him, not merely because he was the bravest man they had ever known, the strongest and the most resolute, not because he had given them glory and had made them heroes whose fame was known beyond the confines of the South, but because he was one of themselves, with no interest apart from their interest, because he raised them to his own level, respecting them not merely as soldiers, but as comrades, the tried comrades of many a hard fight and weary march. Although he ruled them with a rod of iron, he made no secret, either officially or privately, of his deep and abiding admiration for their self-sacrificing valor. His very dispatches showed that he regarded his own skill and courage as small indeed when compared with theirs. Like Napoleon's, his congratulatory orders were conspicuous for the absence of all reference to himself. It was always we, not I, and he was among the first to recognize the worth of the rank and file. One day, says Dr. McGuire, early in the war, when the 2nd Virginia Regiment marched by, I said to General Johnston, if these men will not fight, you have no troops that will. He expressed the prevalent opinion of the day in his reply, saying, I would not give one company of regulars for the whole regiment. When I returned to Jackson, and I had occasion to quote General Johnston's opinion. Did he say that, he asked, and of those splendid men? And then he added, The patriot volunteer, fighting for his country and his rights, makes the most reliable soldier upon earth. And his veterans knew more than that. Their general believed them to be heroes. They knew that this great, valiant man, beside whom all others, save Lee himself, seemed small and feeble, this mighty captain, who held the host of the enemy in the hollow of his hand, was the kindest and the most considerate of human beings. To them he was Old Jack, in the same affectionate sense as he had been Old Jack to his classmates at West Point. They followed him willingly, for they knew that the path he trod was the way to victory, but they loved him as children do their parents, because they were his first thought and his last. In season and out of season, he labored for their welfare. To his transporting commissariat officers, he was a hard master. The unfortunate white, who had neglected to bring up supplies, or who ventured to make difficulties discovered to his cost, that his quiet commander could be very terrible. But those officers who did their duty, in whatever branch of the service they might be serving, found that their zeal was more than appreciated. For himself, he asked nothing. On behalf of his subordinates, he was a constant and persistent suitor. He was not only ready to support the claims to promotion of those who deserved it, 
but in the case of those who displayed special merit, he took the initiative himself, and he was not content with one refusal. His only difference with General Lee, if difference it can be called, was on the question of this nature. The commander-in-chief, it appears, soon after the Battle of Fredericksburg, had proposed to appoint officers to the Second Army Corps who had served elsewhere. After some correspondence, Jackson wrote as follows, My rule has been to recommend such as were, in my opinion, best qualified for filling vacancies. The application of this rule has prevented me from even recommending for the command of my old brigade one of its officers, because I did not regard any of them as competent, as another of whose qualifications I had a higher opinion. This rule has led me to recommend Colonel Bradley T. Johnson for the command of Talaferro's brigade. I desire the interest of the service, and no other interest, to determine who shall be selected to fill the vacancies. Guided by this principle, I cannot go outside of my command for persons to fill vacancies in it, unless by so doing a more competent officer is secured. This same principle leads me to oppose having officers who have never served with me, and of those qualifications I have no knowledge, forced upon me by promoting them to fill vacancies in my command, and advancing them over meritorious officers, well qualified for the positions, and of whose qualifications I have had ample opportunities of judging from their having served with me. In my opinion, the interest of the service would be injured if I should quietly consent to see officers with whose qualifications I am not acquainted promoted into my command to fill vacancies, regardless of the merits of my own officers who are well qualified for the positions. The same principle leads me when selections have to be made outside of my command to recommend those if there should be such whose form of service with me proved them well qualified for filling the vacancies. This induced me to recommend Captain Chu, who does not belong to this Army Corps, but whose well-earned reputation when with me has not been forgotten. And as he studied the wishes of his officers, working quietly and persistently for their advancement, so he studied the wishes of the private soldiers. It is well known that artillerymen come after a time, to feel a personal affection for their guns, especially those which they have used in battle. When in camp near Fredericksburg, Jackson was asked to transfer certain field pieces which had belonged to his old division to another portion of the command. The men were exasperated, and demand elicited the following letter. December 3, 1862. General R. E. Lee, Commanding Army of Northern Virginia. General... Your letter of this date, recommending that I distribute the rifle and Napoleon guns so as to give General D.H. Hill a fair proportion, has been received. I respectfully request, if any such distribution is to be made, that you will direct your chief of artillery or some other officer to do it. But I hope that none of the guns which belonged to the Army of the Valley, before it became part of the Army of Northern Virginia, after the Battle of Cedar Run, will be taken from it. If since that time any artillery has improperly come into my command, I trust that it will be taken away, and the person in whose possession it may be found punished, if his conduct requires it. So careful was I to prevent an improper distribution of the artillery and other public property captured at Harper's Ferry that I issued a written order directing my staff officers to turn over to the proper chiefs of staff of the Army of Northern Virginia all captured stores. A copy of the order is herewith enclosed. General D. H. Hill's artillery wants existed at the time he was assigned to my command and it is hoped that the artillery which belonged to the Army of the Valley will not be taken to supply his wants. I am, General, your obedient servant, T.J. Jackson, Lieutenant General. No further correspondence is to be found on the subject, so it may be presumed that the protest was successful. Jackson's relations with the rank and file have already been referred to, and although he was now commander of an Army Corps, and universally acknowledged as one of the foremost generals of the Confederacy, 
his rise in rank and reputation had brought no increase of dignity. He still treated the humblest privates with the same courtesy that he treated the commander-in-chief. He never repelled their advances, nor refused, if he could, to satisfy their curiosity, and although he seldom went out of his way to speak to them, if any soldier addressed him, especially if he belonged to a regiment recruited from the valley, he seldom omitted to make some inquiry after those he had left at home. Never, it was said, was his tone more gentle or his smile more winning than when he was speaking to some ragged representative of his old brigade. How his heart went out to them may be inferred from the following. Writing to a fellow at Richmond, he said, Though I have been relieved from command in the valley, I may never again be assigned to that important trust. Yet I feel deeply, when I see the patriotic people of that region under the heel of a hateful military despotism, there are all the hopes of those who have been with me from the commencement of the war in Virginia, who have repeatedly left their homes and families in the hands of the enemy to brave the dangers of battle and disease, and there are those who have so devotedly labored for the relief of our suffering sick and wounded. Note. Tables showing the nationality and average measurements of 346,744 federal soldiers examined for military service after March 6, 1863. Table. United States, 69%. Number, 237,931. Height, 5 feet, 7.40 inches. Chest at inspiration. 35.61 inches. Germany. Number, 35,935. Height, 5 feet, 5.54 inches. Chested inspiration, 35.88 inches. Ireland. Number, 32,473. Height, 5 feet, 5.54 inches. Chested inspiration, 35.24 Canada, 15,507. Height, 5 feet, 5.51 inches. Chested inspiration, 35.42 inches. England, 11,479. Height, 5 feet, 6.02 inches. Chested inspiration, 35.41. France, 2,630. Height, 5 feet, 5.81 inches. Chested inspiration, 35.29 inches. Scotland, 2,127. Height, 5 feet, 6.13 inches. Chested inspiration, 35.97 inches. Other nationalities, including Wales and five British colonies, 9,202. No other measurements were given. Total number, 346,744. Report of the Provost Marshal General, 1866, page 698. The role of the 35th Massachusetts, which may be taken as a typical Northern Regiment, shows clearly enough at what period the great influx of foreigners took place. Of 104 officers, the names of all but four, and these four joined in 1864, a pure English. Of the 964 rank and file of which the regiment was originally composed, only 50 bore foreign names. In 1864, however, 495 recruits were received, and of these, over 400 were German immigrants. History of the 35th Regiment Massachusetts Volunteers, 1862-65. to End of Section 57Section 58 of Stonewall Jackson and the American Civil War. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Stonewall Jackson and the American Civil War by George Francis Robert Henderson. Section 58 Winter Quarters. Part 1. 1863. 
During the long interval which intervened between the Battle of Fredericksburg and the next campaign, Jackson employed himself in preparing the reports of his battles, which had been called for by the commander-in-chief. They were not compiled in their entirety by his own hand. He was no novice at literary composition, and his pen, as his letter-book shows, was not that of an unready writer. He had a good command of language, and that power of clear and concise expression which every officer in command of a large force, a position naturally entailing a large amount of confidential correspondence, must necessarily possess. But the task now set him was one of no ordinary magnitude. Since the Battle of Kernstown, the report of which had been furnished in April 1862, the time had been too fully occupied to admit of the crowded events being placed on record and more than one half of the division, brigade, and regimental commanders who had been engaged in the operations of the period had been killed. Nor even now did his duties permit him the necessary leisure to complete the work without assistance. On his requisition, therefore, Colonel Charles Faulkner, who had been United States Minister to France before the war, was attached to his staff for the purpose of collecting the reports of the subordinate commanders and combining them in the proper form. The rough drafts were carefully gone over by the general. Every sentence was weighed, and everything that might possibly convey a wrong impression was at once rejected. Evidence was called to clear up disputed points. No inferences or suppositions were allowed to stand. Truth was never permitted to be sacrificed to effect. Superlatives were rigorously excluded, and the narratives may be unquestionably accepted as an accurate relation of the facts. Many stirring passages were added by the general's own pen, and the praise bestowed upon the troops, both officers and men, is couched in the warmest terms. Yet much was omitted. Jackson had a rooted objection to represent the motives of his actions, or to set forth the object of his movements. In reply to a remonstrance that those who came after him would be embarrassed by the absence of these explanations, and that his fame would suffer, he said, The men who come after me must act for themselves, and as to the historians who speak of the movements of my command, I do not concern myself greatly as to what they may say. To judge, then, from the reports, Jackson himself had very little to do with his success. Indeed, were they the only evidence available, it would be difficult to ascertain whether the more brilliant maneuvers were ordered by himself or executed on the initiative of others. But in this he was perfectly consistent. When the publisher of an illustrated periodical wrote to him asking him for his portrait and some notes of his battles as the basis of a sketch, he replied that he had no likeness of himself and had done nothing worthy of mention. It is not without interest in this connection to note that the Old Testament supplied him with a pattern for his reports, just as it supplied him, as he often declared, with precepts and principles applicable to every military emergency. After he was wounded, enlarging one morning on his favorite topic of practical religion, he turned to the staff officer in attendance, Lieutenant Smith, and asked him with a smile, can you tell me where the Bible gives generals a model for their official reports of battles? The aide-de-camp answered, laughing, that it never entered his mind to think of looking for such a thing in the scriptures. Nevertheless, said the general, there are such, and excellent models too. Look, for instance, at the narrative of Joshua's battles with the Amalekites. There you have one. It has clearness, brevity, modesty, and it traces the victory to its right source, the blessing of God. The early spring of 1863 was undoubtedly one of the happiest seasons of a singularly happy life. Jackson's ambition, if the desire for such rank that would enable him to put the powers within him to the best use may be so termed, was fully gratified. The country lad who, one and twenty years ago on his way to West Point, had looked on the green hills of Virginia from the capital at Washington, could hardly have anticipated a higher destiny than that which had befallen him. 
over the hearts and wills of thirty thousand magnificent soldiers, the very flower of southern manhood, his empire was absolute, and such dominion is neither the heritage of princes nor within the reach of wealth. The most trusted lieutenant of his great commander, the strong right arm with which he had executed his most brilliant enterprises, he shared with him the esteem and admiration not only of the army, but of the whole people of the South. The name he had determined, in his lonely boyhood, to bring back to honor already ranked with those of the revolutionary heroes. Even his enemies, for the brave men at the front left rancor to the politicians, were not proof against the attraction of his great achievements. A friendly intercourse, not always confined to a trade of coffee for tobacco, existed between the outposts. Johnnies and Yanks often exchanged greetings across the Rappahannock, and it is related that one day, when Jackson rode along the river, and the Confederate troops ran together, as was their custom, to greet him with a yell, the Federal pickets, roused by the sudden clamor, crowded to the bank and shouted across to ask the cause. General Stonewall Jackson was the proud reply of the gray-coated sentry. Immediately to his astonishment, the cry, Hurrah for Stonewall Jackson, rang out from the Federal ranks and the voices of North and South, prophetic of a time to come, mingled in acclamation of a great American. The situation of the army, although the winter was unusually severe, was not without its compensations. The country was covered with snow, and storms were frequent. Rations were still scarce, for the single line of badly laid rails, subjected to the strain of an abnormal traffic, formed a precarious means of transport. Every spring and pond was frozen, and the soldiers shivered beneath their scanty coverings. Huts, however, were in process of erection, and the goodwill of the people did something to supply the deficiencies of the commissariat. The homes of Virginia were stripped, and many, like Jackson himself, whose blankets had already been sent from Lexington to his old brigade, ordered their carpets to be cut up into rugs and distributed among the men but neither cold nor hunger could crush the spirit of the troops. The bivouacs were never merrier than on the bare hills and in the dark pine woods which looked down on the ruins and the graves of Fredericksburg. Picket duty was light, for the black waters of the great river formed a secure barrier against attack, and if the men's stomachs were empty, they could still feast their eyes on a charming landscape. To the right and left the wooded range extended towards Fredericksburg, on the one hand, and Port Royal on the other. In front the far-stretching level gave full sweep to the eye, and at the foot of its forest-clad bluffs, or by the margin of undulating fields, the Rappahannock flowed calmly to the sea. Old mansions dotted this beautiful land, for beautiful it was in spite of the chill influences of winter with its fertile meadows its picturesque woodlands, and its old roads skirted by long lines of shadowy cedars. The headquarters of the Second Army Corps were established at Moss Neck, on the terrace above the Rappahannock, eleven miles below Fredericksburg. After the retreat of the Federals to Falmouth, the Confederate troops had reoccupied their former positions, and every point of passage between Fredericksburg and Port Royal was strongly entrenched and closely watched. At Moss Neck, Jackson was not only within easy reach of his divisions, but was more comfortably housed than had usually been the case. A hunting lodge which stood on the lawn of an old and picturesque mansion house, the property of a gentleman named Corbin, was placed at his disposal. He had declined the offer of rooms in the house itself, lest he should trespass on the convenience of its inmates and to show the peculiar constitution of the Confederate army, an anecdote recorded by his biographers is worth quoting. After his first interview with Mrs. Corbin, he passed out to the gate, where a cavalry orderly, who had accompanied him, was holding his horse. "'Do you approve of your accommodation, General?' asked the courier. "'Yes, sir. I have decided to make my quarters here.' "'I am Mr. Corbin, sir,' said the soldier, "'and I am very pleased.' The lower room of the lodge, hung with trophies of the chase, 
was both his bedroom and his office, while a large tent pitched on the grass outside served as a messroom for his military family. And here, for three long months, until near the end of March, he rested from the labor of his campaigns. The Federal troops, on the snow-clad heights across the river, remained idle in their camps, slowly recovering from the effects of their defeat on the fields of Fredericksburg. The pickets had ceased to bicker, the gunboats had disappeared, and all was quiet on the Rappahannock. Many of the senior officers in the Confederate Army took advantage of the lull in operations to visit their homes, but although his wife urged him to do the same, Jackson steadfastly refused to absent himself even for a few days from the front. In November, to his unbounded delight, a daughter had been born to him. To a man of his extreme domesticity and love for children, says his wife, this was a crowning happiness, and yet, with his great modesty and shrinking from publicity, he requested that he should not receive the announcement by telegraph, and when it came to him by letter, he kept the glad tidings to himself, leaving his staff and those around him in the camp to hear of it from others. This was to him a joy with which a stranger could not intermeddle, and from which even his own hand could not lift the veil of sanctity. His letters were full of longing to see his little Julia, for by this name, which had been his mother's, he had desired her to be christened, saying, My mother was mindful of me when I was a helpless fatherless child, and I wish to commemorate her now. How thankful I am, he wrote, to our kind heavenly father, for having spared my precious wife and given us a little daughter. I cannot tell how gratified I am, nor how much I wish I could be with you to see my two darlings, but while this pleasure is denied me, I am thankful it is accorded to you to have the little pet, and I hope it may be a great deal of comfort and comfort to its mother. Now don't exert yourself to write to me, for to know that you were exerting yourself to write would give me more pain than the letter would pleasure, so you must not do it. But you must love your esposo in the meantime. I expect you are just now made up with that baby. Don't you wish your husband wouldn't claim any part of it, but let you have the sole ownership? Don't you regard it as the most precious little creature in the world? Do not spoil it, and don't let anybody tease it. Don't permit it to have a bad temper. How I would love to see the darling little thing. Give her many kisses from her father. At present, I am fifty miles from Richmond and eight miles from Guinea's station, on the railroad from Richmond to Fredericksburg. Should I remain here, I do hope you and the baby can come to see me before spring, as you can come by the railway. Wherever I go, God gives me kind friends. The people here show me great kindness. I receive invitation after invitation to dine out and spend the night, and a great many provisions are sent me including cakes, tea, loaf sugar, etc., and the socks and gloves and handkerchiefs still come. I am so thankful to our ever-kind Heavenly Father for having so improved my eyes as to enable me to write at night. He continually showers blessings upon me, and that you should have been spared and our darling little daughter given us fills my heart with overflowing gratitude. If I know my unworthy self— my desire is to live entirely and unreservedly to God's glory. Pray, my darling, that I may so live. Again to his sister-in-law, I trust God will answer the prayers offered for peace. Not much comfort is to be expected until this cruel war terminates. I haven't seen my wife since last March, and never having seen my child, you can imagine with what interest I look to North Carolina but the tender promptings of his deep natural affection were stilled by his profound faith that duty is ours, consequences are God's. The Confederate army, at this time, as at all others, suffered terribly from desertion, and one of his own brigades reported 1,200 officers and men absent without leave. Last evening, he wrote to his wife on Christmas Day, I received a letter from Dr. Dabney, saying, 
one of the highest gratifications both Mrs. Dabney and I could enjoy would be another visit from Mrs. Jackson. And he invites me to meet you there. He and Mrs. Dabney are very kind, but it appears to me that it is better for me to remain with my command so long as the war continues. If all our troops, officers, and men were at their posts, we might, through God's blessing, expect a more speedy termination of the war. The temporal affairs of some are so deranged as to make a strong plea for their returning home for a short time, but our God has greatly blessed me and mine during my absence, and whilst it would be a great comfort to see you and our darling little daughter, and others in whom I take a special interest, yet duty appears to require me to remain at my command. It is important that those at headquarters set an example by remaining at the post of duty. So business at headquarters went on in its accustomed course. There were inspections to be made, the deficiencies of equipment to be made good, correspondence to be conducted, and the control of 30,000 men demanded much office work. The enemy to be watched, information to be sifted, topographical data to be collected, and the reports of the battles to be written. Every morning, as was his invariable habit during a campaign, the general had an interview with the chiefs of his commissariat, transport, ordnance, and medical departments, and he spent many hours in consultation with his topographical engineer. The great purpose for which Virginia stood in arms was ever present to his mind, and despite his reticence, his staff knew that he was occupied day and night with the problems that the future might unfold. Existence at headquarters to the young and high-spirited officers who formed the military family was not altogether lively. Outside there was abundance of gaiety. The Confederate army, even on those lonely hills, managed to extract enjoyment from its surroundings. The hospitality of the plantations was open to the officers, and wherever Stuart and his brigadiers pitched their tents, dances and music were the order of the day. Nor were the men behindhand. Even the heavy snow afforded them entertainment. Whenever a thaw took place, they set themselves to making snowballs and great battles in which one division was arrayed against another, and which were carried through with pomp and circumstance of war, colors flying, bugles sounding, and long lines charging elaborately planned entrenchments, were a constant source of amusement, except to unpopular officers. Theatrical and musical performances enlivened the tedium of the long evenings, and when, by the glare of the campfires, the band of the Fifth Virginia broke into the rattling quickstep of Dixie's Land, not the least stirring of national anthems, and the great concourse of gray jackets took up the chorus, closing it with a yell, it shivered to the tingling stars the Confederate soldier would not have changed places with the President himself. There was much social intercourse, too, between the different headquarters. General Lee was no unfrequent visitor to Mosneck, and on Christmas Day Jackson's aides-de-camp provided a sumptuous entertainment at which turkeys and oysters figured for the commander-in-chief and the senior generals. Stuart, too, often invaded the quarters of his old comrade, and Jackson looked forward to the merriment that was certain to result just as much as the youngest of his staff. Stuart's exuberant cheerfulness and humor, says Dabney, seemed to be the happy relief, as they were the opposites, to Jackson's serious and diffident temper. When Stuart poured out his quips and cranks, not seldom at Jackson's expense, the latter sat by, sometimes unprepared with any repartee, sometimes blushing, but always enjoying the jest with a quiet and merry laugh. The ornaments on the wall of the general's quarters gave Stuart many a topic of badinage. Affecting to believe that they were of General Jackson's selection, he pointed now to the portrait of some famous racehorse, and now to the print of some celebrated rat-terrier, as queer revelations of his private tastes, indicating a great decline in his moral character, which would be a grief and disappointment to the pious old ladies of the South. Jackson, with a quiet smile, replied that perhaps he had had more to do with racehorses than his friends suspected. It was in the midst of such a scene as this that dinner was announced, and the two generals passed to the mess-table. 
It so happened that Jackson had just received, as a present from a patriotic lady, some butter, upon the adornment of which the fair donor had exhausted her housewife's skill. The servants, in honour of General Stuart's presence, had chosen this to grace the centre of the board. As his eye fell upon it, he paused, and with mock gravity pointed to it, saying, "'There, gentlemen, if that is not the crowning evidence of our host's sporting tastes, he even has his favourite gamecock stamped on his butter.' The dinner, of course, began with great laughter, in which Jackson joined with as much enjoyment as any. Visitors, too, from Europe, attracted by the fame of the army and its leaders, had made their way into the Confederate lines and were received with all the hospitality that the camps afforded. An English officer has recorded his experiences at Moss Neck. I brought from Nassau a box of goods, a present from England for General Stonewall Jackson, and he asked me when I was at Richmond to come to his camp and see him. He left the city one morning about seven o'clock, and about ten landed at a station distant some eight or nine miles from Jackson's, or, as his men called him, Old Jack's camp. A heavy fall of snow had covered the country for some time before to the depth of a foot, and formed a crust over the Virginian mud, which is quite as villainous as that of Balaclava. The day before had been mild and wet, and my journey was made in a drenching shower which soon cleared away the white mantle of snow. You cannot imagine the slough of despond I had to pass through. Wet to the skin, I stumbled through mud, I waded through creeks, I passed through pine woods, and at last got into camp about two o'clock. I then made my way to a small house occupied by the general as his headquarters. I wrote down my name and gave it to the orderly, and I was immediately told to walk in. The general rose and greeted me warmly. I expected to see an old untidy man, and was most agreeably surprised and pleased with his appearance. He is tall, handsome, and powerfully built, but thin. He has brown hair and a brown beard. His mouth expresses great determination. The lips are thin and compressed firmly together, his eyes are blue and dark, with keen and searching expression. I was told that his age was thirty-eight, and he looks forty. The general, who is indescribably simple and unaffected in all his ways, took off my wet overcoat with his own hands, made up the fire, brought wood for me to put my feet on to keep them warm while my boots were drying, and then began to ask me questions on various subjects. At the dinner hour we went out and joined the members of his staff. At this meal the general said grace, in a fervent, quiet manner, which struck me very much. After dinner I returned to his room, and he again talked for a long time. The servant came in and took his mattress out of a cupboard and laid it on the floor. As I rose to retire, the general said, Captain, there is plenty of room on my bed. I hope you will share it with me. I thanked him very much for his courtesy, but said good night and slept in a tent, sharing the blankets of one of his aides de camp. In the morning at breakfast time, I noticed that the general said grace before the meal with the same fervor I had remarked before. An hour or two afterwards, it was time for me to return to the station. On this occasion, however, I had a horse, and I returned to the general's headquarters to bid him adieu. His little room was vacant, so I slipped in and stood before the fire. I then noticed my greatcoat stretched before it on a chair. Shortly afterwards, the general entered the room. He said, Captain, I have been trying to dry your greatcoat, but I am afraid I have not succeeded very well. That little act illustrates the man's character. With the care and responsibilities of a vast army on his shoulders, he finds time to do little acts of kindness and thoughtfulness. End of section 58. Read by Will Caffey. Oregon. January 2023. Section 59 of Stonewall Jackson in the American Civil War. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. 
Stonewall Jackson in the American Civil War by George Francis Robert Henderson. Winter Quarters, Part 2. With each of his staff officers, he was on most friendly terms, and the visitors to his camp, such as the English officer quoted above, found him a most delightful host, discussing, with the ease of an educated gentleman, all manner of topics, and displaying not the slightest trace of that awkwardness and extreme diffidence which have been attributed to him. The range and accuracy of his information surprised them. Of military history, said another English soldier, he knew more than any other man I met in America, and he was so far from displaying the somewhat grim characteristics that have been associated with his name that one would have thought his tastes lay in the direction of art and literature. His chief delight, wrote the Honorable Francis Lawley, who knew him well, was in the cathedrals of England, notably in York Minster and Westminster Abbey. He was never tired of talking about them or listening to details about the chapels and cloisters of Oxford. General Jackson, writes Lord Wolseley, had certainly very little to say about military operations, although he was intensely proud of his soldiers and enthusiastic in his devotion to General Lee, and it was impossible to make him talk of his own achievements, nor can I say that his speech betrayed his intellectual powers, but his manner, which was modesty itself, was most attractive. He put you at your ease at once, listening with marked courtesy and attention to whatever you might say, and when the subject of conversation was congenial, he was a most interesting companion. I quite endorsed the statement as to his love for beautiful things. He told me that in all his travels he had seen nothing so beautiful as the lancet windows in York Minster. In his daily intercourse with his staff, however, in his office or in the mess room, he showed to less advantage than in the society of strangers. His gravity of demeanor seldom wholly disappeared. His intense earnestness was itself oppressive, and he was often absent and preoccupied. Life at headquarters, says one of his staff officers, was decidedly dull. Our meals were often very dreary. The general had no time for light or trivial conversation, and he sometimes felt it his duty to rebuke our thoughtless and perhaps foolish remarks. Nor was it always quite safe to approach him. Sometimes he had a tired look in his eyes, and although he never breathed a word to one or another, we knew that he was dissatisfied with what was being done with the army. Intense concentration of thought and purpose, in itself an indication of a powerful will, had distinguished Jackson from his very boyhood. During his campaigns, he would pace for hours outside his tent, his hands clasped behind his back, absorbed in meditation, and when the army was on the march, he would ride for hours without raising his eyes or opening his lips. It was unquestionably at such moments that he was working out his plans, step by step, forecasting the counter-movements of the enemy and providing for every emergency that might occur. And here the habit of keeping his whole faculties fixed on a single object and of imprinting on his memory the successive processes of complicated problems fostered by the methods of study which, both at West Point and Lexington, the weakness of his eyes had made compulsory, must have been an inestimable advantage. Brilliant strategical maneuvers, it cannot be too often repeated, are not a matter of inspiration and of decision on the spur of the moment. The problems presented by a theater of war with their many factors, are not to be solved except by a vigorous and sustained intellectual effort. If, said Napoleon, I always appear prepared, it is because, before entering on an undertaking, I have meditated for long and have foreseen what may occur. It is not genius which reveals to me suddenly and secretly what I should do in circumstances unexpected by others. It is thought and meditation. The proper objective, speaking in general terms, of all military operations is the main army of the enemy, for a campaign can never be brought to a successful conclusion 
until the hostile forces in the field have become demoralized by defeat. But, to ensure success, preponderance of numbers is usually essential, and it may be said, therefore, that the proper objective is the enemy's main army when it is in inferior strength. Under ordinary conditions, the first step, then, towards victory must be a movement, or a series of movements, which will compel the enemy to divide his forces, and put it out of his power to assemble even equal strength on the battlefield. This entails a consideration of the strategic points upon the theater of war, for it is by occupying or threatening some point which the enemy cannot afford to lose that he will be induced to disperse his army, or to place himself in a position where he can be attacked at a disadvantage. While his main army, therefore, is the ultimate objective, certain strategic points become the initial objectives, to be occupied or threatened either by the main body or detached forces. It is seldom, however, that these initial objectives are readily discovered, and it is very often the case that even the ultimate objective may be obscured. These principles are well illustrated by the operations in the Valley of Virginia during the month of May and the first fortnight of June, 1862. After the event, it is easy to see that Banks's army was Jackson's proper objective, being the principal force in the secondary theater of war, but at the time, before the event, Lee and Jackson alone realized the importance of overwhelming Banks and thus threatening Washington. It was not realized by Johnston, a most able soldier, for the whole of his correspondence goes to show that he thought a purely defensive attitude the best policy for the Valley Army. It was not realized by Jackson's subordinates, for it was not till long after the Battle of Winchester that the real purport of the operations in which they had been engaged began to dawn on them. It was not realized by Lincoln, by Stanton, or even by McClellan, for to each of them this sudden attack on Front Royal was as much of a surprise as to Banks himself, and we may be perfectly confident that none but a trained strategist, after a prolonged study of the map and the situation, would realize it now. It is to be noted, too, that Jackson's initial objectives, the strategical points in the valley, were invariably well selected. The Ray Gap, the single road which gives access across the Massanuttons from one side of the valley to the other, was the most important. The flank position on Elk Run, the occupation of which so suddenly brought up Banks, prevented him interposing between Jackson and Edward Johnson and saved Staunton from capture, was a second. Front Royal, by seizing which he threatened Banks at Strasbourg, in flank and rear, compelling him to a hasty retreat, and bringing him to battle, on ground which he had not prepared, a third. And the position at Port Republic, controlling the only bridge across the Shenandoah, and separating Shields from Fremont, a fourth. The bearing of all these localities was overlooked by the Federals, and throughout the campaign we cannot fail to notice a great confusion on their part as regards objectives. They neither recognized what the aim of their enemy would be, nor at what they should aim themselves. It was long before they discovered that Lee's army, and not Richmond, was the vital point of the Confederacy. Not a single attempt was made to seize strategic points, and if we may judge from the orders and dispatches in the official records, their existence was never recognized. To this oversight, the successive defeats of the northern forces were in great part due. From McClellan to Banks, each one of their generals appears to have been blind to the advantages that may be derived from a study of the theater of war not one of them hit upon a line of operations which embarrassed the Confederates, and all possessed the unhappy knack of joining battle on the most unfavorable terms. Moreover, when it at last became clear that the surest means of conquering a country is to defeat its armies, the true objective was but vaguely realized. 
the annihilation of the enemy's troops seems to have been the last thing dreamt of. Opportunities of crushing him in detail were neither sought for nor created. As General Sheridan said afterwards, the trouble with the commanders of the Army of the Potomac was that they never marched out to lick anybody. All they thought of was to escape being licked themselves. But it is not sufficient in planning strategical combinations to arrive at a correct conclusion as regards the objective. Success demands a more careful calculation of ways and means, of the numbers at disposal, of food, forage, and ammunition, and of the forces to be detached for secondary purposes. The different factors of the problem, the strength and dispositions of the enemy, the roads, railways, fortresses, weather, natural features, the morale of the opposing armies, the character of the opposing general, the facilities for supply, have each and all of them to be considered, their relative prominence assigned to them, and their conflicting claims to be brought into adjustment. For such mental exertion, Jackson was well equipped. He had made his own the experience of others. His knowledge of history made him familiar with the principles which had guided Washington and Napoleon in the selection of objectives, and with the means by which they attained them. It's not always easy to determine the benefit, beyond a theoretical acquaintance with the phenomena of the battlefield, to be derived from studying the campaigns of the great masters of war. It is true that no successful general, whatever may have been his practical knowledge, has neglected such study. But while many have borne witness to its efficacy, none have left a record of the manner in which their knowledge of former campaigns influenced their own conduct. In the case of Stonewall Jackson, however, we have much evidence, indirect but unimpeachable, as to the value to a commander of the knowledge thus acquired. The maxims of Napoleon, carried in his haversack, were constantly consulted throughout his campaigns, and this little volume contains a fairly complete exposition, in Napoleon's own words, of the grand principles of war. Moreover, Jackson often quoted principles which are not to be found in the maxims, but on which Napoleon consistently acted. It is clear, therefore, that he had studied the campaigns of the great Corsican in order to discover the principles on which military success is based. That having studied and reflected on those principles, and the effect their application produced in numerous concrete cases, they became so firmly embedded in his mind as to be ever-present, guiding him into the right path or warning him against the wrong, whenever he had to deal with a strategic or tactical situation. It may be noted, moreover, that these principles, especially those which he was accustomed to quote, were concerned far more with the moral aspect of war than with the material. It is a fair inference, therefore, that it was to the study of human nature as affected by the conditions of war, by discipline, by fear, by the want of food, by want of information, by want of confidence, by the weight of responsibility, by political interests, and, above all, by surprise, that his attention was principally directed. He found in the campaigns of Jena and of Austerlitz not merely a record of marches and maneuvers, of the use of entrenchments, or of the general rules for attack and defense. This is the mechanical and elementary part of the science of command. What Jackson learned was the truth of the famous maxim that the moral is to the physical, that is, to armament and numbers, as three to one. He learned, too, to put himself into his adversary's place and to realize his weakness. He learned in a word that war is a struggle between two intellects rather than the conflict of masses, and it was by reason of this knowledge that he played on the hearts of his enemies with such extraordinary skill. It is not to be asserted, however, that the study of military history is an infallible means of becoming a great or even a good general. 
The first qualification necessary for a leader of men is a strong character, the second a strong intellect. With both, Providence had endowed Jackson, and the strong intellect illuminates and explains the page that to others is obscure and meaningless. With its innate faculty for discerning what is essential and for discarding unimportant details, it discovers most valuable lessons where ordinary men see neither light nor leading. Endowed with the power of analysis and assimilation, and accustomed to observe and to reflect upon the relations between cause and effect, it will undoubtedly penetrate far deeper into the actual significance and practical bearing of historical facts than the mental vision which is less acute. Jackson, by reason of his antecedent training, was eminently capable of the sustained intellectual efforts which strategical conceptions involve. Such was his self-command that under the most adverse conditions, the fatigues and anxieties of a campaign, the fierce excitement of battle, his brain, to use the words of a great Confederate general, worked with the precision of the most perfect machinery. But it was not only in the field, when the necessity for action was pressing, that he was accustomed to seclude himself with his own thoughts. Nor was he content with considering his immediate responsibilities. His interest in the general conduct of the war was of a very thoroughgoing character. While in camp on the Rappahannock, he followed with the closest attention the movements of the armies operating in the valley of the Mississippi, and made himself acquainted, so far as was possible, not only with the local conditions of the war, but also with the character of the Federal leaders. It was said that, in the late spring of 1862, it was the intention of Mr. Davis to transfer him to the command of the Army of the Tennessee, and it is possible that some inkling of this determination induced him to study the Western theater. Be this as it may, the general situation, military and political, was always in his mind, and despite the victory of Fredericksburg, the future was dark and the indications ominous. According to the official records, the North, at the beginning of April, had more than 900,000 soldiers under arms. The South, so far as can be ascertained, not more than 600,000. The Army of the Potomac was receiving constant reinforcements, and at the beginning of April, 130,000 men were encamped on the Stafford Heights. In the West, the whole extent of the Mississippi, with the exception of the hundred miles between Vicksburg and Port Hudson, was held by the Federals, and those important fortresses were both threatened by large armies acting in concert with a formidable fleet of gunboats. A third army, over 50,000 strong, was posted at Murfreesboro, in the heart of Tennessee, and large detached forces were operating in Louisiana and Arkansas. The inroads of the enemy in the West, greatly aided by the waterways, were in fact far more serious than in the East, but even in Virginia, although the Army of the Potomac had spent nearly two years in advancing fifty miles, the Federals had a strong foothold. Winchester had been reoccupied, Fortress Monroe was still garrisoned, Suffolk, on the south bank of the James, seventy miles from Richmond, was held by a force of 20,000 men, while another small army of about the same strength occupied New Bern on the North Carolina coast. Slowly but surely, before the pressure of vastly superior numbers, the frontiers of the Confederacy were contracting. And although in no single direction had a Federal army moved more than a few miles from the river which supplied it, Yet the hostile occupation of these rivers, so essential to internal traffic, was making the question of subsistence more difficult every day. Louisiana, Texas, and Arkansas, the cattle-raising states, were practically cut off from the remainder, and in a country where railways were few, distances long, and roads indifferent, it was impossible, in default of communication by water, to accumulate and distribute the produce of the farms. 
Moreover, the dark menace of the blockade had assumed more formidable proportions. The Federal Navy, gradually increasing in numbers and activity, held the highway of the ocean in an iron grip, and proudly, though the Confederacy bore her isolation, men looked across the waters with dread foreboding, for the shadow of their doom was already rising from the pitiless sea. If, then, his staff officers had some reason to complain of their chief's silence and abstraction, it was by no means unfortunate for the South. So imminent was the danger that the strong brain was incessantly occupied in forecasting the emergencies that might occur. But not for a single moment did Jackson despair of ultimate success. His faith in the justice of the Southern cause was as profound as his trust in God's good providence. He had long since realized that the overwhelming strength of the Federals was more apparent than real. He recognized their difficulties. He knew that the size of an army is limited to the number that can be subsisted, and he relied much on the superior morale and the superior leading of the Confederate troops. After long and mature deliberation, he had come to a conclusion as to the policy to be pursued. We must make this campaign, he said, in a moment of unusual expansion, an exceedingly active one. Only thus can a weaker country cope with a stronger. It must make up in activity what it lacks in strength. A defensive campaign can only be made successful by taking the aggressive at the proper time. Napoleon never waited for his adversary to become fully prepared, but struck him the first blow. On these principles, Jackson had good reason to believe General Lee had determined to act. Of their efficacy, he was convinced, and when his wife came to visit him at the end of April, she found him in good heart and the highest spirits. He not only anticipated a decisive result from the forthcoming operations, but he had seen with peculiar satisfaction that a more manly tone was pervading the Confederate army. Taught by their leaders, by Lee, Jackson, Stuart, and many others, of whose worth and valor they had received convincing proof, the Southern soldiers had begun to practice the clean and wholesome virtue of self-control. They had discovered that purity and temperance are by no means incompatible with military prowess, and that a practical piety, faithful in small things as in great, detracts in no degree from skill and resolution in the field. The Stonewall Brigade set the example. As soon as their own huts were finished, the men, of their own volition, built a log church, where both officers and men, without distinction of rank, were accustomed to assemble during the winter evenings, and those rude walls, illuminated by pine torches cut from the neighboring forest, witnessed such scenes as filled Jackson's cup of content to overflowing. A chaplain writes, The devout listener, dressed in simple gray, ornamented only with three stars, which any Confederate colonel was entitled to wear, is our great commander, Robert Edward Lee. That dashing-looking cavalryman, with fighting jacket, plumed hat, jingling spurs, and gay decorations, but solemn, devout aspect during the service, is Jeb Stuart, the flower of cavaliers, and all through the vast crowd wreaths and stars of rank mingle with the bars of the subordinate officers and the rough garb of the private soldier. But perhaps the most supremely happy of the gathered thousands is Stonewall Jackson. One could not, says another, sit in that pulpit and meet the concentrated gaze of those men without deep emotion. I remembered that they were the veterans of many a bloody field. The eyes which looked into mine, waiting for the gospel of peace, had looked steadfastly upon whatever is terrible in war. Their earnestness of aspect constantly impressed me. They looked as if they had come on business, and very important business, and the preacher could scarcely do otherwise than feel that he too had business of moment there. 
At this time, largely owing to Jackson's exertions, chaplains were appointed to regiments and brigades, and ministers from all parts of the country were invited to visit the camps. The Chaplains' Association, which did a good work in the army, was established at his suggestion, and although he steadfastly declined to attend its meetings, deeming them outside his functions, nothing was neglected, so far as lay within his power, that might forward the moral welfare of the troops. But at the same time their military efficiency and material comforts received his constant attention. Discipline was made stricter, indolent and careless officers were summarily dismissed, and the divisions were drilled at every favorable opportunity. Headquarters had been transferred to a tent near to Hamilton's crossing, the general remarking, It is rather a relief to get where there will be less comfort than in a room, as I hope thereby persons will be prevented from encroaching so much upon my time. On his wife's arrival, he moved to Mr. Yerby's plantation near Hamilton's Crossing, but he did not permit, she writes, the presence of his family to interfere in any way with his military duties. The greater part of each day he spent at his headquarters, but returned as early as he could get off from his labors, and devoted all his leisure time to his visitors, little Julia having his chief attention and his care. His devotion to his child was remarked upon by all who beheld the happy pair together, for she soon learned to delight in his caresses as much as he loved to play with her. An officer's wife, who saw him often during this time, wrote to a friend in Richmond that the general spent all his leisure time in playing with the baby. April 29. But these quiet and happy days were soon ended. On April 29, the roar of cannon was heard once more at Gurney's station, salvo after salvo following in quick succession, until the house shook and the windows rattled with the reverberations. The crash of musketry succeeded, rapid and continuous, and before the sun was high, wounded men were brought in to the shelter of Mr. Yerby's outhouses. Very early in the morning, a message from the pickets had come in, and after making arrangements for his wife and child to leave at once for Richmond, the general, without waiting for breakfast, had hastened to the front. The Federals were crossing the Rappahannock, and Stonewall Jackson had gone to his last field. End of section 59. Read by Will Caffey, Oregon, January 2023. Section 60 of Stonewall Jackson and the American Civil War. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Stonewall Jackson and the American Civil War by George Francis Robert Henderson. Chapter 23. Chancellorsville. It has already been said that while the Army of Northern Virginia lay in winter quarters, the omens did not point to decisive success in the forthcoming campaign. During the same period that Lincoln and Stanton, taught by successive disasters, had ceased to interfere with their generals Jefferson Davis and Mr. Seddon, his new Secretary of War had taken into their own hands the complete control of military operations. The results appeared in the usual form. On the northern side, unity of purpose and concentration. On the southern, uncertainty of aim and dispersion. In the west, the Confederate generals were fatally hampered by the orders of the president. In the east, the Army of Northern Virginia, confronted by a mass of more than 130,000 foes, was deprived of three of Longstreet's divisions. And when, at the end of April... It was reported that Hooker was advancing. It was absolutely impossible that this important detachment could rejoin in time to assist in the defense of the Rappahannock. A full discussion of the Chancellorsville campaign does not fall within the scope of this biography. But in justice to the Southern generals, to Lee who resolved to stand his ground 
and to Jackson, who approved the resolution, it must be explained that they were in no way responsible for the absence of 20,000 veterans. Undoubtedly, the situation on the Atlantic littoral was sufficiently embarrassing to the Confederate authorities. The presence of a Federal force at New Bern, in North Carolina, threatened the main line of railway by which Wilmington and Charleston communicated with Richmond, and these two ports were of the utmost importance to the Confederacy. So enormous were the profits arising from the exchange of munitions of war and medicines for cotton and tobacco that English ship owners embarked eagerly on a lucrative if precarious traffic. Blockade running became a recognized business. Companies were organized which possessed large fleets of swift steamers. The Bahamas and Bermuda became vast enterpots of trade. English seamen were not to be deterred from a perilous enterprise by fear of northern broadsides or northern prisons, and despite the number and activity of the blockading squadrons, the cordon of cruisers and gunboats was constantly broken. Many vessels were sunk, many captured, many wrecked on a treacherous coast, and yet enormous quantities of supplies found their way to the arsenals and magazines of Richmond and Atlanta. The railways, then leading from Wilmington and Charleston, the ports most accessible to the blockade runners, were almost essential to the existence of the Confederacy. Soon after the Battle of Fredericksburg, General D. H. Hill was placed in command of the forces which protected them, and at the beginning of the new year, Ransom's division was drawn from the Rappahannock to reinforce the local levies. A few weeks later, General Lee was induced by Mr. Seddon to send Longstreet with the division of Hood and Pickett to cover Richmond, which was menaced both from Fortress Monroe and Suffolk. The commander-in-chief, however, while submitting to this detachment as a necessary evil, had warned General Longstreet so to dispose his troops that they could return to the Rappahannock at the first alarm. The enemy's position, he wrote, on the seacoast had been probably occupied merely for purposes of defense. It was likely that they were strongly entrenched, and nothing would be gained by attacking them. The warning, however, was disregarded, and that Mr. Seddon should have yielded, in the first instance, to the influence of the sea power, exciting apprehensions of sudden attack along the whole seaboard of the Confederacy, may be forgiven him. Important lines of communication were certainly exposed, but when, in defiance of Lee's advice that the division should be retained within easy reach of Fredericksburg, he suggested to Longstreet the feasibility of an attack on Suffolk, 120 miles distant from the Rappahannock, he committed an unpardonable blunder. Had Jackson been in Longstreet's place, the secretary's proposal, however promising of personal renown, would unquestionably have been rejected. The leader who had kept the main object so steadfastly in view throughout the Valley Campaign would never have overlooked the expressed wishes of the commander-in-chief. Longstreet, however, brilliant fighting soldier as he was, appears to have misconceived the duties of a detached force. He was already prejudiced in favor of a movement against Suffolk. Before he left for his new command, he had suggested to Lee that one army corps only should remain on the Rappahannock, while the other operated south of Richmond, and soon after his arrival he urged upon his superior that, in case Hooker moved, the Army of Northern Virginia should retire to the North Anna. In short, to his mind the operations of the main body should be made subservient to those of the detached force. Lee, with 30,000 men, holding Hooker's 130,000 in check until Longstreet had won his victory and could march north to join him. Such strategy was not likely to find favor at headquarters. It was abundantly evident, in the first place, that the Army of Northern Virginia must be the principal objective of the Federals, and, in the second place, that the defeat of the force of Suffolk, if it were practicable, would have no effect whatever upon Hooker's action, except insomuch that his knowledge of Longstreet's absence might quicken his resolution to advance. Had Suffolk been a point vital to the North, the question would have assumed a different shape. As it was, the town merely covered a tract of conquered territory, the Norfolk Dockyard 
in the mouth of the James River. The Confederates would gain little by its capture. The Federals would hardly feel its loss. It was most improbable that a single man of Hooker's army would be detached to defend a point of such comparative insignificance, and it was quite possible that Longstreet would be unable to get back in time to meet him, even on the North Anna. General Lee, however, anxious as ever to defer to the opinions of the man on the spot, as well as to meet the wishes of the government, yielded to Longstreet's insistence that a fine opportunity for an effective blow presented itself. And in the first week of April, the latter marched against Suffolk. April 17th. His movement was swift and sudden, but, as Lee had anticipated, the Federal position was strongly fortified, with the flank secure and Longstreet had no mind to bring matters to a speedy conclusion. He could reduce the place, he wrote on April 17th, in two or three days, but the expenditure of ammunition would be very large, or he could take it by assault, but at a cost of 3,000 men. The Secretary of War agreed with him that the sacrifice would be too great, and so, at a time when Hooker was becoming active on the Rappahannock, Lee's lieutenant was quietly investing Suffolk 120 miles away. From that moment, the commander-in-chief abandoned all hope that his missing divisions would be with him when Hooker moved. Bitterly, indeed, was he to suffer for his selection of a commander for his detached force. The loss of 3,000 men at Suffolk had the works been stormed, and Hood and Pickett marched instantly to the Rappahannock would have been more than repaid. The addition of 12,000 fine soldiers, flushed with success, and led by two of the most brilliant fighting generals in the Confederate armies, would have made the victory of Chancellorsville a decisive triumph. Better still had Longstreet adhered to his original orders. But both he and Mr. Seddon forgot, as Jackson never did, the value of time and the grand principle of concentration at the decisive point. Happily for the South, Hooker, although less flagrantly, was also oblivious of the first axiom of war. As soon as the weather improved, he determined to move against Richmond. His task, however, was no simple one. On the opposite bank of the Rappahannock, from Banks Ford to Port Royal, a distance of 20 miles, from line upon line of fortifications, protected by a abatis, manned by a numerous artillery, against which it was difficult to find position for the Federal guns, and occupied by the victors of Fredericksburg, a frontal attack gave even less promise of success than in Burnside's disastrous battle. But behind Lee's earthworks were his lines of supply, the Richmond Railway running due south, with the road to Bowling Green alongside, and second, the Plank Road, which running at first due west, led past Chancellorsville, a large brick mansion, standing in a dense forest, to Orange Court House and the depots on the Virginia Central Railroad. At these roads and railways, Hooker determined to strike, expecting that Lee would at once fall back and give the Army of the Potomac the opportunity of delivering a heavy blow. To effect his object, he divided his 130,000 men into three distinct bodies, the cavalry, which, with the exception of one small brigade, had moved under General Stoneman to Warrenton Junction, was to march by way of Rappahannock Station and either capturing or passing Culpeper and Gordonsville to cut the Confederate communications and, should Lee retreat, to hold him fast. General Sedgwick, with two army corps, the 1st and 6th, forming the left wing of the army, was to cross the river below Fredericksburg, make a brisk demonstration of attack, and if the enemy fell back, follow him rapidly down the Bowling Green and Telegraph Roads. Then, while Lee's attention was thus attracted, the right wing, composed of the 5th, 11th, and 12th Corps, with Pleasanton's Brigade of Cavalry, under Hooker's own command, would move up the Rappahannock to Kelly's Ford, push forward to the Rapidan, across Ely's and Germana Fords, and march upon Chancellorsville. The Third Corps was to remain concentrated on the Stafford Heights, ready to reinforce either wing as circumstances might require. The Second Corps was to leave one division on outpost at Falmouth 
and to post two divisions on the north bank of the Rappahannock, opposite Banks Ford. It will be observed that this design would place a wide interval between the two wings of the Federal Army, thus giving the Confederates, although much inferior in numbers, the advantage of the interior lines. Hooker, however, who knew the Confederate strength to a man, was confident that Lee, directly, he had found his position turned, and Stoneman in his rear would at once retreat on Richmond. Yet he was not blind to the possibility that his great adversary, always daring, might assume the offensive and attempt to crush the Federal wings in detail. Still, the danger appeared small. Either wing was practically equal to the whole Confederate force. Sedgwick had 40,000, with the Third Corps, 19,000, and a division of the Second, 5,500, close at hand. Hooker, 42,000, with two divisions of the Second Corps, 11,000, at Banks Ford. The Third Corps could reinforce him in less than four and twenty hours, and Stoneman's 10,000 sabers, riding at will amongst Lee's supply depots, would surely prevent him from attacking. Still, precaution was taken in case the attempt were made. Sedgwick, if the enemy detached any considerable part of his force towards Chancellorsville, was to carry the works at all hazards and establish his force on the Telegraph Road. The right wing, if not strongly resisted, was to advance at all hazards and secure a position uncovering Banks Ford where the Confederates found in force near Chancellorsville, it was to select a strong position and await attack on its own ground, while Sedgwick, coming up from Fredericksburg, would assail the enemy in flank and rear. Such was the plan which, if resolutely carried out, bade fair to crush Lee's army between the upper and the nether millstones, and it seems that the size and condition of his forces led Hooker to anticipate an easy victory. If the Army of the Potomac was not the finest on the planet, as in an order of the day he boastfully proclaimed it, it possessed many elements of strength. Hooker was a strict disciplinarian with a talent for organization. He had not only done much to improve the efficiency of his troops, but his vigorous measures had gone far to restore their confidence. When he succeeded Burnside, a large proportion of the soldiers had lost heart and hope. The generals who had hitherto commanded them, when compared with Lee and Jackson, were mere pygmies, and the consciousness that this was the case had affected the entire army. The official records contained much justification of Jackson's anxiety that Burnside should be fought on the North Anna, where, if defeated, he might have been pursued. Although there had been no pursuit after the Battle of Fredericksburg, no harassing marches, no continued retreat, with lack of supplies, abandoning of wounded, and constant alarms, the Federal regiments had suffered terribly in morale. The winter rains set in, said Hooker, and all operations were, for a while, suspended, the army literally finding itself buried in mud, from which there was no hope of extrication before spring. With this prospect before it, taken in connection with the gloom and despondency which followed the disaster of Fredericksburg, the army was in a forlorn, deplorable condition. Reference to the letters from the army at this time, public and private, affords abundant evidence of its demoralization, and these, in their turn, had their effect upon the friends and relatives of the soldiers at home. At the time the army was turned over to me, desertions were at the rate of about 200 a day, so anxious were parents, wives, brothers, and sisters to relieve their kindred that they filled the express trains with packages of citizens' clothing to assist them in escaping from service. At that time, perhaps, a majority of the officers, especially those high in rank, were hostile to the policy of the government in the conduct of the war. The Emancipation Proclamation had been published a short time before, and a large element of the army had taken sides antagonistic to it, declaring that they would never have embarked in the war had they anticipated the action of the government. When rest came to the army, the disaffected, from whatever cause, began to show themselves and make their influence felt in and out of the camps. 
I may also state that at the moment I was placed in command, I caused a return to be made of the absentees of the army and found the number to be 2,922 commissioned officers and 81,964 non-commissioned officers and privates. They were scattered all over the country, and the majority were absent from causes unknown. In the face of this remarkable report, it is curious to read, in the pages of a brilliant military historian, that armies composed of the citizens of a free country, who have taken up arms from patriotic motives, have constantly exhibited an astonishing endurance, and possessing a bond of cohesion superior to discipline, have shown their power to withstand shocks that would dislocate the structure of other military organizations. A force which had lost 25% of its strength by desertion, although it had never been pursued after defeat, would not generally be suspected of peculiar solidity. Nevertheless, the northern soldiers must receive their due. Want of discipline made fearful ravages in the ranks. But notwithstanding the defection of so many of their comrades, those that remained faithful displayed the best characteristics of their race. The heart of the army was still sound, and only the influence of a strong and energetic commander was required to restore its vitality. The influence was supplied by Hooker. The cumbrous organization of grand divisions was abolished. Disloyal and unsuccessful generals were removed. Salutary changes were introduced into the various departments of the staff. The cavalry, hitherto formed in independent brigades, was consolidated into a corps of three divisions and a brigade of regulars, and under a system of careful and uniform inspection made rapid improvement. Strong measures were taken to reduce the number of deserters. The ranks were filled by the return of absentees. New regiments were added to the Army Corps. The troops were constantly practiced in field exercises, and generals of well-deserved reputation were selected for the different commands. All were actuated, wrote Hooker, by feelings of confidence and devotion to the cause, and I felt that it was a living army, and one well worthy of the Republic. On April 27th, after several demonstrations, undertaken with a view of confusing the enemy, had been made at various points, the grand movement began. The Confederate Army still held the lines it had occupied for the past four months. Jackson's Army Corps extended from Hamilton's Crossing to Port Royal. McLaws and Anderson's divisions occupied Lee's Hill and the ridge northward, and a brigade watched Banks Ford. Stuart was with his main body, some 2,400 strong, at Culpeper observing the great mass of Federal horsemen at Warrenton Junction, and the line of the Rappahannock was held by the cavalry pickets. The strength of the Army of Northern Virginia, so far as can be ascertained, did not exceed 62,000 officers and men. Second Corps, A.P. Hill's Division, 11,500, Bode's Division, 9,500, Colston's, Jackson's own, division, 6,600. Early's division, 7,500. Artillery, 2,100. First Corps, Anderson's division, 8,100. McLaws division, 8,600. Artillery, 1,000. Cavalry, Fitzhugh Lee's brigade, 1,500. W. H. F. Lee's Brigade, 2 regiments, 900. Reserve Artillery, 700. Add for reinforcements received since March 1st. Date of last return, 4,000. Total, 62,170 guns. Thus the road to Richmond, threatened by a host of 130,000 men and 428 guns, was to be defended by a force of less than half the size. Ninety-nine generals out of a hundred would have considered the situation hopeless. The Confederate lines at Fredericksburg were certainly very strong, but it was clearly impossible to prevent the Federals outflanking them. The disparity in strength was far greater than at Sharpsburg, and it seemed that by sheer weight of numbers 
the southern army must inevitably be driven back. Nor did it appear so overwhelming were the federal numbers. That counterattack was feasible. The usual resource of the defender, if his adversary marches round his flank, is to strike boldly at his communications. Here, however, Hooker's communications with Akia Creek were securely covered by the Rappahannock, and so great was his preponderance of strength that he could easily detach a sufficient force to check the Confederates should they move against them. Yet now, as on the Antietam, Lee and Jackson declined to take numbers into consideration. They knew that Hooker was a brave and experienced soldier, but they had no reason to anticipate that he would handle his vast masses with more skill than McClellan. That the northern soldiers had suffered in morale, they were well aware. And while they divined that the position they themselves had fortified might readily be made attainable, the fact that such was the case gave them small concern. They were agreed that the best measures of defense, if an opening offered, lay in a resolute offensive, and with Hooker in command, it was not likely that the opportunity would be long delayed. No thought of a strategic retreat from one position to another was entertained. Maneuver was to be met by maneuver, blow by counter blow. If Hooker had not moved, Lee would have forestalled him. On April 16th, he had written to Mr. Davis, My only anxiety arises from the condition of our horses and the scarcity of forage and provisions. I think it is all important that we should assume the aggressive by the 1st of May. If we could be placed in a condition to make a vigorous advance at that time, I think the valley could be swept at Milroy, commanding the federal forces at Winchester, and the army opposite Hooker's be thrown north of the Potomac. Jackson, too, even after Hooker's plan was developed, indignantly repudiated the suggestion that the forthcoming campaign must be purely defensive. When some officer on his staff expressed his fear that the army would be compelled to retreat, he asked sharply, Who said that? No, sir, we shall not fall back. We shall attack them. At the end of the month, however, Longstreet with his three divisions was still absent. Sufficient supplies for a forward movement had not yet been accumulated. Two brigades of cavalry, Hamptons and Jenkins, which had been sent respectively to South Carolina and the Valley, had not rejoined, and Hooker had already seized the initiative. The first news which came to hand was that a strong force of all arms was moving up the Rappahannock in the direction of Kelly's Ford. April 28th. This was forwarded by Stuart on the evening of April 28th. The next morning, the federal movements, which might have been no more than a demonstration, became pronounced. April 29th. Under cover of a thick fog, pontoon bridges were laid at Deep Run, below Fredericksburg. Sedgwick's troops began to cross and were soon engaged with Jackson's outposts, while, at the same time, the report came in that a force of unknown strength had made the passage at Kelly's Ford. Lee displayed no perturbation. Jackson, on receiving information of Sedgwick's movements from his outposts, had sent an aide-de-camp to acquaint the commander-in-chief. The latter was still in his tent, and in reply to the message said, Well, I heard firing, and I was beginning to think that it was time some of your lazy young fellows were coming to tell me what it was about. Tell your good general he knows what to do with the enemy just as well as I do. The divisions of the Second Army Corps were at once called up to their old battleground, and while they were on the march, Jackson occupied himself with watching Sedgwick's movements. The Federals were busily entrenching on the riverbank, and on the heights behind frowned the long line of artillery that had proved at Fredericksburg so formidable an obstacle to the Confederate attack. The enemy's position was very strong, and the time for counterstroke had not yet come. During the day, the cavalry was actively engaged between the Rappahannock and the Rapidan, testing the strength of the enemy's columns. The country was wooded, the Federals active, and as usual in war, accurate information was difficult to obtain and more difficult to communicate. It was not till 6.30 p.m. that Lee received notice that troops had crossed at Ely's and Germana Fords 
At 2 p.m., Anderson's division was at once dispatched to Chancellorsville. April 30th. The next message, which does not appear to have been received until the morning of the 30th, threw more light on the situation. Stewart had made prisoners from the 5th, the 11th, and the 12th Corps, and had ascertained that the Corps commanders, Meade, Howard, and Slocum, were present with the troops. Anderson, moreover, who had been instructed to select and entrench a strong position, was falling back from Chancellorsville before the enemy's advance, and two things became clear. One, that it was Hooker's intention to turn the Confederate left. Two, that he had divided his forces. The question now to be decided was which wing should be attacked first. There was much to be said in favor of crushing Sedgwick. His numbers were estimated at 35,000 men, and the Confederates had over 60,000. Moreover, time is the most important consideration in the use of interior lines. The army was already concentrated in front of Sedgwick, whereas it would require a day's march to seek Hooker in the forest round Chancellorsville. Sedgwick's, too, was the smaller of the Federal wings, and his overthrow would certainly ruin Hooker's combinations. Jackson, at first, said Lee, preferred to attack Sedgwick's force in the plain of Fredericksburg, but I told him I feared it was as impracticable as it was at the first battle of Fredericksburg. It was hard to get at the enemy, and harder to get away if we drove him into the river, but if he thought it could be done, I would give orders for it. Jackson asked to be allowed to examine the ground, but soon came to the conclusion that the project was too hazardous and that Lee was right. Orders were then issued for a concentration against Hooker. 10,000 men under General Early remaining to confront Sedgwick on the heights of Fredericksburg. We may now turn to the movements of the Federals. Hooker's right wing had marched at a speed which had been hitherto unknown in the Army of the Potomac. At nightfall, on April 30th, the three Army Corps, although they had been delayed by the Confederate cavalry, were assembled at Chancellorsville. In three days, they had marched 46 miles over bad roads, had forded breast-high two difficult rivers, established several bridges, and captured over a 100 prisoners. Heavy reinforcements were in rear. The two divisions of the Second Corps had marched from Banks Ford to United States Ford, six miles from Chancellorsville, while the Third Corps, ordered up from the Stafford Heights, was rapidly approaching the same point of passage. Thus, 70,000 men, in the highest spirits at the success of their maneuvers, were massed in rear of Lee's lines, and Hooker saw victory within his grasp. It is with heartfelt satisfaction, ran his general order, that the commanding general announces to his army that the operations of the last three days have determined that our enemy must either ingloriously fly or come out from behind his defenses and give us battle on our own ground, where certain destruction awaits him. The operations of the 5th, 11th, and 12th Corps have been a succession of splendid achievements. Hooker was skinning the lion while the beast yet lived but he had certainly much reason for congratulation. His maneuvers had been skillfully planned and energetically executed. The two rivers which protected the Confederate position had been crossed without loss. The second and third corps had been brought into close touch with the right wing. Lee's earthworks were completely turned, and Stoneman's cavalry divisions, driving the enemy's patrols before them, were already within reach of Orange Court House and not more than 20 miles from Gordonsville. Best of all, the interval between the two wings, 26 miles on the night of the 28th, was now reduced to 11 miles by the plank road. Two things only were unsatisfactory. One, the absence of information. Two, the fact that the whole movement had been observed by the Confederate cavalry. Pleasanton's brigade of horse had proved too weak for the duty assigned to it. It had been able to protect the front, but it was too small to cover the flanks, and at the flanks Stuart had persistently struck. Hooker appears to have believed that Stoneman's advance against the Central Railroad would draw off the whole of the Confederate horse. Stuart, however, was not to be beguiled from his popular functions. Never were the squadrons more skillfully handled than in this campaign. 
with fine tactical insight. As soon as the great movement on Chancellorsville became pronounced, he had attacked the right flank of the Federal columns with Fitzhugh Lee's brigade, leaving only the two regiments under W.H.F. Lee to watch Stoneman's 10,000 sabers. Then, having obtained the information he required, he moved across the Federal front and routing one of Pleasanton's regiments in a night affair near Spotsylvania Courthouse, he had regained touch with his own army. The results of his maneuvers were of the utmost importance. Lee was fully informed as to his adversary's strength. The Confederate cavalry was in superior strength at the critical point, that is, along the front of the two armies, and Hooker had no knowledge whatever of what was going on in the space between Sedgwick and himself. He was only aware on the night of April 30th that the Confederate position before Fredericksburg was still strongly occupied. The want, however, of accurate information gave him no uneasiness. The most careful arrangements had been made to note and report every movement of the enemy the next day. No less than three captive balloons, in charge of skilled observers, looked down upon the Confederate earthworks. Signal stations and observatories had been established on each commanding height. A line of field telegraph had been laid from Falmouth to United States Ford, and the chief of the staff, General Butterfield, remained at the former village in communication with General Sedgwick. If the weather were clear and the telegraph did not fail, it seemed impossible that either wing of the Federal Army could fail to be fully and instantly informed of the situation of the other or that a single Confederate battalion could change position without both Hooker and Sedgwick being at once advised. Moreover, the Federal Commander-in-Chief was so certain that Lee would retreat that his deficiency in cavalry troubled him not at all. He had determined to carry out his original design. End of Section 60《Section 61 of Stonewall Jackson and the American Civil War. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Stonewall Jackson and the American Civil War by George Francis Robert Henderson. Chancellorsville, May 1st. The next morning, the right wing was to move by the plank road and uncover Banks Ford, thus still further shortening the line of communication between the two wings. And, as the chief of the staff impressed on Sedgwick, it was expected to be on the heights west of Fredericksburg at noon or shortly after, or, if opposed strongly, at night. Sedgwick, meanwhile, was to observe the enemy's movements with the utmost vigilance. Should he expose a weak point, to attack him in full force and destroy him. Should he show any symptom of falling back, to pursue him with the utmost vigor. But Hooker was to find that mere mechanical precautions are not an infallible remedy for a dangerous situation. The Confederates had not only learned long since the importance of concealment and the advantage of night marches, but in the early morning of May 1st, the river mists rendered both balloons and observatories useless. Long before the sun broke through the fog, both McLaws and Jackson had joined Anderson at Tabernacle Church, and a strong line of battle had been established at the junction of the two roads the pike, and the plank, which led east from Chancellorsville. The position was favorable, running along a low ridge, partially covered with timber, and with open fields in front. Beyond those fields, a few hundred paces distant, rose the outskirts of a great forest, stretching far away over a gently undulating country. This forest, twenty miles in length from east to west, and fifteen in breadth from north to south, has given to the region it covers the name of the wilderness of Spotsylvania, and in its midst the Federal Army was now involved. Never was ground more unfavorable for the maneuvers of a large army. The timber was unusually dense, 
The groves of pine were immersed in a sea of scrub oak and luxuriant undergrowth. The soil was poor. Farms were rare, and the few clearings were seldom more than a rifle shot in width. The woodland tracks were seldom traveled. Streams with marshy banks and tortuous courses were met at frequent intervals, and the only debouchée towards Fredericksburg, the pike, the plank road, an unfinished line of railway a mile south of their junction, and the river road about two miles north were commanded from the Confederate position. 8 a.m. When Jackson arrived upon the scene, Anderson, with the help of Lee's engineers, had strongly entrenched the whole front. A large force of artillery had already taken post. The flanks of the line were covered, the right, which extended to near Dworson's Mill, by Mott's Run and the Rappahannock, the left, which rested on the unfinished railroad not far from Tabernacle Church, by the Massapanics Creek. For the defense of this position, three miles in length, there were present 45,000 infantry, over 100 guns, and Fitzhugh Lee's brigade of cavalry, a force ample for the purpose, and giving about nine men to the yard. On the rolling ground eastward, there was excellent cover for the reserves, and from the breastworks to the front, the defiles, for such owing to the density of the wood, were the four roads by which the enemy must approach, might be so effectively swept as to prevent him from deploying either artillery or infantry. But Jackson was not disposed to await attack. Only 10,000 men remained in the Fredericksburg lines to confront Sedgwick. And if that officer acted vigorously, his guns would soon be heard in rear of the lines at Tabernacle Church. Work on the entrenchments was at once broken off, and the whole force was ordered to prepare for an immediate advance on Chancellorsville. 10.45 a.m. Before 11 o'clock, the rear brigades had closed up, and marching by the pike in the plank road, with a regiment of cavalry in advance, and Fitzhugh Lee upon the left, the Confederate army plunged resolutely into the gloomy depths of the great forest. Anderson's division led the way, one brigade on the pike and two on the plank road. A strong line of skirmishers covered his whole front, and his five batteries brought up the rear. Next in order came McLaws, together with the two remaining brigades of Anderson, moving by the pike, while Jackson's three divisions were on the plank road. The artillery followed the infantry. About a mile towards Chancellorsville, the Federal cavalry was found in some force, and as the patrols gave way, a heavy force of infantry was discovered in movement along the pike. General McLaws, who had been placed in charge of the Confederate right, immediately deployed his four leading brigades, and after the Federal artillery, unlimbering in an open field, had fired a few rounds, their infantry advanced to the attack. The fight was spirited but short. The northern regulars of Sykes' division drove in the Confederate skirmishers, but were unable to make ground against the line of battle. Jackson, meanwhile, who had been at once informed of the encounter, had ordered the troops on the plank road to push briskly forward, and the Federals, finding their right in danger of being enveloped, retired on Chancellorsville. Another hostile column was shortly afterwards met on the Plank Road, also marching eastward. Again there was a skirmish, and again Jackson, ordering a brigade to march rapidly along the unfinished railroad, had recourse to a turning movement. But before the maneuver was completed, the Federals began to yield and all opposition gradually melted away. The following order was then sent to McLaws. 2.30 p.m. Headquarters, 2nd Corps, Army of Northern Virginia. May 1st, 
1863, 2.30 p.m. Received, 4 p.m. General, the Lieutenant General Commanding directs me to say that he is pressing up the plank road. Also, that you will press on up the turnpike towards Chancellorsville, as the enemy is falling back. Keep your skirmishers and flanking parties well out to guard against ambuscade. Very respectfully, your obedient servant, J. G. Morrison, Acting Assistant Adjutant General. There was something mysterious in so easy a victory. The enemy was evidently in great strength, for on both roads heavy columns had been observed behind the lines of skirmishers. Several batteries had been in action, cavalry was present, and the Confederate scouts reported that a third column of all arms had marched by the river road towards Bank Sward, and had then, like the others, unaccountably withdrawn. The pursuit, therefore, was slow and circumspect. Wilcox's brigade, on the extreme right, moved up the mine road in the direction of Dorson's Mill. Wright's brigade, on the extreme left, followed Fitzhugh Lee's cavalry on the unfinished railroad, while the main body, well closed up, still kept to the main highways. 5 p.m. At length, late in the afternoon, Hooker's tactics became clear. As Jackson's advanced guards approached Chancellorsville, the resistance of the Federal skirmishers, covering the retreat, became more stubborn. From the low ridge, fringed by heavy timber, on which the mansion stands, the fire of artillery, raking every avenue of approach, grew more intense, and it was evident that the foe was standing fast on the defensive. The Confederate infantry, pushing forward through the undergrowth, made but tardy progress. The cavalry patrols found that every road and bridle path was strongly held, and it was difficult in the extreme to discover Hooker's exact position. Jackson himself, riding to the front to reconnoitre, nearly fell a victim to the recklessness he almost invariably displayed when in quest of information. The cavalry had been checked at Catherine Furnace and were waiting the approach of the infantry. Wright's brigade was close at hand and, swinging round northwards, drove back the enemy's skirmishers until, in its turn, it was brought up by the fire of artillery. Just at this moment, Jackson galloped up and begged Stuart to ride forward with him in order to find a point from which the enemy's guns might be enfiladed. A bridle path, branching off from the main road to the right, led to a hillock about half a mile distant, and the two generals, accompanied by their staffs and followed by a battery of horse artillery, made for this point of vantage. On reaching the spot, says Stuart's adjutant general, so dense was the undergrowth it was found impossible to find enough clear space to bring more than one gun at a time into position. The others closed up immediately behind, and the whole body of us completely blocked up the narrow road. Scarcely had the smoke of our first shot cleared away when a couple of masked batteries suddenly opened on us at short range and enveloped us in a storm of shell and canister, which, concentrated on so narrow a space, did fearful execution among our party, men and horses falling right and left, the animals kicking and plunging wildly, and everybody eager to disentangle himself from the confusion and get out of harm's way. Jackson, as soon as he found out his mistake, ordered the guns to retire, but the confined space so protracted the operation of turning that the enemy's cannon had full time to continue their havoc, covering the road with dead and wounded. That Jackson and Stuart with their staff officers escaped was nothing short of miraculous. Other attempts at reconnaissance were more successful. Before nightfall, it was ascertained that Hooker was in strong force on the Chancellorsville Ridge, 
along the plank road and on a bare plateau to the southward called Hazel Grove. Here, in the words of General Lee, he had assumed a position of great natural strength, surrounded on all sides by a dense forest, filled with a tangled undergrowth in the midst of which breastworks of logs had been constructed, with trees felled in front, so as to form an almost impenetrable abatis. His artillery swept the few narrow roads by which the position could be approached from the front and commanded the adjacent woods. The left of his line extended from Chancellorsville towards the Rappahannock, covering the Bark Mill, United States Ford, which communicated with the north bank of the river by a pontoon bridge. His right stretched westward along the Germana Ford Road, the Pike, more than two miles. As the nature of the country rendered it hazardous to attack by night, our troops were halted and formed in line of battle in front of Chancellorsville at right angles to the Plank Road, extending on the right to the Mine Road and to the left in the direction of the Catherine Furnace. As darkness falls upon the wilderness and the fire of the outposts, provoked by every movement of the patrols, gradually dies away, we may seek the explanation of the Federal movements. On finding that his enemy, instead of ingloriously flying, was advancing to meet him, and advancing with confident and aggressive vigor, Hooker's resolution had failed him. Waiting till his force was concentrated, until the Second and Third Corps had crossed at United States Ford, and were close to Chancellorsville, it was not till eleven o'clock on the morning of May 1st that he had marched in three great columns towards Fredericksburg. His intention was to pass rapidly through the wilderness, secure the open ground about Tabernacle Church, and there, with ample space for deployment, to form for battle and move against the rear of Mary's Hill. But before his advanced guards got clear of the forest defiles, they found the Confederates across their path, displaying an unmistakable purpose of pressing the attack. Hooker at once concluded that Lee was marching against him with nearly his whole force, and of the strength of that force, owing to the weakness of his cavalry, he was not aware. The news from the Stafford Heights was disquieting. As soon as the fog had lifted, about nine o'clock in the morning, the signal officers and balloonists had descried long columns of troops and trains marching rapidly towards Chancellorsville. This was duly reported by the telegraph, and it was correctly inferred to signify that Lee was concentrating against the federal right. But at the same time, various movements were observed about Hamilton's crossing. Columns appeared marching from the direction of Gurney's Station. There was much traffic on the railway, and several deserters from Lee's army declared, on being examined, that Hood's and Pickett's divisions had arrived from Richmond. The statements of these men, who we may suspect were not such traitors as they appeared, were confirmed by the fact that Sedgwick, who was without cavalry, had noticed no diminution in the force which held the ridge before him. It is easy, then, to understand Hooker's decision to stand on the defensive, with a prudent foresight, which does him much credit, before he marched in the morning, he had ordered the position about Chancellorsville, covering his lines of retreat to United States and Ely's Fords, to be reconnoitred and entrenched. And his front, as Lee said, was undoubtedly very strong. He would assuredly have done better had he attacked vigorously when he found the Confederates advancing. His sudden retrograde movement, especially as following the swift and successful maneuvers which had turned Lee's position, could not fail to have a discouraging effect upon the troops, and if Sedgwick had been ordered to storm the Fredericksburg lines, the whole Federal force could have been employed, and the Confederates, assailed in front and rear simultaneously, must, to say the least, have been embarrassed. But in abandoning his design of crushing Lee, 
between his two wings, and in retiring to the stronghold he had prepared, Hooker did what most ordinary generals would have done, especially one who had served on the losing side at Fredericksburg. He had there learned the value of entrenchments. He had seen division after division shatter itself in vain against a stone wall and a few gun pits, and it is little wonder that he had imbibed a profound respect for defensive tactics. He omitted, however, to take into consideration two simple facts. First, that few districts contained two such positions as those of the Confederates at Fredericksburg. And, secondly, that the strength of a position is measured not by the impregnability of the front, but by the security of the flanks. The Fredericksburg lines, resting on the Rappahannock and the Massapannocks, had apparently safe flanks, and yet he himself had completely turned them, rendering the whole series of works useless without firing a shot. Were Lee and Jackson the men to knock their heads like Burnside against stout breastworks strongly manned? Would they not rather make a wide sweep exactly as he himself had done and force him to come out of his works? Hooker, however, may have said that if they marched across his front, he would attack them en route, as did Napoleon at Austerlitz and Wellington at Salamanca, and cut their army in two. But here he came face to face with the fatal defect of the lines he had selected, and also of the disposition he had made of his cavalry. The country near Chancellorsville was very unlike the rolling plains of Austerlitz or the bare downs of Salamanca. From no part of the federal position did the view extend for more than a few hundred yards. Wherever the eye turned rose the dark and impenetrable screen of close-growing trees, interlaced with wild vines and matted undergrowth, and seemed with rough roads perfectly passable for troops, with which his enemies were far better acquainted than himself. Had Stoneman's cavalry been present, the squadrons posted far out upon the flanks and watching every track might have given ample warning of any turning movement exactly as Stuart's cavalry had given Lee warning of Hooker's own movement upon Chancellorsville. As it was, Pleasanton's brigade was too weak to make head against Stuart's regiments, and Hooker could expect no early information of his enemy's movements. He thus found himself in the dilemma, which a general on the defensive, if he be weak in cavalry, has almost invariably to face, especially in a close country. He was ignorant and must necessarily remain ignorant of where the main attack would be made. Lee, on the other hand, by means of his superior cavalry, could reconnoiter the position at his leisure, and if he discovered a weak point, could suddenly throw the greater portion of his force against it. Hooker could only hope that no weak point existed. Remembering that the Confederates were on the pike and the plank road, there certainly appeared no cause for apprehension. The Fifth Corps, with its flank on the Rappahannock, held the left, covering the river and the old mine roads. Next in succession came the Second Corps, blocking the pike. In the center, the Twelfth Corps, under General Slocum, covered Chancellorsville. The Third Corps, under Sickles, held Hazel Grove with Barry's division as general reserve, and on the extreme right, his breastworks, running along the plank road as far as Talley's clearing, was Howard with the 11th Corps, composed principally of German regiments. Strong outposts of infantry had been thrown out into the woods. The men were still working in the entrenchments. Batteries were disposed so as to sweep every approach from the south, the southeast, or the southwest, and there were at least five men to every yard of parapet. The line, however, six miles from flank to flank, was somewhat extensive, and to make certain, so far as possible, that sufficient numbers should be forthcoming to defend the position. At 1.55 on the morning of May 2nd, 
Sedgwick was instructed to send the 1st Army Corps to Chancellorsville. Before midnight, moreover, 34 guns, principally horse, artillery, together with a brigade of infantry, were sent from Falmouth to Banks Ford. Sedgwick, meantime, below Fredericksburg, had contented himself with engaging the outposts on the opposite ridge. An order to make a brisk demonstration, which Hooker had dispatched at 11.30 a.m., did not arrive, the telegraph having broken down, until 5.45 p.m., six hours later, and it was then too late to effect any diversion in favor of the main army. Yet it can hardly be said that Sedgwick had risen to the height of his responsibilities. He knew that a portion, at least, of the Confederates had marched against Hooker, and the balloonist had early reported that a battle was in progress near Tabernacle Church. But instead of obeying Napoleon's maxim and marching to the sound of the cannon, he had made no effort to send support to his commander. Both he and General Reynolds considered that to have attacked before Hooker had accomplished some success in view of the strong position and numbers in their front might have failed to dislodge the enemy and have rendered them unserviceable at the proper time. That is, they were not inclined to risk their own commands in order to assist Hooker, of whose movements they were uncertain. Yet, even if they had been defeated, Hooker would still have had more men than Lee. End of section 61section 62 of stonewall jackson and the american civil war this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org stonewall jackson and the american civil war by george francis robert henderson Chapter 24. Chancellorsville. Continued. At a council of war held during the night at Chancellorsville House, the federal generals were by no means unanimous as to the operations of the morrow. Some of the generals advised an early assault. Others favored a strictly defensive attitude. Hooker himself wished to contract his lines so as to strengthen them. But as the officers commanding on the right were confident of the strength of their entrenchments, it was at length determined that the army should await attack in its present position. Three miles down the plank road, under a grove of oak and pine, Lee and Jackson, while their wearied soldiers slept around them, planned for the fourth and last time the overthrow of the great army with which Lincoln still hoped to capture Richmond. At this council, there was no difference of opinion. If Hooker had not retreated before the morning, and Jackson thought it possible he was already demoralized, he was to be attacked. The situation admitted of no other course. It was undoubtedly a hazardous operation for an inferior force to assault an entrenched position. But the Federal Army was divided. The right wing involved in a difficult and unexplored country with which the Confederate generals and staff were more or less familiar, and an opportunity so favorable might never recur. Fortune, says Napoleon, is a woman who must be wooed while she is in the mood. If her favors are rejected, she does not offer them again. The only question was where the attack should be delivered. Lee himself had reconnoitred the enemy's left. It was very strong resting on the Rappahannock and covered by a stream called Mineral Spring Run. Two of Jackson's staff officers had reconnoitred the front and had pronounced it impregnable, except at a fearful sacrifice of life. But while the generals were debating, Stuart rode in with the reports of his cavalry officers, and the weak point of the position was at once revealed. General Fitzhugh Lee to whose skill and activity the victory of Chancellorsville was in great part due, had discovered that the Federal right on the Plank Road was completely in the air. That is, it was protected by no natural obstacle, 
and the breastworks faced south, and south only. It was evident that attack from the west or northwest was not anticipated, and Lee at once seized upon the chance of effecting a surprise. Yet the difficulties of the proposed operation were very great. To transfer a turning column to a point from which the Federal right might be effectively outflanked necessitated a long march by the narrow and intricate roadways of the wilderness and a division of the Confederate army into two parts, between which communication would be most precarious. To take advantage of the opportunity, the first rule of war must be violated. But as it has already been said, the rules of war only point out the dangers which are incurred by breaking them. And, in this case, before an enemy on the defensive, from whom the separation might be concealed until it is too late for him to intervene, the risks of dispersion were much reduced. The chief danger lay in this, that the two wings, each left to its own resources, might fail to act in combination, just as within the past 24 hours, Hooker and Sedgwick had failed. But Lee knew that in Jackson he possessed a lieutenant whose resolution was invincible, and that the turning column, if entrusted to his charge, would be pushed forward without stop or stay until it had either joined hands with the main body or had been annihilated. Moreover, the Battle of Fredericksburg had taught both armies that the elaborate constructions of the engineer are not the only or the most useful resources of fortification. Hooker had ordered his position to be entrenched in the hope that Lee and Jackson, following Burnside's example, would dash their divisions into fragments against them and thus become an easy prey. Lee, with a broader appreciation of the true tactical bearing of ditch and parapet, determined to employ them as a shelter for his own force, until Jackson's movement was completed, and the time had come for a general advance. Orders were at once sent to General McLaws to cover his front, extending across the pike and the plank roads, with a line of breastworks, and long before daylight the soldiers of his division, with the scanty means at their disposal, were busy as beavers amongst the timber. It only remained then to determine the route and the strength of the outflanking force. And here it may be observed that the headquarters staff appears to have neglected certain precautions for which there had been ample leisure. So long ago as March 19th, a council of war had decided that if Hooker attacked, he would do so by the upper fords. And yet the wilderness, lying immediately south of the point of passage, had not been adequately examined. Had Jackson been on the left wing above Fredericksburg, instead of on the right, near Hamilton's crossing, we may be certain that accurate surveys would have been forthcoming. As it was, the charts furnished to the commander-in-chief were untrustworthy, and information had to be sought from the country people. May 2nd, 2.30 a.m., about daylight on May 2nd, says Major Hotchkiss, General Jackson awakened me and requested that I would at once go down to Catherine Furness, which is quite near, and where a Colonel Welford lived, and ascertain if there was any road by which we could secretly pass round Chancellorsville to the vicinity of Old Wilderness Tavern. I had a map, which our engineers had prepared from actual surveys of the surrounding country showing all the public roads, but with few details of the intermediate topography. Reaching Mr. Wilford's, I aroused him from his bed, and soon learned that he himself had recently opened a road through the woods in that direction for the purpose of hauling cordwood and iron ore to his furnace. This I located on the map, and having asked Mr. Wilford if he would act as a guide if it became necessary to march over that road, I returned to headquarters. 3.30 a.m. When I reached those, I found Generals Lee and Jackson in conference, each seated on a cracker box from a pile which had been left there by the Federals the day before. 
In response to General Jackson's request for my report, I put another cracker box between the two generals, on which I spread the map, showed them the road I had ascertained, and indicated, so far as I knew it, the position of the Federal Army. General Lee then said, General Jackson, what do you propose to do? He replied, Go around here, moving his finger over the road which I had located upon the map. General Lee said, What do you propose to make this movement with? With my whole corps, was the answer. General Lee then asked, What will you leave me? The divisions of Anderson and McLaws, said Jackson. General Lee, after a moment's reflection, remarked, Well, go on. And then, pencil in hand, gave his last instructions. Jackson, with an eager smile upon his face, from time to time nodded assent, and when the commander-in-chief ended with the words, General Stuart will cover your movement with his cavalry, he rose and saluted, saying, My troops will move at once, sir. The necessary orders were forthwith dispatched. The trains parked in open fields to the rear were to move to Todd's Tavern, and thence, westward by interior roads, the Second Army Corps was to march in one column, Rhodes Division in front, and A.P. Hills in rear. The 1st Virginia Cavalry, with whom was Fitzhugh Lee, covered the front. Squadrons of the 2nd, the 3rd, and the 5th were on the right. Hotchkiss, accompanied by a squad of couriers, was to send back constant reports to General Lee. The commanding officers were impressed with the importance of celerity and secrecy. The ranks were to be kept well closed up, and all stragglers were to be bayoneted. 4.30 a.m. The day had broken without a cloud, and as the troops began their march in the fresh May morning, the green vistas of the wilderness, grass underfoot and thick foliage overhead, were dappled with sunshine. The men comprehending intuitively that a daring and decisive movement was in progress pressed rapidly forward and General Lee, standing by the roadside to watch them pass, saw in their confident bearing the presage of success. Soon after the first regiments had gone by, Jackson himself appeared at the head of his staff. Opposite to the commander-in-chief, he drew rein, and the two conversed for a few moments. Then Jackson rode on, pointing in the direction in which his troops were moving. His face, says an eyewitness, was a little flushed, as it was turned to General Lee, who nodded approval of what he said. Such was a last interview between Lee and Jackson. Then, during four long hours, for the column covered at least ten miles, the flood of bright rifles and tattered uniforms swept with steady flow down the forest track. The artillery followed, the guns drawn by lean and wiry horses, and the ammunition wagons and ambulances brought up the rear. In front was a regiment of cavalry, the 5th Virginia, accompanied by General Fitzhugh Lee. On the flanks were some ten squadrons, moving by the tracks nearest the enemy's outposts. A regiment of infantry, the 23rd Georgia, was posted at the crossroads near Catherine Furnace, and the plank road was well guarded until Anderson's troops came up to relieve the rear brigades of the Second Army Corps. Meanwhile, acting under the immediate orders of General Lee, and most skillfully handled by McLaws and Anderson, the 10,000 Confederates, who had been left in position opposite the Federal masses, kept up a brisk demonstration. Artillery was brought up to every point along the front, which offered space for action. Skirmishers covered by the timber engaged the enemy's pickets and maintained a constant fire, and both on the pike and the river road, the lines of battle, disposed so as to give an impression of great strength, threatened instant assault. Despite all precautions, however, Jackson's movement did not escape the notice of the Federals. 8 a.m. A mile north of Catherine Furnace, the eminence, called Hazel Grove, clear of timber, down the valley of the Lewis Creek, and as early as 8 a.m., General Burney, commanding the Federal Division at this point, reported the passage of a long column across his front. The indications, however, were deceptive, 
At first, it is probable the movement seemed merely a prolongation of the Confederate front, but it soon received a different interpretation. The road at the point where Jackson's column was observed turned due south. It was noticed that the troops were followed by their wagons and that they were turning their backs on the Federal lines. Hooker, when he received Burney's report, jumped to the conclusion that Lee, finding the direct road to Richmond through Bowling Green, threatened by Sedgwick, was retreating on Gordonsville. 11 a.m. About 11 a.m., a battery was ordered into action on the Hazel Grove Heights. 12.15 p.m. The fire caused some confusion in the Confederate ranks. The trains were forced onto another road, and shortly after noon, General Sickles, commanding the 3rd Army Corps, was permitted by Hooker to advance upon Catherine Furness and to develop the situation. Burney's division moved forward, and Whipple's soon followed. This attack, which threatened to cut the Confederate Army in two, was so vigorously opposed by Anderson's division astride the Plank Road and by the 23rd Georgia at the Furnace, that General Sickles was constrained to call for reinforcements. Barlow's brigade, which had hitherto formed the reserve of the 11th Corps, holding the extreme right of the Federal line, the flank at which Jackson was aiming, was sent to his assistance. Pleasanton's cavalry brigade followed. Sickles' movement, even before the fresh troops arrived, had met with some success. The 23rd Georgia, driven back to the unfinished railroad and surrounded, lost 300 officers and men. But word had been sent to Jackson's column and Colonel Brown's artillery battalion, together with the brigades of Archer and Thomas, rapidly retracing their steps, checked the advance in front, while Anderson, maneuvering his troops with vigor, struck heavily against the flank. Jackson's train, thus effectively protected, passed the dangerous point in safety, and then Archer and Thomas, leaving Anderson to deal with Sickles, drew off and pursued their march. These operations, conducted for the most part in blind thickets, consumed much time, and Jackson was already far in advance. Moving in a southwesterly direction, he had struck the Brook Road, a narrow track which runs nearly due north and crosses both the Plank Road and the Pike at a point about two miles west of the Federal right flank. The Brook Road, which had Stoneman's three divisions of cavalry been present with the Federal Army, would have been strongly held, was absolutely free and unobstructed. Since the previous evening, Fitzhugh Lee's patrols had remained in close touch with the enemy's outposts, and no attempt had been made to drive them in. So, with no further obstacle than the heat, the Second Army Corps pressed on, away to the right, Echoing faintly through the wilderness came the sound of cannon and the roll of musketry. Couriers from the rear, galloping at top speed, reported that the trains had been attacked, that the near brigades had turned back to save them, and that the enemy, in heavy strength, had already filled the gap which divided the Confederate wings. But, though the army was cut in two, Jackson cast no look behind him. The battle at the furnace made no more impression on him than if it was being waged on the Mississippi. He had his orders to execute, and above all, he was moving at his best speed toward the enemy's weak point. He knew, and none better, that Hooker would not long retain the initiative, that every man detached from the Federal center made his own chances of success the more certain. And trusting implicitly in Lee's ability to stave off defeat, he rode northwards with redoubled assurance of decisive victory. Forward was the cry, and though the heat was stifling, and the dust rising from the deep ruts on the unmetalled road rose in dense clouds beneath the trees, and men dropped fainting in the ranks, the great column pushed on without a check. 2 p.m. About 2 p.m., as the rear brigades, Archer and Thomas, after checking Sickles, were just leaving Walford's house, some six miles distant, 
Jackson himself had reached the plank road, the point where he intended to turn eastward against the Federal flank. Here he was met by Fitzhugh Lee, conveying most important and surprising information. The cavalry regiment had halted when it arrived on the plank road. All was reported quiet at the front. The patrols were moving northward, and attended by a staff officer, the young brigadier had ridden towards the turnpike. The path they followed led to a wide clearing at the summit of a hill, from which there was a view eastward as far as Dowdall's Tavern. Below, and but a few hundred yards distant, ran the Federal breastworks, with a battis in front and long lines of stacked arms in rear, but untenanted by a single company. Two cannon were seen upon the high road, the horses grazing quietly near at hand. The soldiers were scattered in small groups, laughing, cooking, smoking, sleeping, and playing cards, while others were butchering cattle and drawing rations. What followed is best told in General Fitzhugh Lee's own words. I rode back and met Jackson, General, said I. If you will ride with me, halting your columns here out of sight, I will show you the great advantage of attacking down the old turnpike instead of the plank road, the enemy's lines being taken in reverse. Bring only one courier, as you will be in view from the top of the hill. Jackson assented. When we reached the eminence, the picture below was still unchanged, and I watched him closely as he gazed on Howard's troops. His expression was one of intense interest. His eyes burnt with a brilliant glow, and his face was slightly flushed, radiant at the success of his flank movement. To the remarks made to him while the unconscious line of blue was pointed out, he made no reply, and yet during the five minutes he was on the hill, his lips were moving. Tell General Rhodes, he said, suddenly turning his horse towards the courier, to move across the plank road and halt when he gets to the old turnpike. I will join him there. One more look at the Federal lines, and he rode rapidly down the hill. 4 p.m. The cavalry, supported by the Stonewall Brigade, was immediately placed a short distance down the plank road in order to mask the march of the column. At 4 p.m., Rhodes was on the turnpike, passing down it for about a mile in the direction of the enemy's position. The troops were ordered to halt and form for battle. Not a shot had been fired. A few hostile patrols had been observed, but along the line of breastworks, watched closely by the cavalry, the Federal troops, still in the most careless security, were preparing their evening meal. Jackson, meanwhile, seated on a stump near the Brook Road, had penned his last dispatch to General Lee. Near 3 p.m., May 2nd, 1863. General, the enemy has made a stand at Chancellors, which is about two miles from Chancellorsville. I hope as soon as practicable to attack. I trust that an ever-kind providence will bless us with great success. Respectfully, T.J. Jackson, Lieutenant General. The leading division is up, and the next two appear to be well closed. T.J.J. General B.E. Lee. 25,000 men were now deploying in the forest within a mile of the Federal works overlapping them both to north and south, and not a single general in the northern army appears to have suspected their presence. The day had passed quietly at Chancellorsville. At a very early hour in the morning, Hooker, anticipating a vigorous attack, had ordered the 1st Army Corps, which had hitherto been acting with Sedgwick below Fredericksburg, to recross the Rappahannock, and marched to Chancellorsville. Averill's division of cavalry also, which had been engaged near Orange Court House with W.H.F. Lee's two regiments, was instructed about the same time to rejoin the army as soon as possible, and was now marching by the left bank of the Rapidan to Ely's Ford. 
anticipating, therefore, that he would soon be strongly reinforced, Hooker betrayed no uneasiness. Shortly after dawn, he had ridden round his lines. Expecting at that time to be attacked in front only, he had no fault to find with their location or construction. As he looked over the barricades, says General Howard, while receiving the cheers and salutes of the men, he said to me, How strong! How strong! When the news came that a Confederate column was marching westward, past Catherine Furness, his attention, for the moment, was attracted to his right. At 10 a.m., he was still uncertain as to the meaning of Jackson's movement. As the hours went by, however, and Jackson's column disappeared in the forest, he again grew confident. The generals were informed that Lee was in full retreat towards Gordonsville, and a little later, Sedgwick received the following. Chancellorsville, May 2, 1863, 4.10 p.m. General Butterfield, the Major General, commanding, directs that General Sedgwick cross the river as soon as indications will permit, capture Fredericksburg with everything in it, and vigorously pursue the enemy. We know that the enemy is fleeing, trying to save his trains. Two of Sickles' divisions are among them, J. H. Van Allen, Brigadier General and Aide de Camp. Copy from Butterfield at Falmouth to Sedgwick, 5.50 p.m. At four o'clock, therefore, the moment Jackson's vanguard reached the old turnpike near Luckett's farm, Hooker believed that all danger of the flank attack had passed away. His left wing was under orders to advance. As soon as a swamp to the front could be corduroyed and strike Lee in flank, while to reinforce Sickles, among the enemy's trains, William's division of the 12th Corps was sent forward from the center. Howard's reserve brigade, Barlow's, from the right, and Pleasanton's Cavalry Brigade from Hazel Grove. The officers in charge of the Federal right appear to have been as unsuspicious as their commander. During the morning, some slight preparations were made to defend the turnpike from the westward, a shallow line of rifle pits, and a few epaulments for artillery had been constructed on a low ridge, commanding open fields, which runs north from Dowdle's Tavern, and the wood beyond had been partially entangled. But this was all, and even when the only reserve of the 11th Army Corps, Barlow's Brigade, was sent to Sickles, it was not considered necessary to make any change in the disposition of the troops. The belief that Lee and Jackson were retreating had taken firm hold of every mind. The pickets on the flank had indeed reported from time to time that infantry was massing in the thickets, and the Confederate cavalry, keeping just outside effective range, occupied every road and every clearing. Yet no attempt was made by a strong reconnaissance in force to ascertain what was actually going on within the forest, and the reports of the scouts were held to be exaggerated. The neglect was the more marked in that the position of the 11th Army Corps was very weak. Howard had with him 20 regiments of infantry and six batteries, but his force was completely isolated. His extreme right consisting of four German regiments, was posted in the forest, with two guns facing westward on the pike and a line of entrenchments facing south. On the low hill eastward, where Tally's farm, a small wooden cottage, stood in the midst of a wide clearing, were two more German regiments and two American. Then, near the junction of the roads, 
intervened a patch of forest, which was occupied by four regiments, with a brigade upon their left and beyond, nearly a mile wide from north to south, and five or six hundred yards in breadth, were the open fields round to the wilderness church, dipping at first to a shallow brook, and then rising gradually to a house called Dowdall's Tavern. In these fields, south of the turnpike, were the breastworks, held by the second division of the 11th Army Corps, and here were six regiments, with several batteries in close support. The 60th, New York, and 26th, Wisconsin, near the Hawkins House, at the north end of the fields, faced to the west. The remainder all faced south. Beyond Dowdall's tavern rose the forest, dark and impenetrable to the view. But to the southeast, nearly two miles from Tally's, the clearings of Hazel Grove were plainly visible. This part of the line, originally entrusted to General Sickles, was now unguarded, for two divisions of the Third Corps were moving on the furnace, and the nearest force, which could render support to Howard's, was Barry's division, retained in reserve northeast of Chancellorsville, three miles distant from Talley's farm, and nearly two from Harrow's left. The Confederates, meanwhile, were rapidly forming for attack, notwithstanding their fatigue, for many of the brigades had marched over fifteen miles. The men were in the highest spirits. A young staff officer who passed along the column relates that he was everywhere recognized with the usual greetings. Say, here's one of old Jack's little boys. Let him by, boys. Have a good breakfast this morning, Sonny? Better hurry up or you'll catch it for getting behind. Tell old Jack we're all a-coming. Don't let him begin the fuss till we get there. But on reaching the turnpike, orders were given that all noise should cease, and the troops, deploying for a mile or more on either side of the road, took up their formation for attack. In front were the skirmishers of Rhodes Division, under Major Blackford. Four hundred yards in rear came the lines of battle, Rhodes forming the first line, Colston at two hundred yards distance, the second line, A.P. Hill, part in line and part in column, the third. In little more than an hour and a half, notwithstanding the dense woods, the formation was completed, and the lines dressed at the proper angle to the road. 5.45 p.m., Notwithstanding that the enemy might at any moment awake to their danger, not a single precaution was neglected. Jackson was determined that the troops should move forward in good order, and that every officer and man should know what was expected from him. Staff officers had been stationed at various points to maintain communication between the divisions, and the divisional and brigade commanders had received their instructions. The whole force was to push resolutely forward through the forest. The open hill, about a thousand yards eastward, on which stood Tally's farm, was to be carried at all hazard, for, so far as could be ascertained, it commanded, over an intervening patch of forest, the ridge which ran north from Dowdall's tavern. After the capture of the heights at Tally's, if the Federals showed a determined front on their second line, Rhodes was to halt under cover until the artillery could come up and dislodge them. Under no other circumstances was there to be any pause in the advance. A brigade of the first line was detailed to guard the right flank, a regiment the left, and the second and third lines were ordered to support the first, whenever it might be necessary without waiting for further instructions. The field hospital was established at the old wilderness tavern. The men were in position, eagerly awaiting their signal. Their quick intelligence had already realized the situation, and all was life and animation. Across the narrow clearing, 
stretched the long gray lines, penetrating far into the forest on either flank. In the center, on the road, were four Napoleon guns, the horses fretting with excitement. Far to the rear, their rifles glistened under the long shafts of the setting sun. The heavy columns of A.P. Hill's division were rapidly advancing, and the rumble of the artillery closing to the front grew louder and louder. Jackson, watch in hand, sat silent on Little Sorrel, his slouched hat drawn low over his eyes and his lips tightly compressed. On his right was General Rhodes, tall, lithe, and soldierly, and on Rhodes' right was Major Blackford. Are you ready, General Rhodes? said Jackson. Yes, sir, said Rhodes, impatient as his men. You can go forward, sir, said Jackson. 6 p.m. A nod from Rhodes was sufficient order to Blackford, and the woods rang with the notes of a single bugle. Back came the responses from bugles to right and left, and the skirmishers, dashing through the wild undergrowth, sprang eagerly to their work, followed by the quick rush of the lines of battle. For a moment, the troops seemed buried in the thickets. Then, as the enemy's sentries, completely taken by surprise, fired a few scattered shots, and the guns on the turnpike came quickly into action, the echoes waked. Through the still air of the summer evening rang the rebel yell, filling the forest far to north and south and the hearts of the astonished Federals, lying idly behind their breastworks, stood still within them. So rapid was the advance, so utterly unexpected the attack, that the pickets were at once overrun, and, crashing through the timber, driving before it the wild creatures of the forest, deer and hares and foxes, the broad front of the mighty torrent bore down on Howard's flank. For a few moments, the four regiments, which formed his right, supported by two guns, held staunchly together, and even checked for a brief space the advance of O'Neill's brigade. But from the right and from the left, the gray infantry swarmed round them. The second line came surging forward to O'Neill's assistance, the gunners were shot down and their pieces captured. And in ten minutes, the right brigade of the Federal Army, submerged by numbers, was flying in panic across the clearing. Here, near Talley's farm, on the field south of the turnpike, and in the forest to the north, another brigade, hastily changing front, essayed to stay the route. But Jackson's horse artillery moving forward at a gallop, poured in canister at short range, and three brigades, O'Neill's, Iverson's, and Dole's, attacked the northerners fiercely in front and flank. No troops, however brave, could have long withstood that overwhelming rush. The slaughter was very great. Every mounted officer was shot down, and in ten or fifteen minutes, the fragments of these hapless regiments were retreating rapidly and tumultuously towards the wilderness church. The first position had been captured, but there was no pause in the attack. As Jackson, following the artillery, rode past Talley's farm and gazed across the clearing to the east, he saw a sight which raised high his hopes of a decisive victory. Already in the green cornfields, the spoils of battle lay thick around him. Squads of prisoners were being hurried to the rear, abandoned guns and wagons overturned. The wounded horses were still struggling in the traces, were surrounded by the dead and dying of Howard's brigades. Knapsacks piled in regular order. Arms, blankets, accoutrements lay in profusion near the breastworks and beyond, under a rolling cloud of smoke and dust, the bare fields sloping down to the brook, were covered with fugitives. Still further eastward, along the plank road, speeding in wild confusion towards Chancellorsville, 
was a dense mass of men and wagons. Cattle, maddened with fright, were rushing to and fro, and on the ridge beyond the little church, pushing their way through the terror-stricken throng like ships through a heavy sea or breaking into fragments before the pressure. The irregular lines of a few small regiments were moving hastily to the front. At more than one point on the edge of the distant woods, guns were coming into action. The hill near Tally's farm was covered with projectiles. Men were falling, and the Confederate first line was already in some confusion. Galloping up the turnpike and urging the artillery forward with voice and gesture, Jackson passed through the ranks of his eager infantry, and then Rhodes' division, rushing down the wooded slopes, burst from the covert and, driving their flying foes before them, advanced against the trenches on the opposite ridge. Here and there the rush of the first line was checked by the bold resistance of the German regiments. On the right, especially, progress was slow. For Colquitt's brigade, drawn off by the pressure of Federal outposts in the woods to the south, had lost touch with the remainder of the division. Ramsier's brigade, in rear, had been compelled to follow suit, and on this flank the Federals were most effectively supported by their artillery. But Iverson, O'Neill, and Doles, hardly halting to reform as they left the woods and followed closely by the second line, swept rapidly across the fields, dashed back the regiments which sought to check them, and under a hot fire of grape and canister, pressed resolutely forward. The rifle pits on the ridge were occupied by the last brigade of Howard's Army Corps. A battery was in rear, three more were on the left, near Dowdall's Tavern, and many of the fugitives from Tally's farm had rallied behind the breastwork but a few guns and four or five thousand rifles, although the ground to the front was clear and open, were powerless to arrest the rush of Jackson's veterans. The long lines of colors tossed redly above the swiftly moving ranks, never for a moment faltered. The men, running alternately to the front, delivered their fire, stopped for a moment to load, and then again ran on, Nearer and nearer they came, until the defenders of the trenches, already half demoralized, could mark through the smoke drift, the tanned faces, the fierce eyes, and the gleaming bayonets of their terrible foes. The guns were already flying, and the position was outflanked. Yet along the whole length of the ridge, the parapets still blazed with fire, and while men fell headlong in the Confederate ranks, for a moment, there was a check, but it was the check of a mighty wave, mounting slowly to full volume, ere it falls in thunder on the shrinking sands. Running to the front with uplifted swords, the officers gave the signal for the charge. The men answered with a yell of triumph. The second line, closing rapidly on the first, could no longer be restrained, and as the gray masses, crowding together in their excitement, breasted the last slope, the Federal infantry, in every quarter of the field, gave way before them. The ridge was abandoned, and through the dark pines beyond rolled the rout of the 11th Army Corps. End of Section 62this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Stonewall Jackson and the American Civil War by George Francis Robert Henderson Chancellorsville Continued 7 p.m. It was 7 o'clock. Twilight was falling on the woods, and Rhodes and Colston's divisions had become so inextricably mingled that officers could not find their men, nor men their officers. But Jackson, galloping into the disordered ranks, directed them to press the pursuit. 
His face was aglow with the blaze of battle. His swift gestures and curt orders, admitting of no question, betrayed the fierce intensity of his resolution. Although the great tract of forest, covering Chancellorsville on the west, had swallowed up the fugitives, he had no need of vision to reveal to him the extent of his success. Ten thousand men had been utterly defeated. The enemy's right wing was scattered to the winds. The Southerners were within a mile and a half of the Federals' center and completely in rear of their entrenchments. And the White House, or Bullock Road, only half a mile to the front, led directly to Hooker's line of retreat by the United States Ford. Until that road was in his possession, Jackson was determined to call no halt. The dense woods, the gathering darkness, the fatigue and disorder of his troops, he regarded no more than he did the enemy's overwhelming numbers. In spirit, he was standing at Hooker's side, and he saw, as clearly as though the intervening woods had been swept away, the condition to which his adversary had been reduced. To the Federal headquarters, confusion and dismay had come, indeed, with appalling suddenness. Late in the afternoon, Hooker was sitting with two aides-de-camp in the veranda of the Chancellor House. There were few troops in sight. Their corps and Pleasanton's cavalry had long since disappeared in the forest. The Twelfth Army Corps, with the exception of two brigades, was already advancing against Anderson, and only the trains and some artillery remained within the entrenchments at Hazel Grove. All was going well. A desultory firing broke out at intervals to the eastward. But it was not sustained, and three miles to the south, where, as Hooker believed, in pursuit of Jackson, Sickles and Pleasanton were, the reports of their cannon, growing fainter and fainter as they pushed further south, betokened no more than a lively skirmish. The quiet of the wilderness, save for those distant sounds, was undisturbed, and men and animals, free from every care, were enjoying the calm of the summer evening. It was about half past six. Suddenly the cannonade swelled to a heavier roar, and the sound came from a new direction. All were listening intently, speculating on what this might mean, when a staff officer, who had stepped out to the front of the house and was looking down the plank road with his glass, exclaimed, "'My God, here they come!' Hooker sprang upon his horse, and riding rapidly down the road, met the stragglers of the 11th Corps, men, wagons, and ambulances, an ever-increasing crowd, rushing in blind terror from the forest, flying they knew not whither. The whole of the right wing, they said, overwhelmed by superior numbers, was falling back on Chancellorsville, and Stonewall Jackson was in hot pursuit. The situation had changed in the twinkling of an eye just now congratulating himself on the complete success of his maneuvers, on the retreat of his enemies, on the flight of Jackson and the helplessness of Lee, Hooker saw his strong entrenchments taken in reverse, his army scattered, his reserves far distant, and the most derated of his opponents, followed by his victorious veterans, within a few hundred yards of his headquarters. His weak point had been found, and there were no troops at hand wherewith to restore the fight. The center was held only by the two brigades of the Twelfth Corps at the Fairview Cemetery. The works at Hazel Grove were untenanted, save by a few batteries and a handful of infantry. The second and fifth corps on the left were fully occupied by McLaws, for Lee, at the first sound of Jackson's guns, had ordered a vigorous attack up the pike and the plank road. Sickles, with 20,000 men, was far away, isolated and perhaps surrounded, and the line of retreat, the road to United States Ford, was absolutely unprotected. Messengers were dispatched, in hot haste, to recall Sickles and Pleasanton to Hazel Grove. Barry's division, forming the reserve northeast of the Chancellor House, was summoned to Fairview, and Hayes' brigade of the 2nd Corps ordered to support it. But what could three small brigades hurried into position and unprotected by entrenchments, avail against 25,000 Southerners led by Stonewall Jackson and animated by their easy victory. If Barry and Hayes could stand fast against the rush of fugitives, it was all that could be expected. 
and as the uproar in the dark woods swelled to a deeper volume, and the yells of the Confederates, mingled with the crash of the musketry, were borne to his ears, Hooker must have felt that all was lost. To make matters worse, as Pleasanton, hurrying back with his cavalry, arrived at Hazel Grove, the trains of the Third Army Corps, fired on by the Confederate skirmishers, dashed wildly across the clearing, swept through the parked artillery, and, breaking through the forest, increased the fearful tumult which reigned round Chancellorsville. The gunners, however, with a courage beyond all praise, stood staunchly to their pieces, and soon a long line of artillery, for which two regiments of the Third Army Corps, coming up rapidly from the south, formed a sufficient escort, was established on this commanding hill. Other batteries, hitherto held in reserve, took post on the high ground at Fairview, a mile to the northeast, and although Barry's infantry were not yet in position, and the stream of broken troops was still pouring past, a strong front of fifty guns opposed the Confederate advance. But it was not the artillery that saved Hooker from irretrievable disaster. As they followed the remnants of the Eleventh Army Corps, the progress of Rhodes and Colston had been far less rapid than when they stormed forward past the Wilderness Church. A regiment of Federal cavalry, riding to Howard's aid by a track from Hazel Grove to the Plank Road, was quickly swept aside, but the deep darkness of the forest, the efforts of the officers to reform the ranks, the barriers opposed by the tangled undergrowth, the difficulty of keeping the direction, brought a large portion of the troops to a standstill. At the junction of the White House Road, the order to halt was given, and although a number of men, pushing impetuously forward, seized a line of log breastworks, which ran northwest through the timber below the Fairview Heights, the pursuit was stayed in the midst of the dense thickets. 8.15 p.m. At this moment, shortly after 8 o'clock, Jackson was at Daldal's Tavern. The reports from the front informed him that his first and second lines had halted. General Rhodes, who had galloped up the plank road to reconnoitre, sent in word that there were no Federal troops to be seen between his line and the Fairview Heights, and Colonel Cobb of the 44th Virginia brought the news that the strong entrenchments less than a mile from Chancellorsville had been occupied without resistance. There was a lull in the battle. The firing had died away, and the excited troops, with a clamor that was heard in the Federal lines, sought their companies and regiments by the dim light of the rising moon. But deeming that nothing was done while aught remained to do, Jackson was already planning a further movement, sending instructions to A.P. Hill to relieve Rhodes and Colston and to prepare for a night attack. He rode forward, almost unattended, amongst his rallying troops and lent his aid to the efforts of the regimental officers. Intent on bringing up the two divisions in close support of Hill, he passed from one regiment to another. Turning to Colonel Cobb, he said to him, Find General Rhodes and tell him to occupy the barricade at once. And then added, I need your help for a time. This disorder must be corrected. As you go along the right, tell the troops from me to get into line and preserve their order. It was long, however, before the men could be assembled, and the delay was increased by an unfortunate incident. Jackson's chief of artillery, pressing forward up the plank road to within a thousand yards of Chancellorsville, opened fire with three guns upon the enemy's position. This audacious proceeding evoked a quick reply. Such federal guns, as could be brought to bear, were at once turned upon the road and although the damage done was small, A.P. Hill's brigades, just coming up into line, were for the moment checked. Under the hail of shell and canister, the artillery horses became unmanageable. The drivers lost their nerve, and as they rushed to the rear, some of the infantry joined them, and a stampede was only prevented by the personal efforts of Jackson, Colston, and their staff officers. Colonel Crutchfield was then ordered to cease firing, 
the Federals did the same, and A.P. Hill's brigades, that of General Lane leading, advanced to the deserted breastworks, while two brigades, one from Rhodes' division and one from Colston's, were ordered to guard the roads from Hazel Grove. 8.45 p.m. These arrangements made, Jackson proceeded to join his advance line. At the point where the track to the White House and United States Ford strikes the plank road, he met General Lee, seeking his instructions for the attack. They were sufficiently brief. Push right ahead, Lane, right ahead. As Lane galloped off to his command, General Hill and some of his staff came up, and Jackson gave Hill his orders. Press them. Cut them off from the United States Ford. Hill, press them. General Hill replied that he was entirely unacquainted with the topography of the country and asked for an officer to act as a guide. Jackson directed Captain Boswell, his chief engineer, to accompany General Hill and then, turning to the front, rode up the plank road, passing quickly through the ranks of the 18th North Carolina of Lane's Brigade, Two or three hundred yards eastward, the general halted, for the ringing of axes and the words of command were distinctly audible in the enemy's lines. While the Confederates were reforming, Hooker's reserves had reached the front, and Barry's regiments on the Fairview Heights, using their bayonets and tin plates for entrenching tools, piling up the earth with their hands and hacking down the brushwood with their knives, were endeavoring in desperate haste to provide some shelter, however slight, against the rush that they knew was about to come. After a few minutes, becoming impatient for the advance of Hill's division, Jackson turned and retraced his steps towards his own lines. General, said an officer who was with him, you should not expose yourself so much. There is no danger, sir. The enemy is routed. Go back and tell General Hill to press on. Once more, when he was only 60 or 80 yards from where the 18th North Carolina were standing in the trees, he drew rein and listened. The whole party, generals, staff officers, and couriers, hidden in the deep shadows of the silent woods. At this moment, a single rifle shot rang out with startling suddenness. A detachment of Federal infantry, groping their way through the thickets, had approached the southern lines. The skirmishers on both sides were now engaged, and the lines of battle in rear became keenly on the alert. Some mounted officers galloped hastily back to their commands. The sound startled the Confederate soldiers, and an officer of the 18th North Carolina, seeing a group of strange horsemen riding towards him through the darkness, for Jackson, hearing the firing, had turned back to his own lines, gave the order to fire. The volley was fearfully effective. Men and horses fell dead and dying on the narrow track. Jackson himself received three bullets, one in the right hand and two in the left arm, cutting the main artery and crushing the bone below the shoulder. And as the reins dropped upon his neck, little Sorrel, frantic with terror, plunged into the wood and rushed towards the Federal lines. An overhanging bow struck his rider violently in the face, tore off his cap, and nearly unhorsed him. But recovering his seat, he managed to seize the bridle with his bleeding hand and turned into the road. Here, Captain Wilborn, one of his staff officers, succeeded in catching the reins, and, as the horse stopped, Jackson leaned forward and fell into his arms. Captain Hotchkiss, who had just returned from a reconnaissance, rode off to find Dr. McGuire, while Captain Wilborn, with a small penknife, ripped up the sleeve of the wounded arm. As he was doing so, General Hill, who had himself been exposed to the fire of the North Carolinians, reached the scene and, throwing himself from his horse, pulled off Jackson's gauntlets, which were full of blood, and bandaged the shattered arm with a handkerchief. General, he said, are you much hurt? I think I am, was the reply, and all my wounds are from my own men. I believe my right arm is broken. To all questions put to him, he answered in a perfectly calm and self-possessed tone. And, although he spoke no word of complaint, he was manifestly growing weaker. 
It seemed impossible to move him, and yet it was absolutely necessary that he should be carried to the rear. He was still in front of his own lines, and, even as Hill was speaking, two of the enemy's skirmishers, emerging from the thicket, halted within a few paces of the little group. Hill, turning quietly to his escort, said, Take charge of those men, and two orderlies, springing forward, seized the rifles of the astonished Federals. Lieutenant Morrison, Jackson's aide-de-camp, who had gone down the road to Reconnoitre, now reported that he had seen a section of artillery unlimbering close at hand. Hill gave orders that the general should be at once removed, and that no one should tell the men that he was wounded. Jackson, lying on Hill's breast, opened his eyes and said, Tell them simply that you have a wounded Confederate officer. Lieutenant Smith and Morrison and Captain Lay of Hill's staff now lifted him to his feet, and with their aid he walked a few steps through the trees. But hardly had they gained the road when the Federal batteries along their whole front opened a terrible fire of grape and canister. The storm of bullets, tearing through the foliage, was fortunately directed too high, and the three young officers, laying the general down by the roadside, endeavored to shield him by lying between him and the deadly hail. The earth round them was torn up by the shot, covering them with dust. Boughs fell from the trees, and fire flashed from the flints and gravel of the roadway. Once Jackson attempted to rise, but Smith threw his arms over him, holding him down and saying, General, you must be still. It will cost you your life to rise. After a few minutes, however, the enemy's gunners, changing from canister to shell, mercifully increased their range, and again, as the Confederate infantry came hurrying to the front, their wounded leader, supported by strong arms, was lifted to his feet. Anxious that the men should not recognize him, Jackson turned aside into the wood and slowly and painfully dragged himself through the undergrowth. As he passed along, General Fender, whose brigade was then pushing forward, asked Smith who it was that was wounded. A Confederate officer was the reply. But as they came nearer, Fender, despite the darkness, saw that it was Jackson. Springing from his horse, he hurriedly expressed his regret and added that his lines were so much disorganized by the enemy's artillery that he feared it would be necessary to fall back. At this moment, says an eyewitness, the scene was a fearful one. The air seemed to be alive with the shriek of shells and the whistling of bullets. Horses riderless and mad with fright dashed in every direction. Hundreds left the ranks and hurried to the rear and the groans of the wounded and dying mingled with the wild shouts of others to be led again to the assault. Almost fainting as he was from loss of blood, desperately wounded, and in the midst of this awful uproar, Jackson's heart was unshaken. The words of Fender seemed to rouse him to life. Pushing aside those who supported him, he raised himself to his full height and answered feebly, but distinctly enough to be heard above the din. "'You must hold your ground,' General Fender, you must hold out to the last, sir. His strength was now completely gone, and he asked to be allowed to lie down. His staff officers, however, refused assent. The shells were still crashing through the forest, and a litter having been brought up by Captain Lay, he was carried slowly towards Dowdall's tavern. But before they were free of the tangled wood, one of the stretcher bearers, struck by a shot in the arm, let go the handle. Jackson fell violently to the ground on his wounded side. His agony must have been intense, and for the first time he was heard to groan. Smith sprang to his side, and as he raised his head, a bright beam of moonlight made its way through the thick foliage and rested upon his white and lacerated face. The aide-de-camp was startled by its great pallor and stillness, and cried out, "'General, are you seriously hurt?' "'No, Mr. Smith.' Don't trouble yourself about me, he replied quietly, and added some words about winning the battle first and attending to the wounded afterwards. He was again placed upon the litter and carried a few hundred yards, still followed by the federal shells, to where his medical director was waiting with an ambulance. Dr. McGuire knelt down beside him and said, I hope you are not badly hurt, General. He replied very calmly but feebly, 
I am badly injured, doctor. I fear I am dying. After a pause, he went on. I am glad you have come. I think the wound in my shoulder is still bleeding. The bandages were readjusted, and he was lifted into the ambulance, where Colonel Crutchfield, who had also been seriously wounded, was already lying. Whiskey and morphia were administered, and by the light of pine torches, carried by a few soldiers, he was slowly driven through the fields where Hooker's right had so lately fled before his impetuous onset. All was done that could ease his sufferings, but some jolting of the ambulance over the rough road was unavoidable. And yet, writes Dr. McGuire, his uniform politeness did not forsake him, even in these most trying circumstances. His complete control, too, over his mind, enfeebled as it was by loss of blood and pain, was wonderful. His suffering was intense. His hands were cold, his skin clammy. But not a groan escaped him, not a sign of suffering, except the light corrugation of the brow, the fixed, rigid face, the thin lips, so tightly compressed that the impression of the teeth could be seen through them. Except these, he controlled by his iron will all evidence of emotion, and, more difficult than this even, he controlled that disposition to restlessness which many of us have observed upon the battlefield as attending great loss of blood. Nor was he forgetful of others. He expressed very feelingly his sympathy for Crutchfield, and once, when the latter groaned aloud, he directed the ambulance to stop and requested me to see if something could be done for his relief. After reaching the hospital, he was carried to a tent and placed in bed, covered with blankets, and another drink of whiskey and water given him. Two hours and a half elapsed before sufficient reaction took place to warrant an examination, and at two o'clock on Sunday morning, I informed him that chloroform would be given him. I told him also that amputation would probably be required, and asked, if it was found necessary, whether it should be done at once. He replied promptly, yes, certainly, Dr. McGuire. Do for me whatever you think best. Chloroform was then administered, and the left arm amputated about two inches below the shoulder. Throughout the whole of the operation, and until all the dressings were applied, he continued insensible. About half past three, Colonel, then Major, Pendleton, arrived at the hospital. He stated that General Stewart was in command and had sent him to see the general. At first, I declined to permit an interview, but Pendleton urged that the safety of the army and success of the cause depended upon his seeing him. When he entered the tent, the general said, Well, Major, I am glad to see you. I thought you were killed. Pendleton briefly explained the position of affairs, gave Stuart's message, and asked what should be done. Jackson was at once interested and asked in his quick way several questions. When they were answered, he remained silent. Evidently trying to think, he contracted his brow, set his mouth, and for some moments lay obviously endeavoring to concentrate his thoughts. For a moment we believed he had succeeded, for his nostrils dilated and his eye flashed with his old fire. But it was only for a moment. His face relaxed again, and presently he answered, very feebly and sadly, I don't know. I can't tell. Say to General Stewart he must do what he thinks best. Soon after this, he slept. So, leaving behind him, struggling vainly against the oppression of his mortal hurt, the one man who could have completed the Confederate victory, Pendleton rode wearily through the night. Jackson's fall, at so critical a moment, just as the final blow was to be delivered, had proved a terrible disaster. Hill, who alone knew his intention of moving to the White House, had been wounded by a fragment of shell as he rode back to lead his troops. Boswell, who had been ordered to point out the road, had been killed by the same volley which struck down his chief and the subordinate generals, without instructions and without guides, with their men in disorder and the enemy's artillery playing fiercely on the forest, had hesitated to advance. Hill, remaining in a litter near the line of battle, had sent for Stuart, 
The cavalry commander, however, was at some distance from the field. Late in the evening, finding it impossible to employ his command at the front, he had been detached by Jackson, a regiment of infantry supporting him to take and hold Ely's Ford. He had already arrived within view of a federal camp established at that point and was preparing to charge the enemy under cover of the night when Hill's messenger recalled him. When Stuart reached the front, he found the troops still halted, Rhodes and Colston reforming on the open fields near Dowdall's Tavern, the light division deployed within the forest, and the generals anxious for their own security. So far, the attack had been completely successful, but Lee's lack of strength prevented the full accomplishment of his design. Had Longstreet been present, with Pickett and Hood to lead his splendid infantry, the Third Corps and the Twelfth would have been so hardly pressed that Chancellorsville, Hazel Grove, and the White House would have fallen an easy prize to Jackson's bayonets. Anderson, with four small brigades, was powerless to hold the force confronting him and marching rapidly northwards. Sickles had reached Hazel Grove before Jackson fell. Here, Pleasanton, with his batteries, was still in position, and Hooker had not yet lost his head. As soon as Burney's and Whipple's divisions had come up, forming in columns of brigades behind the guns, Sickles was ordered to assail the enemy's right flank and check his advance. Just before midnight, the attack was made, in two lines of battle, supported by strong columns. The night was very clear and still, the moon nearly full, threw enough light into the woods to facilitate the advance, and the tracks leading northwest served as lines of direction. The attack, however, although gallantly made, gained no material advantage. The preliminary movements were plainly audible to the Confederates, and Lane's brigade, most of which was now south of the Plank Road, had made every preparation to receive it. Against troops lying down in the woods, the Federal artillery, although fifty or sixty guns were in action, made but small impression, and the dangers of a night attack, made upon troops who are expecting it, and whose morale is unaffected, were forcibly illustrated. The confusion in the forest was very great. A portion of the assailing force, losing direction, fell foul of Barry's division at the foot of the Fairview Heights which had not been informed of the movement, and at least two regiments, fired into from front and rear, broke up in panic. Some part of the log breastworks which Jackson's advance lines had occupied were recaptured, but not a single one of the assailants, except as prisoners, reached the plank road. And yet the attack was an exceedingly well-timed stroke, and as such, although the losses were heavy, had a very considerable effect on the issue of the day's fighting. It showed, or seemed to show, that the Federals were still in good heart, that they were rapidly concentrating, and that the Confederates might be met by vigorous counterstrokes. The fact, said Stuart in his official dispatch, that the attack was made, and at night, made me apprehensive of a repetition of it. So, while Jackson slept through the hours of darkness that should have seen the consummation of his enterprise, his soldiers lay beside their arms, and the Federals, digging, felling, and building, constructed a new line of parapet, protected by abatis and strengthened by a long array of guns on the slopes of Fairview and Hazel Grove. The respite which the fall of the Confederate leader had brought them was not neglected. The fast-spreading panic was stayed. The First Army Corps, rapidly crossing the Rappahannock, secured the road to the White House, and Averill's division of cavalry reached Ely's Ford. End of section 63. Section 64 of Stonewall Jackson and the American Civil War. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Stonewall Jackson in the American Civil War by George 
Francis Robert Henderson. Chancellorsville continued. May 3rd. On the left, between Chancellorsville and the river, where a young federal colonel named Miles handled his troops with conspicuous skill, Lee's continuous attacks had been successfully repulsed, and at dawn, on the morning of May 3rd, the situation of the Union Army was far from unpromising. A gap of nearly two miles intervened between the Confederate wings, and within this gap, on the commanding heights of Hazel Grove and Fairview, the Federals were strongly entrenched. An opportunity for dealing a crushing counterblow, for holding one portion of Lee's army in check while the other was overwhelmed, appeared to present itself. The only question was whether the morale of the general and the men could be depended upon. In Stuart, however, Hooker had to deal with a soldier who was no unworthy successor of Stonewall Jackson, reluctantly abandoning the idea of a night attack. The cavalry general, fully alive to the exigencies of the situation, had determined to reduce the interval between himself and Lee, and during the night the artillery was brought up to the front and the batteries deployed wherever they could find room. Just before the darkness began to lift, orders were received from Lee that the assault was to be made as early as possible, and the right wing, winging round in order to come abreast of the center, became hotly engaged. Away to the southeast, across the hills held by the Federals, came the responding thunder of Lee's guns and 40,000 infantry advancing through the woods against front and flank, enveloped in a circle of fire, a stronghold which was held by over 60,000 muskets. It is unnecessary to describe minutely the events of the morning. The Federal troops, such as were brought into action, fought well, but Jackson's tremendous attack had already defeated Hooker. Before Sickles made his night attack from Hazel Grove, he had sent orders from Sedwick to move at once, occupy Fredericksburg, seize the heights, and march westward by the plank road, and, at the same time, he had instructed his engineers to select and fortify a position about a mile in rear of Chancellorsville. So, when Stuart pressed forward, not only had his new position been occupied by the 1st and 5th Army Corps, but the troops hitherto in possession of Hazel Grove were already evacuating their entrenchments. These dispositions sufficiently attest the demoralization of the Federal commander. As the historian of the Army of the Potomac puts it, the movement to be executed by Sedgwick was precisely one of those movements which, according as they are wrought out, may be either the height of wisdom or the height of folly. Its successful accomplishment certainly promised very brilliant results. It is easy to see how seriously Lee's safety would be compromised if, while engaged with Hooker in front, he should suddenly find a powerful force assailing his rear and grasping already his direct line of communication with Richmond. But if, on the other hand, Lee should be able by any slackness on the part of his opponent to engage him in front with a part of his force, while he should turn swiftly round to assail the isolated moving column, it is obvious that he would be able to repulse or destroy that column, and then, by a vigorous return, meet or attack his antagonist's main body. In the successful execution of this plan, not only was Sedgwick bound to the most energetic action, but Hooker also was engaged by every consideration of honor and duty to so act as to make the dangerous task he had assigned to Sedgwick possible. But so far from aiding his subordinate by a heavy counterattack on Lee's front, Hooker deliberately abandoned the Hazel Grove assailant, which, keeping asunder this, he divided his own army into two portions of which the rear, occupying the new position, was actually forbidden to reinforce the front. It is possible that Hooker contemplated an early retreat of his whole force to the second position. If so, Lee and Stuart were too quick for him. The cavalry commander, as soon as it became light and the hills and undulations of the wilderness emerged from the shadows, 
immediately recognized the importance of Hazel Grove. The hill was quickly seized. Thirty pieces of artillery established on the crest enfiladed the Federal batteries. Facing west, on the heights of Fairview, and the brigade on Stuart's extreme right was soon in touch with the troops directed by General Lee. Then, against the three sides of the Federal position, the battle raged. From the south and southeast came Anderson and McLaws, the batteries unlimbering on every eminence, and the infantry hitherto held back, attacking with the vigor which their gallant commanders knew so well how to inspire. And from the west, formed in three lines, Hill's division to the front, came the Second Army Corps. The men knew by this time that the leader whom they trusted beyond all others had been struck down, that he was lying wounded, helpless, far away and rear. Yet his spirit was still with them. Stuart, galloping along the ranks, recalled him with ringing words to their memories, and as the bugles sounded the onset, it was with a cry of, Remember Jackson! that his soldiers rushed fiercely upon the Federal breastworks. The advanced line, within the forest, was taken at the first rush, the second at the foot of the Fairview Heights, protected by a swampy stream, a broad belt of abatis, and with thirty guns on the hill behind, proved far more formidable, and Hill's division was forced back. But Rhodes and Colston were in close support. The fight was speedily renewed, and then came charge and countercharge, the storm of the parapets, the rally of the defenders, the rush with the bayonet, and mowing down men like grass, the fearful sweep of case and canister. Twice the Confederates were repulsed, twice they reformed, brigade mingled with brigade, regiment with regiment, and charged again in the teeth of the thirty guns. On both sides, ammunition began to fail. The brushwood took fire. The ground became hot beneath the foot, and many wounded perished miserably in the flames. Yet still, with the tangled abatis dividing the opposing lines, the fight went on, both sides struggling fiercely, the Federals with the advantage of position, the Confederates of numbers, for Hooker refused to reinforce his gallant troops. At length, the guns which Stuart had established on Hazel Grove, crossing their fire with those of McLaws and Anderson, gained the upper hand over the Union batteries. The storm of shell, sweeping the Fairview Plateau, took the breastworks in reverse. The Northern infantry, after five hours of such hot battle as few fields have witnessed, began sullenly to yield, and as Stuart, leading the last charge, leapt his horse over the parapet, the works were evacuated, and the tattered colors of the Confederates waved in triumph on the hill. The scene, says a staff officer, can never be effaced from the minds of those that witnessed it. The troops were pressing forward with all the ardor and enthusiasm of combat. The white smoke of musketry fringed the front of battle, while the artillery on the hills in rear shook the earth with its thunder and filled the air with the wild shrieking of the shells that plunged into the masses of the retreating foe. To add greater horror and sublimity to the scene, the Chancellorsville house and the woods surrounding it were wrapped in flames. It was then that General Lee rode to the front of his advancing battalions. His presence was the signal for one of those uncontrollable outbursts of enthusiasm which none can appreciate who have not witnessed them. The fierce soldiers, with their faces blackened with the smoke of battle, the wounded crawling with feeble limbs from the fury of the devouring flames, all seemed possessed of a common impulse, one long, unbroken cheer in which the feeble cry of those who lay helpless on the earth blended with the strong voices of those who still fought, hailed the presence of the victorious chief. His first care was for the wounded of both armies, and he was among the foremost at the burning mansion, where some of them lay. But at that moment, when the transports of his troops were drowning the roar of battle with acclamations, a note was brought to him from General Jackson. 
It was handed to him as he sat on his horse near the Chancellorville house. And unable to open it with his gauntleted hands, he passed it to me with directions to read it to him. I shall never forget the look of pain and anguish that passed over his face as he listened. In a voice broken with emotion, he bade me say to General Jackson that the victory was his. I do not know how others may regard this incident, but for myself, as I gave expression to the thoughts of his exalted mind, I forgot the genius that won the day in my reverence for the generosity that refused its glory. Lee's reply ran, General, I have just received your note, informing me that you are wounded. I cannot express my regret at the occurrence. Could I have directed events, I should have chosen for the good of the country to be disabled in your stead. I congratulate you upon the victory, which is due to your skill and energy. Very respectfully, your obedient servant, R. E. Lee, General. Such was the tribute, not the less valued that it was couched in no exaggerated terms, which was brought to the bedside in the quiet hospital. Jackson was almost alone. As the sound of cannon and musketry, borne across the forest, grew gradually louder, he had ordered all those who had remained with him, except Mr. Smith, to return to the battlefield and attend to their different duties. His side, injured by his fall from the litter, gave him much pain, but his thoughts were still clear and his speech coherent. General Lee, he said, when his aide-de-camp read to him the commander-in-chief's brief words, is very kind, but he should give the praise to God. During the day, the pain gradually ceased. The general grew brighter, and from those who visited the hospital, he inquired minutely about the battle and the troops engaged. When conspicuous instances of courage were related, his face lit up with enthusiasm, and he uttered his usual, good, good, with unwanted energy. When the gallant behavior of his old command was alluded to, some day, he said, the men of that brigade will be proud to say to their children, I was one of the Stonewall Brigade. He disclaimed all right of his own to the name Stonewall. It belongs to the brigade and not to me. That night he slept well and was free from pain. Meanwhile, the Confederate army, resting on the heights of Chancellorsville, preparatory to an attack upon Hooker's second stronghold, had received untoward news. Sedgwick, at eleven o'clock in the morning, had carried Mary's Hill and, driving early before him, was moving up the plank road. Wilcox's brigade of Anderson's division, then at Banks Ford, was ordered to retard the advance of the hostile column. McLaws was detached to Salem Church. The Second Army Corps and the rest of Anderson's division remained to hold Hooker in check, and for the moment operations at Chancellorville were suspended. McLaws deploying his troops in the forest, 250 yards from a wide expanse of cleared ground, pushed his skirmishers forward to the edge, and awaited the attack of a superior force. Reserving his fire to close quarters, its effect was fearful. But the Federals pushed forward. A schoolhouse occupied as an advanced post was captured, and at this point Sedgwick was within an ace of breaking through. His second line, however, had not yet deployed, and a vigorous counterstroke delivered by two brigades drove back the whole of his leading division in great disorder. As night fell, the Confederates, careful not to expose themselves to the Union reserves, retired to the forest, and Sedgwick, like Hooker, abandoned all further idea of offensive action. May 4th. The next morning, Lee himself, with the three remaining brigades of Anderson, arrived upon the scene. Sedgwick, who had lost 5,000 men the preceding day, had fortified a position covering Banks Ford and occupied it with over 20,000 muskets. Lee, with the divisions of McLaws, Anderson, and Early, was slightly stronger. The attack was delayed, for the Federals held strong ground. Difficult to reconnoitre, but once begun, the issue was soon decided. Sailed in front and flanks, with no help coming from Hooker, and only a single bridge at Banks Ford and rear, the Federals rapidly gave ground. Darkness, however, 
intensified by a thick fog, made pursuit difficult, and Sedgwick recrossed the river with many casualties, but in good order. During these operations, that is, from four o'clock on Sunday afternoon until after midnight on Monday, Hooker had not moved a single man to his subordinate's assistance. So extraordinary a situation has seldom been seen in war. An army of 60,000 men, strongly fortified, was held in check for six and thirty hours by 20,000, while not seven miles away raged a battle on which the whole fate of the campaign depended. Lee and Jackson had made no false estimate of Hooker's incapacity. Sedgwick's Army Corps had suffered so severely in men and in morale that it was not available for immediate service, even had it been transferred to Chancellorsville, and Lee was now free to concentrate his whole force against the main body of the Federal Army. His men, notwithstanding their extraordinary exertions, were confident of victory. May 5th. As I sheltered myself, says an eyewitness, in a little farmhouse on the plank road, the brigades of Anderson's division came splashing through the mud in wild, tumultuous spirits, singing, shouting, jesting, heedless of soaking rags, drenched to the skin, and burning again to mingle in the mad revelry of battle. But it was impossible to push forward, for a violent rainstorm burst upon the wilderness. In the spongy soil, saturated with the deluge, absolutely precluded all movement across country. Hooker, who had already made preparations for retreat, took advantage of the weather, and as soon as darkness set in, put his army in motion for the bridges. May 6th. By 8 o'clock on the morning of the 6th, the whole force had crossed, and when the Confederate patrols pushed forward, Lee found that his victim had escaped. The Army of the Potomac returned to its old camp on the hills above Fredericksburg, and Lee reoccupied his position on the opposite ridge. Stoneman, who had scoured the whole country to within a few miles of Richmond, returned to Kelly's Ford on May 8th. The raid had effected nothing. The damage done to the railroads and canals was repaired by the time the raiders had regained the Rappahannock. Lee's operation at Chancellorsville had not been affected in the very slightest degree by their presence in his rear, while Stoneman's absence had proved the ruin of the Federal Army. Jackson, who had been removed by the Commander-in-Chief's order to Mr. Chandler's house near Gurney Station on the morning of May 5th, was asked what he thought of Hooker's plan of campaign. His reply was, It was in the main a good conception, an excellent plan. But he should not have sent away his cavalry. That was his great blunder. It was that which enabled me to turn him, without us being aware of it, and to take him in the rear. Had he kept his cavalry with him, his plan would have been a very good one. This was not his only comment on the great battle. Among other things, he said that he intended to cut the Federals off from the United States Ford, and, taking a position between them and the river, obliged them to attack him, adding, with a smile, my men sometimes fail to drive the enemy from a position, but they always fail to drive us away. He spoke of General Rhodes and alluded in high terms to his splendid behavior in the attack on Howard. He hoped he would be promoted, and he said that promotion should be made at once upon the field so as to act as an incentive to gallantry in others. He spoke of Colonel Willis, who had commanded the skirmishers, and praised him very highly and referred most feelingly to the death of Paxton, the commander of the Stonewall Brigade, and of Captain Boswell, his chief engineer. In speaking of his own share in the victory, he said, Our movement was a great success. I think the most successful military movement of my life, but I expect to receive far more credit for it than I deserve. Most men will think I planned it all from the first, but it was not so. I simply took advantage of circumstances as they were presented to me, in the providence of God. I feel that his hand led me. Let us give him the glory. It must always be an interesting matter of speculation what the result would have been had Jackson accomplished his design on the night he fell. 
of moving a large part of his command up the White House Road and barring the only line of retreat left open to the Federals. Hooker, it is argued, had two corps in position which had been hardly engaged, the second and the fifth, and another, the first, under Reynolds, was coming up. Of these 25,000 men might possibly, could they have been maneuvered in the forest, have been sent to drive Jackson back, and undoubtedly, to those who think more of numbers than of human nature, of the momentum of the mass rather than the mental equilibrium of the general. The fact that a superior force of comparatively fresh troops was at Hooker's disposal will be sufficient to put the success of the Confederates out of court. Yet the question will always suggest itself, would not the report that a victorious enemy of unknown strength was pressing forward in the darkness of the night towards the only line of retreat have so demoralized the federal commander and the federal soldiers already shaken by the overthrow of the 11th Army Corps, that they would have thought only of securing their own safety? Would Hooker, whose tactics the next day, after he had had the night given him in which to recover his senses, were so inadequate, have done better if he had received no respite? Would the soldiers of the three Army Corps not yet engaged, who had been witnesses of the rout of Howard's divisions, have fared better? when they heard the triumphant yells of the advancing Confederates than the hapless Germans? The wounding of Jackson, says a most careful historian of the battle, himself a participator in the Union disaster, was a most fortunate circumstance for the Army of the Potomac. At nine o'clock, the capture or destruction of a large part of the army seemed inevitable. There was, at the time, great uncertainty and a feeling akin to panic prevailing among the Union forces round Chancellorsville. And when we consider the position of the troops at this moment, and how many important battles have been won by trivial flank attacks, how rich a pants, attacking through the forest, with a single brigade ruined the Austrians at Hoholinden, we must admit that the Northern Army was in great peril when Jackson arrived within 1,000 yards of its vital point, the White House, with 20,000 men and 50 cannon. He must be a great leader indeed, who, when his flank is suddenly rolled up and his line of retreat threatened, preserves sufficient coolness to devise a general counterstroke. Jackson had proved himself equal to such a situation at Cedar Run, but it is seldom in these circumstances that Providence sides with the big battalions. The Federal losses in the Six Days' battles were heavy, over 12,000 at Chancellorsville and 4,700 at Fredericksburg, Salem Church and Banks Ford, a total of 17,287. The Army lost 13 guns, and nearly 6,000 officers and men were reported either captured or missing. The casualties were distributed as follows. First Army Corps, 135. Second Army Corps, 1,925. Third Army Corps, 4,119. Fifth Army Corps, 700. Sixth Army Corps, 4,590. Eleventh Army Corps, 2,412. Twelfth Army Corps, 2,822. Pleasanton's Cavalry Brigade, 141. 16,844. The Confederate losses were hardly less severe. The killed and wounded were as under 2nd Army Corps, A.P. Hill's Division, 2,583, Rhodes Division, 2,178, Colston's Division, 1,868, Early's Division, 851, Anderson's Division, 1,180, McLaws Division, 1,379, Artillery, 227, Cavalry, 11, Prisoners, estimated, 2,000, 12,227. But a mere statement of the casualties by no means represents the comparative loss of the opposing forces. 
Victory does not consist in merely killing and maiming a few thousand men. This is the visible result. It is the invisible that tells. The Army of the Potomac, when it retreated across the Rappahannock, was far stronger in mere numbers than the Army of Northern Virginia, but in reality it was far weaker, for the morale of the survivors, and of the general who led them, was terribly affected. That of the Confederates, on the other hand, had been sensibly elevated, and it is morale, not numbers, which is the strength of armies. What, after all, was the loss of 12,200 soldiers to the Confederacy? In that first week of May, there were probably 20,000 conscripts in different camps of instruction, more than enough to recruit the depleted regiments to full strength. Nor did the slaughter of Chancellorsville diminish to any appreciable degree the vast hosts of the Union. And yet, the Army of the Potomac had lost more than all the efforts of the government could replace. The Army of Virginia, on the other hand, had acquired the superiority of spirit, which was ample compensation for the sacrifice which had been made. It is hardly too much to say that Lee's force had gained from the victory an increase of strength equivalent to a whole army corps of 80,000 men, while that of his opponent had been proportionately diminished. Why, then, was there no pursuit? It has been asserted that Lee was so crippled by his losses at Chancellorsville that he was unable to resume operations against Hooker for a whole month. This explanation of his inactivity can hardly be accepted. On June 16th and 18th, 1815, at Cotter Bra and Waterloo, the Anglo-Dutch army, little larger than that of northern Virginia, lost 17,000 men. And yet on the 19th, Wellington was marching in pursuit of the French, nor did he halt until he arrived within sight of Paris. On August 28th, 29th, and 30th, 1862, at Groveden and the 2nd Manassas, Stonewall Jackson lost 4,000 officers and men, one-fifth of his force. But he was not left in rear when Lee invaded Maryland. Moreover, after he had defeated Sedgwick on the same night that Hooker was recrossing the Rappahannock, Lee was planning a final attack on the Federal entrenchments, and his disappointment was bitter when he learned that his enemy had escaped. If his men were capable of further efforts on that night, on the night of May 5th, they were capable of them the next day, and it was neither the ravages of battle nor the disorganization of the army that held the Confederates fast, but the deficiency of supplies, the damage done to the railways by Stoneman's horsemen, the weakness of the cavalry, and, principally, the hesitation of the government. After the victory of Chancellorsville, strong hopes of peace were entertained in the South. Before Hooker advanced, a large section of the Northern Democrats, despairing of ultimate success, had once more raised the cry that immediate separation was better than a hopeless contest involving such awful sacrifices, and it needed all Lincoln's strength to stem the tide of disaffection. The existence of this despondent feeling was well known to the Southern statesmen, and to such an extent did they count upon its growth and increase that they had overlooked altogether the importance of improving a victory should the army be successful. So now, when the chance had come, they were neither ready to forward such an enterprise, nor could they make up their minds to depart from their passive attitude. But to postpone all idea of counterstroke until some indefinite period is as fatal as strategy as in tactics by no means an uncommon policy. It has been responsible for the loss of a thousand opportunities. Had not politics intervened, a vigorous pursuit, not necessarily involving an immediate attack, but drawing Hooker, as Pope had been drawn in the preceding August, into an unfavorable situation, before his army had had time to recover, would have probably been initiated. It may be questioned, however, whether General Lee even when Longstreet and his divisions joined him, would have been so strong as he had been at the end of April. None felt more deeply than the commander-in-chief that the absence of Jackson was an irreparable misfortune. Give him my affectionate regards. 
he said to an aide-de-camp who was riding to the hospital. Tell him to make haste and get well, and come back to me as soon as he can. He has lost his left arm, but I have lost my right. Any victory, he wrote privately, would be dear at such a price. I know not how to replace him. His words were prophetic. Exactly two months after Chancellorsville, the armies met once more in the clash of battle. During the first two days, on the rolling plain round Gettysburg, a village of Pennsylvania, four Federal Army Corps were beaten in succession. But ere the sun set on the third, Lee had to admit defeat. And yet his soldiers had displayed the same fiery courage and stubborn persistence which had carried them victorious through the wilderness. But his right arm had not yet been replaced. If, he said after the war, with unaccustomed emphasis, I had had Jackson at Gettysburg, I should have won the battle, and a complete victory there would have resulted in the establishment of Southern independence. It was not to be. Chancellorsville, where 130,000 men were defeated by 60,000, is up to a certain point as much the tactical masterpiece of the 19th century as was Luthen of the 18th. But, splendid triumph as it was, the battle bore no abiding fruits, and the reason seems very clear. The voice that would have urged pursuit was silent. Jackson's fall left Lee alone, bereft of his alter ego, with none save Stuart, to whom he can entrust the execution of those daring and delicate maneuvers his inferior numbers rendered necessary, with none on whose resource and energy he could implicitly rely. Who shall say how far his own resolution had been animated and confirmed at other crises by the prompting and presence of the kindred spirit? They supplemented each other, said Davis, and together, with any fair opportunity, they were absolutely invincible. Many a fierce battle still lay before the Army of Northern Virginia. Marvelous was the skill and audacity with which Lee maneuvered his ragged regiments in the face of overwhelming odds. Fierce and unyielding were the soldiers, but with Stonewall Jackson's death, the impulse of victory died away. May 7th. It is needless to linger over the closing scene at Gurney's station. For some days there was hope that the patient would recover. Pneumonia attributed to his fall from the litter, as he was borne from the field, supervened, and he gradually began to sink. On the Thursday, his wife and child arrived from Richmond, but he was then almost too weak for conversation, and on Sunday morning, it was evident that the end was near. May 10th. As yet, he had scarcely realized his condition. If, he said, it was God's will, he was ready to go but he believed that there was still work for him to do, and that his life would be preserved to do it. At eleven o'clock, Mrs. Jackson knelt by his side and told him that he could not live beyond the evening. You are frightened, my child, he replied. Death is not so near. I may yet get well. She fell upon the bed, weeping bitterly, and told him again that there was no hope. After a moment's pause, he asked her to call Dr. McGuire. Doctor, he said. Anna tells me I am to die today. Is it so? When he was answered, he remained silent for a moment or two, as if in intense thought, and then quietly replied, Very good, very good. It is all right. About noon, when Major Pendleton came into the room, he asked, Who is preaching at headquarters today? He was told that Mr. Lacey was, and that the whole army was praying for him. Thank God, he said. They are very kind to me. Already his strength was fast ebbing, and although his face brightened when his baby was brought to him, his mind had begun to wander. Now he was on the battlefield, giving orders to his men, now at home in Lexington, now at prayers in the camp. Occasionally his senses came back to him, and about half past one he was told that he had but two hours to live. Again he answered feebly but firmly, Very good. It is all right. These were almost his last coherent words. For some time he lay unconscious, and then suddenly he cried out, Order A.P. Hill to prepare for action. Pass the infantry to the front. Tell Major Hawks, then stopped, leaving the sentence unfinished. Once more he was silent. But a little while after he said very quietly and clearly, 
Let us cross over the river and rest under the shade of the trees, and the soul of the great captain passed into the peace of God. Note 1 from General Lee's Letter Book Lexington, Virginia, 25th January, 1866 Mrs. T.J. Jackson My dear Mrs. Jackson, Dr. Brown handed me your note of the ninth, when in Richmond on business, connected with Washington College. I have delayed replying since my return, hoping to have sufficient time to comply with your request. Last night I received a note from Mrs. Brown, enclosing one from Dr. Dabney, stating that the immediate return of his manuscript was necessary. I have not been able to open it, and when I read it when you were here... It was for the pleasure of the narrative, with no view of remark or correction, and I took no memoranda of what seemed to be errors. I have not thought of them since, and do not know that I can now recall them, and certainly have no desire that my opinions should be adopted in preference to Dr. Dabney's. I am, however, unable at this time to specify the battles to which my remark particularly refers. The opinion of General Jackson in reference to the propriety of attacking the Federal Army under General McClellan at Harrison's Landing is not, I think, correctly stated. Upon my arrival there, the day after General Longstreet and himself, I was disappointed that no opportunity for striking General McClellan on the retreat or in his then position had occurred and went forward with General Jackson alone on foot and after a careful reconnaissance of the whole line and position, he certainly stated to me, at that time, the impropriety of attacking. I am misrepresented at the Battle of Chancellorsville in proposing an attack in front the first evening of our arrival. On the contrary, I decided against it, and stated to General Jackson we must attack on our left as soon as practicable, and the necessary movement of the troops began immediately. In consequence of a report received about that time from General Fitzhugh Lee describing the position of the Federal Army and the roads which he held with his cavalry leading to its rear, General Jackson, after some inquiry concerning the roads leading to the furnace, undertook to throw his command entirely in Hooker's rear, which he accomplished with equal skill and boldness, the rest of the army being moved to the left flank to connect with him as he advanced. I think there is some mistake, too, of a regiment of infantry being sent by him to the ford on the Rapidan, as described by Dr. Dabney. The cavalry was ordered to make such a demonstration. General Stuart had proceeded to that part of the field to cooperate in General Jackson's movement, and I always supposed it was his dismounted cavalry. As well as I now recollect, Something is said by Dr. Dabney as to General Jackson's opinion as to the propriety of delivering battle at Sharpsburg. When he came upon the field, having preceded his troops and learned my reasons for offering battle, he emphatically concurred with me. When I determined to withdraw across the Potomac, he also concurred, but said then, in view of all the circumstances, it was better to have fought the battle in Maryland than to have left it without a struggle. After crossing the Potomac, General Jackson was charged with the command of the rear, and he designated the brigades of infantry to support Pendleton's batteries. I believe General McClellan had been so crippled at Sharpsburg that he could not follow the Confederate army into Virginia immediately, but General Stuart was ordered, after crossing the Potomac, to recross at once at Williamsport, threaten his right flank, and observe his movements. Near daylight the next morning, General Pendleton reported to me the occurrence at Shepherdstown the previous evening and stated that he had made a similar report to General Jackson, who was lying near me on the same field. From his statement, I thought it possible that the Federal Army might be attempting to follow us, and I sent at once to General Jackson to say that, in that event, I would attack it, that he must return with his whole command if necessary that I had sent to Longstreet to countermarch the rest of the army, and that upon his joining me, unless I heard from him to the contrary, I should move with it to his support. General Jackson went back with Hill's division, General Pendleton accompanying him, and soon drove the Federals into Maryland with loss. His report, which I received on my way towards the river, 
relieved my anxiety, and the order of the march of the troops was again resumed. I have endeavored to be as brief as possible in my statement, and with the single object of calling Dr. Dabney's attention to the points referred to, that he may satisfy himself as to the correctness of his own statements, and this has been done solely in compliance with your request. Other points may have attracted my attention in the perusal of the narrative, but I cannot now recall them, and do not know that those which have occurred to me are of importance. I wish I could do anything to give real assistance, for I am very anxious that his work should be perfect. With feelings of great esteem and regard, I am, very truly yours, signed, R. E. Lee. The production of this letter is due to the kindness of Dr. Henry A. White and of R. E. Lee, Esquire, of Washington, youngest son of General Lee. Note 2. The following details communicated to the author by one of Lee's generals as to the formations of the Confederate infantry will be found interesting. Our brigades were usually formed of four or five regiments, each regiment composed of ten companies. Troops furnished by the same state were, as far as possible, brigaded together in order to stimulate state pride and a spirit of healthy emulation. The regiment was formed for attack in line too deep, covered by skirmishers. The number of skirmishers and the intervals between the men on the skirmish line depended altogether on the situation. Sometimes two companies were extended as skirmishers, sometimes one company, sometimes a certain number of men from several companies. In rear of the skirmishers, at a distance ranging from 300 to 150 paces, came the remainder of the regiment. When a regiment or a brigade advanced through a heavily wooded country, such as the wilderness, the point of direction was established, and the officers instructed to conform to the movements of the guide company, or guide regiment, as the case might be, the guide company or regiment governing both direction and alignment. The maintenance of direction under such circumstances was a very difficult matter. Our officers, however, were greatly assisted by the rank and file, as many of the latter were accomplished woodsmen and accustomed to hunt and shoot in the dense forests of the South. Each regiment, moreover, was provided with a right and a left general guide, men selected for their special aptitudes, being good judges of distance, and noted for their steadiness and skill in maintaining the direction. Then, again, the line of battle was greatly aided in maintaining the direction, by the fire of the skirmishers, and frequently the line would be formed with a flank resting on a trail or woods road, a ravine or water course, the flank regiment in such cases acting as the guide. At Chancellorsville, Jackson's divisions kept direction by the turnpike, both wings looking to the center. In advancing through thick woods, the skirmish line was almost invariably strengthened, and while the line of battle, covered by the skirmishers, advanced in too deep line, Bodies in rear usually marched in columns of fours, prepared to come by a forward into line, to the point where their assistance might be desired. I never saw the compass used in wood fighting. In all movements, to attack it was the universal custom for the brigade commander to assemble both field and company officers to the front and center, and instruct them particularly as to the purpose of the movement, the method in which it was to be carried out, the point of direction the guide regiment, the position of other brigades, etc., etc. Like action was also taken by the regimental commander when a regiment was alone. This precaution, I venture to think, is absolutely indispensable to an orderly and combined advance over any ground whatever, and, so far as my knowledge goes, was seldom omitted, except when haste was imperative, in the Army of Northern Virginia. Practical experience taught us that no movement should be permitted until every officer was acquainted with the object in view and had received his instructions. I may add that brigade and regimental commanders were most particular to secure their flanks and to keep contact with other troops by means of patrols, and, also, that in thick woods it was found to be a very great advantage if a few trustworthy men were detailed as orderlies to the regimental commander, for by this means he could most easily control the advance of his skirmishers and of his line of battle. N. H. Harris, 
General, Late Army of Northern Virginia. Note 3. Before the campaign of 1864, the theater of which embraced the region between the Rappahannock and Petersburg, including the wilderness, corps of sharpshooters, each 180 strong, were organized in many of the brigades of Lee's army. These light troops undertook the outpost, advanced, flanked, and rear guard duties. The men were carefully selected. They were trained judges of distance, skillful and enterprising on patrol, and first-rate marksmen, and their rifles were often fitted with telescopic sights. In order to increase their confidence in each other, they were subdivided into groups of fours, which messed and slept together, and were never separated in action. These corps did excellent service during the campaign of 1864. End of section 64. Section 65 of Stonewall Jackson and the American Civil War. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Ted Leinhart. Stonewall Jackson and the American Civil War by George Francis Robert Henderson. The Soldier and the Man, Part 1. To the mourning of a sore-stricken nation, Stonewall Jackson was carried to his rest. As the hearse passed to the capital, and the guns which had so lately proclaimed the victory of Chancellorville thundered forth their requiem to the hero of the fight, the streets of Richmond were thronged with a silent and weeping multitude. In the Hall of Representatives, surrounded by a guard of infantry, the body lay in state, and thither, in their thousands, from the president to the maimed soldier, from the generals of the valley army to wandering children born in their mother's arms, the people came to look their last upon the illustrious dead. The open coffin, placed before the speaker's chair, was draped in the Confederate standard. The state colors were furled along, the galleries, and the expression on the face, firm and resolute, as if the spirit of battle still lingered in the lifeless clay, was that of a great conqueror, wise in counsel, mighty in the strife. But as the evening drew on the darkened chamber, hung with deep mourning and resounding to the clash of arms, lost its somber and martial aspect, garlands of soft spring flowers, the tribute of the women of Virginia, rose high above the bier, and white pyramids of lilies the emblems of purity and meekness recalled the blameless life of the Christian soldier. From Richmond, the remains were conveyed to Lexington, and under the charge of the cadets, lay for the night in the lecture room of the Institute, which Jackson had quitted just two years before. The next morning he was buried, as he himself had wished, in the little cemetery above the town. Many were the mourners that stood around the grave, but they were few in number compared with those whose hearts were present on those silent hills. From the cities of the Atlantic coast to the far-off settlements of Texas, the news that Stonewall Jackson had fallen came as a stunning blow. The people sorrowed for him with no ordinary grief, not as a great man and a good who had done his duty and had gone to his reward, but as the pillar of their hopes and the sheet anchor of the Confederate cause. Nor will those familiar with the further history of the Civil War, from the disaster of Gettysburg to the surrender at Appomattox, question the truth of this mournful presage. The Army of Northern Virginia became a different and less manageable instrument after Chancellorsville. Over and over again, it failed to respond to the conceptions of its leader, and the failure was not due to the soldiers, but to the generals. Loyal and valiant as they were, of not one of his lieutenants could Lee say, as he had said of Jackson, quote, such an executive officer the sun never shone on. I have but to show him my design, and I know that if it can be done, it will be done. No need for me to send or watch him. Straight as the needle to the pole, he advances to the execution of my purpose, End quote. These words have been quoted as an epitome of Jackson's military character. He was essentially, says Swinton, an executive officer, 
And in that sphere, he was incomparable, but he was devoid of high mental parts and destitute of that power of planning a combination and of that calm, broad military intelligence which distinguished General Lee. And this verdict, except in the South, has been generally accepted, yet it rests on a most unsubstantial basis. Because Jackson knew so well how to obey, it is asserted that he was not well fitted for independent command. Because he could carry out orders to the letter, it is assumed that he was no master of strategy. Because his will was of iron, and his purpose, once fixed, never for a moment wavered, we are asked to believe that his mental scope was narrow. Because he was silent in counsel, not eager in expressing his ideas, and averse to argument, it is implied that his opinions on matters of great moment were not worth the hearing. Because he was shy and unassuming, because he betrayed neither in face nor bearing, save in the heat of battle, any unusual power or consciousness of power, it is hastily concluded that he was deficient in the initiative, the breadth, and the penetration, which are the distinguishing characteristics of great generals. In these pages, however, it has been made clear that Jackson's quiet demeanor concealed a vivid imagination, a fertile brain, and an extraordinary capacity for far-reaching combinations. After he had once made up his mind when and where to strike, it is true that his methods of war were very simple, and his blows those of a sledgehammer. But simplicity of design and vigor of execution are often marks of the very highest military ability. Genius, says Napier, is not extravagant. It is ardent, and it conceives great projects. But it knows beforehand how to attain the result. And it uses the simplest means, because its faculties are essentially calculating, industrious, and patient. It is creative, because its knowledge is vast. It is quick and peremptory, not because it is presumptuous, but because it is well prepared. And Swinton's verdict would have been approved by few of the soldiers of the Civil War. It was not the verdict of Lee. Significant indeed was the cry of the great Confederate, the soul of truth as of generosity, when Jackson was wounded. Could I have directed events, I should have chosen, for the good of the country, to have been disabled in your stead. It was not the verdict of the southern people. No man, it was said by one who knew them well, had so magnificent prospect before him as General Jackson. Whether he desired it or not, he could not have escaped being governor of Virginia, and also, in the opinion of competent judges, sooner or later president of the Confederacy. Nor was it the verdict of the foe. Stonewall Jackson, wrote General Howard, commanding the 11th Corps at Chancellorsville, was victorious. Even his enemies praise him. But providentially for us, it was the last battle he waged against the American Union. For in bold planning, in energy of execution, which he had the power to diffuse in indefatigable activity and moral ascendancy, he stood head and shoulders above his confreres, and after his death, General Lee could not replace him. It can hardly be questioned that, at the time of his death, Jackson was the leader most trusted by the Confederates and most dreaded by the Federals. His own soldiers, and with them the whole population of the South, believed him capable of any task, invincible except by fate. It never, indeed, fell to Jackson's lot to lead a great army or to plan a great campaign. The operations in the valley, although decisive in their results, were comparatively insignificant in respect both of the numbers employed and of the extent of the theater. Jackson was not wholly independent. His was but a secondary role, and he had to wait at every turn the orders and instructions of his superiors. His hand was never absolutely free. His authority did not reach beyond certain limits, and his operations were confined to one locality. He was never permitted to cross the border and carry the war into Africa, nor when he joined Lee before Richmond was the restraint removed. In the campaign against Pope and in the reduction of Harper's Ferry, he was certainly entrusted with tasks 
which led to a complete severance from the main body. But the severance was merely temporary. He was the most trusted of Lee's lieutenants, but he was only a lieutenant. He had never the same liberty of action as those of his contemporaries who rose to historic fame, as Lee himself, as Johnston or Beauregard, as Grant or Sherman or as Sheridan, and consequently he had never a real opportunity for revealing the height and breadth of his military genius. The Civil War was prolific of great leaders. The young American generals, inexperienced as they were in dealing with large armies, and compelled to improvise their tactics as they improvised their staff, displayed a talent for command such as soldiers more regularly trained could hardly have surpassed. Neither the deficiencies of their material nor the difficulties of the theater of war were to be lightly overcome, and yet their methods displayed a refreshing originality. Not only in mechanical auxiliaries did the inventive genius of their race find scope, the principles which govern civilized warfare, the rules which control the employment of each arm, the technical and mechanical arts were rapidly modified to the exigencies of the troops and of the country. Cavalry entrenchments, the railway, the telegraph, balloons, signaling, were all used in a manner which had been hitherto unknown. Monitors and torpedoes were for the first time seen, and even the formations of infantry were made sufficiently elastic to meet the requirements of a modern battlefield. Nor was the conduct of the operations fettered by an adherence to conventional practice. From first to last, the campaigns were characterized by daring and often skillful maneuvers, and if the tactics of the battlefield were often less brilliant than the preceding movements, not only are parallels to these tactics to be found in almost every campaign of history, but they would probably have escaped criticism had the opponent been less skillful. But among the galaxy of leaders, Confederate and Federal, in none had the soldiers such implicit confidence as in Stonewall Jackson. And then the Southern soldiers, highly educated as many of them were, no better judges of military capacity were ever known. Nevertheless, the opinion of the soldiers is no convincing proof that Jackson was equal to the command of a large army, or that he could have carried through a great campaign. Had Lee been disabled, it might be asked, would Jackson have proved a sufficient substitute? It has already been explained that military genius shows itself first in character and second in the application of the grand principles of warfare, not in the mere manipulation of armed masses. It cannot well be denied that Jackson possessed every single attribute which makes for success in war. Morally and physically, he was absolutely fearless. He accepted responsibility with the same equanimity that he faced the bullets of the enemy. He permitted no obstacle to turn him aside from his appointed path. And in seizing an opportunity or in following up a victory, he was the very incarnation of untiring energy. He had no moments of weakness. He was not robust, and his extraordinary exertions told upon his constitution. My health, he wrote to his wife in January 1863, is essentially good, but I do not think I shall be able in future to stand what I have already stood, and yet his will invariably rose superior to bodily exhaustion. A supreme activity, both of brain and body, was a prominent characteristic of his military life. His idea of strategy was to secure the initiative, however inferior his force, to create opportunities and to utilize them, to waste no time and to give the enemy no rest. War, he said, means fighting. The business of the soldier is to fight. Armies are not called out to dig trenches, to throw up breastworks, to live in camps, but to find the enemy and strike him, to invade his country and do him all possible damage in the shortest possible time. This will involve great destruction of life and property while it lasts, but such a war will of necessity be of brief continuance, and so would be an economy of life and property in the end. To move swiftly, strike vigorously, and secure all the fruits of victory is the secret of successful war. 
That he felt to the full the fascination of war's tremendous game, we can hardly doubt. Not only did he derive, as all true soldiers must, an intense intellectual pleasure from handling his troops in battle so as to outwit and defeat his adversary, but from the day he first smelt powder in Mexico until he led that astonishing charge through the dark depths of the wilderness, his spirits never rose higher than when danger and death were rife about him. With all his gentleness, there was much of the old berserker about Stonewall Jackson, not indeed the lust for blood, but the longing to do doughtily and die bravely as best becomes a man. His nature was essentially aggressive. He was never more to be feared than when he was retreating, and where others thought only of strong defensive positions, he looked persistently for the opportunity to attack. He was endowed, like Messina, with that rare fortitude which seems to increase as perils thicken. When conquered, he was as ready to fight again as if he had been conqueror. Laudas, laudas, et toujours laudas was the mainspring of all his actions, and the very sights and sounds of a stricken field were dear to his soul. Nothing had such power to stir his pulses as the rebel yell. I remember, says a staff officer, one night at Tattoo, that this cry broke forth in the camp of the Stonewall Brigade and was taken up by brigades and divisions until it rang out far over field and woods. The general came hastily and bareheaded from his tent and, leaning on a fence nearby, listened in silence to the rise, the climax, and the fall of that strange serenade, raising his head to catch the sound as it grew fainter and fainter and died away at last like an echo among the mountains. Then, turning towards his tent, he muttered in half-soliloquy, That was the sweetest music I ever heard. Yet least of all was Jackson a mere fighting soldier, trusting to his lucky star and resolute blows to pull him through. He was not, indeed, one of those generals who seek to win victories without shedding blood. He never spared his men, either in marching or fighting, when a great result was to be achieved, and he was content with nothing less than the complete annihilation of the enemy. Had we taken ten sail, said Nelson, and allowed the eleventh to escape, when it had been possible to have got at her, I could never have called it well done. Jackson was of the same mind. With God's blessing, he said before the Valley Campaign, let us make thorough work of it. When once he had joined battle, no loss, no suffering was permitted to stay his hand. He never dreamed of retreat until he had put in his last reserve. Yet his victories were won rather by sweat than blood by skillful maneuvering rather than sheer hard fighting. Solicitous as he was of the comfort of his men, he had no hesitation, when his opportunity was ripe, of taxing their powers of endurance to the uttermost. But the marches which strewed the wayside with the footsore and the weaklings won his battles. The enemy, surprised and outnumbered, was practically beaten before a shot was fired and success was attained at a trifling cost. Yet despite his energy, Jackson was eminently patient. He knew when to refuse battle, just as well as he knew when to deliver it. He was never induced to fight except on his own terms, that is, on his own ground, and at his own time, save at Kernstown only, and there the strategical situation forced his hand. And he was eminently cautious, before he committed himself to movement, he deliberated long, and he never attacked until he had ample information. He ran risks, and great ones, but in war the nettle danger must be boldly grasped, and in Jackson's case the dangers were generally more apparent than real. Under his orders the cavalry became an admirable instrument of reconnaissance. He showed a marked sagacity for selecting scouts, both officers and privates, and his system for obtaining intelligence was well-nigh perfect. He had the rare faculty, which would appear instinctive, but which is the fruit of concentrated thought allied to a wide knowledge of war, of divining the intention of his adversary and the state of his morale. His power of drawing inferences, often from seemingly unimportant trifles, 
was akin to that of the hunter of his native backwoods, to whom the rustle of a twig, the note of a bird, a track upon the sand, speak more clearly than written characters. His estimate of the demoralization of the Federal Army after Bull Run and of the ease with which Washington might have been captured was absolutely correct. In the middle of May 1862, both Lee and Johnston, notwithstanding Jackson's victory over Milroy, anticipated that Banks would leave the valley. Jackson thought otherwise, and Jackson was right. After the bloody repulse at Malvern Hill, when his generals reported the terrible confusion in the Confederate ranks, he simply stated his opinion that the enemy was retreating and went to sleep again. A week later, he suggested that the whole army should move against Pope, for McClellan, he said, would never dare to march on Richmond. At Sharpsburg, as the shells cut the trees to pieces in the West Wood and the heavy masses of Federal infantry filled the fields in front, he told his medical director that McClellan had done his worst. At Fredericksburg, after the first day's battle, he believed that the enemy was already defeated, and anticipating their escape under cover of the darkness, he advised a night attack with a bayonet. His knowledge of his adversary's character, derived in great degree from his close observation of every movement, enabled him to predict with astonishing accuracy exactly how he would act under given circumstances. Nor can he be charged in any single instance with neglect of precautions by which the risks of war are diminished. He appears to have thought out and to have foreseen, and here his imaginative power aided him, every combination that could be made against him, and to have provided for every possible emergency. He was never surprised, never disconcerted, never betrayed into a false maneuver. Although on some occasions his success fell short of his expectations, the fault was not his. His strategy was always admirable, but fortune, in one guise or another, the indiscipline of the cavalry, the inefficiency of subordinates, the difficulties of the country, interfered with the full accomplishment of his designs. But whatever could be done to render fortune powerless, that Jackson did. By means of his cavalry, by forced marches, by the careful selection of his line of march, of his camps, of his positions, of his magazines, and lastly by his consistent reticence, he effectually concealed from the Federals both his troops and his designs. Never surprised himself, he seldom failed to surprise his enemies, if not tactically, that is, while they were resting in their camps, at least strategically. Kernstown came as a surprise to Banks, McDowell to Fremont. Banks believed Jackson to be at Harrisonburg when he had already defeated the detachment at Fort Royal. At Cross Keys and Port Republic, neither Fremont nor Shields expected that their flying foe would suddenly turn at bay. Pope was unable to support Banks at Cedar Run till the battle had been decided. When McClellan on the Chickahominy was informed that the Valley Army had joined Lee, it was too late to alter his dispositions, and no surprise was ever more complete than Chancellorsville. And the mystery that always involved Jackson's movements was undoubtedly the result of calculation. He knew the effect his sudden appearances and disappearances would have on the morale of the federal generals, and he relied as much on upsetting the mental equilibrium of his opponents as on concentrating against them superior numbers. Nor was his view confined to the field of battle and his immediate adversary. It embraced the whole theater of war. The mode of power which ruled the enemy's politics as well as his armies was always his real objective. From the very first, he recognized the weakness of the federal position, the anxiety with which the president and the people regarded Washington, and on this anxiety he traded. Every blow struck in the Valley Campaign, from Kernstown to Cross Keys, was struck at Lincoln and his cabinet. Every movement, including the advance against Pope on Cedar Run, was calculated with reference to the effect it would produce in the federal councils, and if he consistently advocated invasion, 
It was not because Virginia would be relieved of the enemy's presence, but because treaties of peace are only signed within sight of the hostile capital. It has been urged that the generals whom Jackson defeated were men of inferior stamp, and that his capacity for command was consequently never fairly tested. Had Grant or Sheridan, it is said, been pitted against him in the valley, or Sherman or Thomas on the Rappahannock, his laurels would never have been won. The contention is fair. Generals of such caliber as Banks and Fremont, Shields and Pope, committed blunders which the more skillful leaders would undoubtedly have avoided. And again, had he been pitted against a worthy antagonist, Jackson would probably have acted with less audacity and greater caution. It is difficult to conceive, however, that the fact would either have disturbed his brain or weakened his resolution. Few generals, apparently, have been caught in worse predicaments than he was. First, when his army was near Harper's Ferry and Fremont and Shields were converging on his rear. Second, when he lay in the woods near Groveton with no news from Longstreet and Pope's army all around him. Third, when he was marching by the Brock Road to strike Hooker's right and Sickles' column struck in between himself and Lee. But it was at such junctures as these that his self-possession was most complete and his skill most marked. The greater the peril, the more fixed became his purpose. The capacity of the opponent, moreover, cannot be accepted as the true touchstone of generalship. The greatest general, said Napoleon, is he who makes the fewest mistakes, i.e., he who neither neglects an opportunity nor offers one. Thus tested, Jackson has few superiors. During the whole of the two years he held command, he never committed a single error. At Mechanicsville, and again at Fraser's Farm, the failure to establish some method of intercommunication left his column isolated. This, however, was a failure in staff duties, for which the Confederate headquarters was more to blame than himself. And further, how sure and swift was the retribution which followed a mistake committed within his sphere of action. What opportunity did Jackson miss? His penetration was unerring, and when, after he had marked his prey, did he ever hesitate to swoop? What seemed reckless audacity, it has been well said by one of the greatest of Southern soldiers, was the essence of prudence. His eye had caught at a glance the entire situation, and his genius, with marvelous celerity and accuracy, had weighed all the chances of success or failure. While, therefore, others were slowly feeling their way or employing in detail insufficient forces, Jackson, without for one moment doubting his success, hurled his army like a thunderbolt against the opposing lines and thus ended the battle at a single blow. But if Jackson never failed to take advantage of his opponent's blunders, it might be said that he sometimes laid himself open to defeat. Grant and Sheridan, had they been in place of Shields and Fremont, would hardly have suffered him to escape from Harper's Ferry. Sherman would probably have crushed him at the Second Manassas. Thomas would not have been surprised at Chancellorsville. But Jackson only pushed daring to its limits when it was safe to do so. He knew the men he had to deal with, and in whatever situation he might find himself, he invariably reserved more than one means of escape. End of section 65. Section 66 of Stonewall Jackson and the American Civil War. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Ted Leinhart. Stonewall Jackson and the American Civil War by George Francis Robert Henderson. The Soldier and the Man, Part 2. On the field of battle, his maneuvers were always sound and often brilliant. He never failed to detect the key point of a position or to make the best use of the ground. On the defensive, his flanks were always strong and his troops concealed both from view and fire. On the offensive, he invariably attacked where he was least expected. 
He handled the three arms, infantry, cavalry, and artillery, in the closest combination and with the maximum of effect. Except at Kernstown, where Garnett interfered, his reserve was invariably put in at exactly the right moment, and he so manipulated his command that he was always strongest at the decisive point. Nor did he forget that a battle is only half won where there is no pursuit, and whenever he held command upon the field, his troops, especially the cavalry, were so disposed that from the very outset the enemy's retreat was menaced. The soldiers, sharers in his achievements, compared his tactical leading with that of others and gave the palm to Jackson. An officer of his staff, who served continuously with the Army of Northern Virginia, says, I was engaged in no great battle subsequent to Jackson's death in which I did not see the opportunity which, in my opinion, he would have seized and have routed our opponents. And General Lane writes that on many a hard-fought field, subsequent to Chancellorsville, he heard his veterans exclaimed, Oh, for another Jackson! Until Jackson fell, the Army of Northern Virginia, except when his advice was overruled, had never missed an opening. Afterwards, it missed many. Gettysburg, which should have been decisive of the war, was preeminently a battle of lost opportunities, and there are others which fall into the same category. It is a perfectly fair assumption, then, that Jackson, so unerring was his insight, would not only have proved an efficient substitute for Lee, but that he would have won such fame as would have placed him, as it placed his great commander, among the most illustrious soldiers of all ages. With any of his contemporaries, not even excepting Lee, he compares more than favorably. Most obedient of subordinates as he was, his strategical views were not always in accordance with those of his commander-in-chief. If Jackson had been in charge of the operations, the disastrous battle of Malvern Hill would never have been fought. Pope would have been cut off from the Rappahannock. McClellan would have found the whole Confederate army arrayed against him at South Mountain, or would have been attacked near Frederick, and Burnside would have been encountered on the North Anna, where defeat would probably have proved his ruin. It is difficult to compare him with Lee. A true estimate of Lee's genius is impossible, for it can never be known to what extent his designs were thwarted by the Confederate government. Lee served Mr. Davis. Jackson served Lee, wisest and most helpful of masters. It would seem, however, that Jackson in one respect was Lee's superior. His courage, physical and moral, was not more brilliant or more steadfast, his tactical skill no greater, but he was made of sterner stuff. His self-confidence was supreme. He never doubted his ability, with God's help, to carry out any task his judgment approved. Lee, on the other hand, was oppressed by a consciousness of his own shortcomings. Jackson never held but one council of war. Lee seldom made an important movement without consulting his corps commanders. Jackson kept his subordinates in their place, exacting from his generals the same implicit obedience he exacted from his corporals. Lee lost the Battle of Gettysburg because he allowed his second-in-command to argue instead of marching. Nor was that political courage, which Nelson declared is as necessary for a commander as military courage, a component part of Lee's character. On assuming command of the Army of Northern Virginia, in spite of Mr. Davis's protestations, he resigned the control of the whole forces of the Confederacy, and he submitted without complaint to interference. Jackson's action when Loring's regiments were ordered back by the Secretary of War is sufficient proof that he would have brooked no meddling with his designs when once they had received the sanction of the cabinet. At the same time, it must remain undetermined whether Jackson was equal to the vast responsibilities which Lee bore with such steadfast courage, whether he could have administered a great army under the most untoward circumstances, with the same success, whether he could have assuaged the jealousies of the different states, and have dealt so tactfully with both officers and men 
that there should have been no friction between Virginians and Georgians, Texans and Carolinians. It is probable that Jackson's temper was more akin to Grant's than Lee's. Grant had the same wholehearted regard for the cause, the same disregard for the individual. He was just as ready as Jackson to place a recalcitrant subordinate, no matter how high his rank, under instant arrest, and towards the incompetent and unsuccessful, he was just as pitiless. Jackson, however, had the finer intellect. The federal commander-in-chief was unquestionably a great soldier, greater than those who overlook his difficulties in the 64 campaign are disposed to admit. As a strategist, he ranks high, but Grant was no master of stratagem. There was no mystery about his operations. His maneuvers were strong and straightforward, but he had no skill in deceiving his adversary, and his tactics were not always of a high order. It may be questioned whether on the field of battle his ability was equal to that of Sherman or of Sherman's great antagonist, Johnston. Elsewhere, he was their superior. Both Sherman and Johnston were methodical rather than brilliant, patient, confident, and far-seeing as they were, strictly observant of the established principles of war, they were without a touch of that aggressive genius which distinguished Lee, Grant, and Jackson. Nevertheless, to put Jackson above Grant is to place him high on the list of illustrious captains. Yet the claim is not extravagant. If his military characteristics are compared with those of so great a soldier as Wellington, it will be seen that in many respects they run on parallel lines. Both had perfect confidence in their own capacity. I can do, said Jackson, whatever I will to do. While the Duke, when a young general in India, congratulated himself that he had learned not to be deterred by apparent impossibilities. Both were patient, fighting on their own terms, or fighting not at all. Both were prudent, and yet, when audacity was justified by the character of their opponent and the condition of his troops, they took no counsel of their fears. They were not enamored of the defensive, for they knew the value of the initiative, and that offensive strategy is the strategy which annihilates. Yet when their enemy remained concentrated, they were content to wait till they could induce him to disperse. Both were masters of ruse and stratagem, and the Virginian was as industrious as the Englishman. And in yet another respect, they were alike. In issuing orders or giving verbal instruction, Jackson's words were few and simple, but they were so clear, so comprehensive and direct that no officer could possibly misunderstand, and none dared disobey. Exactly the same terms might be applied to Wellington. Again, although naturally impetuous, glorying in war, they had no belief in a lucky star. Their imagination was always controlled by common sense, and unlike Napoleon, their ambition to succeed was always subordinate to their judgment. Yet both, when circumstances were imperative, were greatly daring. The attacks at Groveton and at Chancellorsville were Enterprise's instinct with the same intensity of resolution as the storm of Badajoz and Ciudad Rodrigo, the passage of the Duoro, the great counterstroke of Salamanca. On the field of battle, the one was not more vigilant nor imperturbable than the other, and both possessed a due sense of proportion. They knew exactly how much they could affect themselves and how much must be left to others. Recognizing that when once the action had opened, the sphere in which their authority could be exercised was very limited, they gave their subordinates a free hand, issuing few orders and encouraging their men rather by example than by words. Both, too, had that most rare faculty of coming to prompt and sure conclusions in sudden exigencies, the certain mark of a master spirit in war. At Bull Run, Jackson was ordered to support Evans at the Stone Bridge. Learning that the left was compromised, without a moment's hesitation he turned aside and placed his brigade in the only position where it could have held its ground. At Groveton, when he received the news that the Federal left wing was retreating on Centerville across his front, 
The order for attack was issued almost before he had read the dispatch. At Chancellorsville, when General Fitzhugh Lee showed him the enemy's right wing dispersed and unsuspecting, he simply turned to his courier and said, let the column cross the road, and his plan of battle was designed with the same rapidity as Wellington's at Salamanca or Assay. It has been already pointed out that Jackson's dispositions for defense differed in no degree from those of the great Duke. His visit to Waterloo, perhaps, taught the American soldier the value and importance of concealing his troops on the defensive. It was not, however, from Wellington that he learned to keep his plans to himself and to use every effort to mislead his adversary. Yet no general, not even Napoleon himself, brought about so many startling surprises as Wellington. The passage of the Douro, the storm of the frontier fortresses, the flank attack at Vittoria, the passage of the Adour, the passage of the Bedasso, were each and all of them utterly unexpected by the French marshals, and those were by no means the only or the most conspicuous instances. Was ever general more surprised than Massena, when pursuing his retreating foe through Portugal in full anticipation of driving the leopards into the sea, he suddenly saw before him the frowning lines of Torres Vedras, the great fortress which had sprung from earth, as it were, at the touch of a magician's wand? The dispatches and correspondence of the generals who were opposed to Wellington are the clearest evidence of his extraordinary skill. Despite their long experience, their system of spies, their excellent cavalry, superior during the first years of the Peninsular War, both in numbers and training to the English, it was seldom indeed that the French had more than the vaguest knowledge of his movements, his intentions, or his strength. On no other theater of war, and they were familiar with many, had they encountered so mysterious an enemy. And what was the result? Constantly surprised themselves, they at length hesitated to attack even isolated detachments. At Guinaldo in 1812, Marmont, with 30,000 soldiers, refused to assault a ridge occupied by no more than 13,000. The morning of Quatre Bras, when that important position was but thinly held, even Ney was reluctant to engage. In the judgment of himself and his subordinates, who had met Wellington before, the fact that there were but few red jackets to be seen was no proof whatever that the whole Allied army was not close at hand and the opportunity was suffered to escape. Other generals have been content with surprising the enemy when they advanced against him. Wellington and Jackson sought to do so even when they were confined to the defensive. And in still another respect may a likeness be found. Jackson's regard for truth was not more scrupulous than Wellington's. Neither declined to employ every legitimate means of deceiving their enemies, but both were absolutely incapable of self-deception and this characteristic was not without effect on their military conduct. Although never deterred by difficulties, they distinguished clearly between the possible and the impossible. To gain great ends, they were willing to run risks, but if their plans are carefully considered, it will be seen that the margin left to chance was small. The odds were invariably in their favor. In conception as in execution, obstacles were resolutely faced, and they were constitutionally unable to close their eyes to contingencies that might prove ruinous. The promise of great results was never suffered to cajole them into ignoring the perils that might beset their path. Imagination might display in vivid colors the success that might accrue from some audacious venture, but if one step was obscure, the idea was unhesitatingly rejected. Undazzled by the prospect of personal glory, they formed a true, not an untrue, picture of the business to be done, and their plans, consequently, were without a flaw. Brilliant indeed were the campaigns of Napoleon, and astonishing his successes, but he who had so often deceived others in the end deceived himself. Accustomed to the dark dealings of intrigue and chicanery, his judgment, once so penetrating, became blunted. He believed what he wished to believe and not that which was fact. 
More than once in his later campaigns, he persuaded himself that the chances were with him when in reality they were terribly against him. He trusted to the star that had befriended him at Marengo and at Aspern. That is, he would not admit the truth, even to himself, that he had been overdaring, that it was fortune and fortune alone that had saved him from destruction, and Moscow and Vitoria, Leipzig and Waterloo were the result. But although there was a signal resemblance, both in their military characters as in their methods of war, between Wellington and Jackson, the parallel cannot be pushed beyond certain well-defined limits. It is impossible to compare their intellectual capacity. Wellington was called to an ampler field and far heavier responsibilities, not as a soldier alone, but as financier, diplomatist, statesman, he had his part to play. While Napoleon languished on his lonely island, his great conqueror, the plenipotentiary of his own government, the most trusted counselor of many sovereigns, the advisor of foreign administrations, was universally acknowledged as the mastermind of Europe. Nor was the mark which Wellington left on history insignificant. The results of his victories were lasting. The freedom of the nations was restored to them, and land and sea became the thoroughfares of peace. America, on the other hand, owes no single material benefit to Stonewall Jackson. In the cause of progress or of peace, he accomplished nothing. The principle he fought for, the right of secession, lives no longer, even in the South. He won battles, he enhanced the reputation of American soldiers, he proved in his own person that the manhood of Virginia had suffered no decay. And this was all. But the fruits of a man's work are not to be measured by a mere utilitarian standard. In the minds of his own countrymen, the memory of Wellington is hallowed not so much by his victories as by his unfaltering honesty and his steadfast regard for duty. And the life of Stonewall Jackson is fraught with lessons of still deeper import. Not only with the army, but with the people of the South, his influence while he lived was very great. From him, thousands and ten thousands of Confederate soldiers learned the self-denial, which is the root of all religion, the self-control, which is the root of all manliness. Beyond the confines of the camps, he was personally unknown. In the social and political circles of Richmond, his figure was unfamiliar. When his body lay in state, the majority of those who passed through the Hall of Representatives looked upon his features for the first time. He had never been called to counsel by the president, and the members of the legislature, with but few exceptions, had no acquaintance with a man who acted while they deliberated. But his fame had spread far and wide, and not merely the fame of his victories, but of his Christian character. The rare union of strength and simplicity, of childlike faith and the most fiery energy, had attracted the sympathy of the whole country, of the North as well as of the South and beyond the Atlantic, where, with breathless interest, the parent islands were watching the issue of the mighty conflict, it seemed that another Cromwell without Cromwell's ambition, or that another wolf with more than wolf's ability, had risen among the soldiers of the youngest of nations. And this interest was intensified by his untimely end. When it was reported that Jackson had fallen, Men murmured in their dismay against the fiat of the Almighty. Why, they asked, had one so pure and so upright been suddenly cut down? Yet a sufficient answer was not far to seek. To the English race, in whatever quarter of the globe it holds dominion, to the race of Alfred and de Montfort, of Bruce and Hampton, of Washington and Gordon, the ideal of manhood has ever been a high one. Self-sacrifice and the single heart are the attributes which it most delights to honor, and chief amongst its accepted heroes are those soldier saints who, sealing their devotion with their lives, have won death's royal purple in the foeman's lines. So, from his narrow grave on the green hillside at Lexington, Jackson speaks with voice more powerful than if, passing peacefully away, in the fullness of years and honors, he had found a resting place in some proud sepulchre 
erected by a victorious and grateful commonwealth. And who is there who can refuse to listen? His creed may not be ours, but in whom shall we find a firmer faith, a mind more humble, a sincerity more absolute? He had his temptations like the rest of us. His passions were strong. His temper was hot. Forgiveness never came easily to him, and he loved power. He dreaded strong liquor because he liked it. And if in his nature there were great capacities for good, there were nonetheless, had it been once perverted, great capacities for evil. Fearless and strong, self-dependent and ambitious, he had within him the making of a Napoleon, and yet his name is without spot or blemish. From his boyhood onward, until he died on the Rappahannock, he was the very model of a Christian gentleman. E'en as he tried that day to God, so walked he from his birth, in simpleness and gentleness and honor and clean mirth. Paradox as it may sound, the great rebel was the most loyal of men. His devotion to Virginia was hardly surpassed by his devotion to his wife, and he made no secret of his absolute dependence on a higher power. Every action was a prayer, for every action was begun and ended in the name of the Almighty. Consciously and unconsciously, indeed as in word, in the quiet of his home and in the tumult of battle, he fastened to his soul those golden chains that bind the whole round earth upon the feet of God. Nor was their burden heavy. He was the happiest man, says one of his friends, I ever knew, and he was wont to express his surprise that others were less happy than himself. But there are few with Jackson's power of concentration. He fought evil with the same untiring energy that he fought the North. His relations to his moral duties were governed by the same strong purpose, the same clear perception of the aim to be achieved, and of the means whereby it was to be achieved, as his maneuvers on the field of battle. He was always thorough, and it was because he was thorough, true, steadfast, and consistent that he reached the heroic standard. His attainments were not varied. His interests, so far as his life's work was concerned, were few and narrow. Beyond his religion and the army, he seldom permitted his thoughts to stray. His acquaintance with art was small. He meddled little with politics. His scholarship was not profound, and he was neither sportsman nor naturalist. Compared with many of the prominent figures of history, the range of his capacity was limited. And yet Jackson's success in his own sphere was phenomenal, while others, perhaps of more pronounced ability, seeking success in many different directions, have failed to find it in a single one. Even when we contrast his recorded words with the sayings of those whom the world calls great, statesmen, orators, authors, his inferiority is hardly apparent. He saw into the heart of things, both human and divine, far deeper than most men. He had an extraordinary facility for grasping the essential and discarding the extraneous. His language was simple and direct, without elegance or embellishment, and yet no one has excelled him in crystallizing great principles in a single phrase. The few maxims which fell from his lips are almost a complete summary of the art of war. Neither Frederick, nor Wellington, nor Napoleon realized more deeply the simple truths which ever since men first took arms have been the elements of success, and not Hampton himself beheld with clearer insight the duties and obligations which devolve on those who love their country well but freedom more. It is possible that the conflicts of the South are not yet ended. In America, men pray for peace, but dark and mysterious forces threatening the very foundations of civic liberty are stirring even now beneath their feet. The war of secession may be the precursor of a fiercer and a mightier struggle, and the volunteers of the Confederacy, enduring all things and sacrificing all things, the prototype and model of a new army in which North and South shall march to battle side by side. Absit omen. But in whatever fashion his own countrymen may deal with the problems of the future, the story of Stonewall Jackson will tell them in what spirit they should be faced. Nor has that story a message for America alone. 
The hero who lies buried at Lexington in the Valley of Virginia belongs to a race that is not confined to a single continent and to those who speak the same tongue and in whose veins the same blood flows, his words come home like an echo of all that is noblest in their history. What is life without honor? Degradation is worse than death. We must think of the living and of those who are to come after us, and see that by God's blessing we transmit to them the freedom we have ourselves inherited. End of Stonewall Jackson and the American Civil War by George Francis Robert Henderson